Good morning, everyone. Hello, my name is Maria Nineva, and I'm a lecturer in modern and contemporary art uh, here at the Portal Institute of Art. And uh, this is Dr. Katerina Savat. <laughs> we're here to introduce each other, but really we're here to introduce this fantastic event and to welcome so many excellent scholars, curators, and art critics and artists to uh, speak to us and to all of you uh, at the portal. So welcome and welcome for uh, coming uh, early in the morning for two full days. So the order of the day is that we will start uh, with a keynote and then there is going to be a lunch break. So lunch is provided only for speakers and chairs. Um, and uh, for those of you who would like to grab some lunch and stay in the area, there's a cafe upstairs, as I mentioned, or there's lots of eateries towards uh, King's Cross. There, after the lunch break, there will be two panels and two coffee breaks. Coffee is provided, and it will be in the research forum, is when you exit to the right-hand side. So please stay on for refreshments. And there will be a wine reception after the panel discussion later on. So please stay on to celebrate the day with a glass of wine with us afterwards. And it will also be in the uh, research forum after. Um, if you would like to make a donation, uh, we have prepared um, a list of uh, trusted organizations and charities that we have worked with, with some QR codes. So um, Ukraine-related Ukraine related charities. I've assumed that this is a, everyone, uh, of course, would uh, know this. So um, we have uh, HARP and uh, Insulate Ukraine and Libe Bierich and the Ukrainian Institute in London <coughs> that uh, you will see the QR codes. Please read about these organizations. If you would like to support Ukraine, make a donation or get involved um, with uh, those organizations. And there are some of us who can answer questions about them here in uh, London. So as you can imagine, the event uh, of this scale would not be possible without uh, many people uh, who we would like to thank uh, as at the start of the conference, uh, who have made um, uh, generous contributions uh, in um, enthusiasm and support and energy and just interest in uh, Ukrainian art. And I would like to uh, extend our thank yous to the Archipinka Foundation in New York, to Stevenson Art in London, to the Society of Historians of East European, Eurasian, and Russian Art and Architecture, uh, known as SHIRA, to the British Academy, uh, also to PPV, Perverting the Power Vertical, a politics and aesthetics platform based within Fringe, at UCL Center for the Study of Social and Cultural Complexity, which is just around the corner, the British Association for Slavonic and East European Studies, BASIS, and of course the Royal Academy of Arts. As for those of you who were able to see the preview this morning, um, and if you didn't manage to see the exhibition, it is open until 13th of October, so make sure you make your way to the Royal Academy. Uh, this event is part of the Migrations, People, Politics mm -hmm. and Objects Research Cluster here at the Courtauld and is made possible by the Courtauld Research Forum. And I would like to thank some uh, individuals who have uh, made an important contribution to the organization and support uh, of the conference. So I'd like to thank Matthew Stevenson, William Blacker, James Butterwick, Oleana Palko, Paniotis Zenafontos, Michal Morawski, and uh, Clara Camp Welsh and Robin Schulderfry from the Migra Migrations Research Cluster, and Leila Diego and Grace from the Research Forum, and our events assistants, Noah, Matilda, Harriet, Madeline, and Dasha. And finally, I couldn't have asked for a better collaborator, colleague, and a dear friend to have worked with for a number of years, maybe two years in the planning on this event, uh, Dr. Katia Zinisova, and I'm going to pass over to Katia to say a few introductory words. So thank you. Thank you, Marsha. 
everyone. Good morning. I'm delighted to see such a massive crowd. I'll just say a couple of brief words about the conference and then I'll introduce our first keynote speaker this morning. Um, in addition to all of the many individuals and organizations who were absolutely instrumental in making this event possible, I also want to say, uh, to say thank you on behalf of Masha and myself to all of our speakers and also all of the scholars who answered our call for papers. We received many exciting, diverse proposals for this conference and it was a positive challenge to um, kind of select only a few, uh, but I think the fact that there are so many scholars internationally working on different um, aspects of Ukrainian visual culture and art um, attests to the fact that this is uh, an exciting, growing and evolving field and I very much hope for many more uh, conferences like this, um, so I hope this is just the beginning. And just a couple of words on the conference itself, um, it was obviously very important for us to do an event specifically on Ukraine and on the visual culture and arts of Ukraine because for a very long time, way too long, Ukrainian scholarship has been overshadowed or Ukrainian context in the art and uh, practice of many artists coming from Ukraine has been overshadowed and marginalized. So it was important for us to focus specifically on Ukraine. At the same time, we want this to be a discussion that also recognizes uh, that all the intercultural exchanges, the rich fabric of intercultural exchanges that were happening in Ukraine uh, during the period that we're covering in this conference. And also, we want to explore all the many creative dialogues that artists from Ukraine maintained with their counterparts to the east, the west, uh, the north, the south. So I'm super excited about all of the upcoming proposal presentations and uh, discussions. And without any further delay, it is my immense honor and um, pleasure to introduce Professor Miroslava Mudrak as our first keynote speaker for the conference. Uh, Pani Miroslava, I'll read your biography. I think for many in this room, Professor Mudrak needs no introduction. Uh, for those of us who work on any aspect of Ukrainian art of the late 19th and 20th century, uh, Professor Mudrak's scholarship is absolutely pivotal. Uh, personally, I don't think I would have done a PhD here the quote out on Ukraine's early 20th century art if, it, if I did not read Professor Mudrak's seminal um, publication on the and a New Generation. Um, I read it in its Ukrainian translation, I have to admit, but um, that was the cornerstone for my interest in, um, in the art of Ukraine. So, um, for, but for those of you who are less familiar with the work of Professor Mundrak, I will read out her biography. Uh, professor Miroslava Maria Mundrak is American professor of the history of art at the Ohio State University, specializing in the field of modernist art of the late 19th and early 20th century. Her scholarly interests focus on Eastern Europe, Ukraine, Russia, and the former Soviet Union in relation to the philosophical and stylistic developments of the West. For more than three decades, she taught at Ohio State University and lectured on the ideological discourses, social political influences, and artistic practices within East European cultures that use modernity to signify national identity. Mudrak's seminal work, New Generation and Artistic Modernism in Ukraine, 1986, was awarded the Kovalev Prize for Ukrainian Studies and was published in, in, in a Ukrainian translation by Rodovit Press in 2018. Other publications include essays on Ukrainian data and dissidents, propaganda pavilions, the Ukrainian studio of plastic arts in Prague, Panfuturism, Constructivism, Neue Slovenische Kunst, and the Semiotics of Suprematism. She has contributed essays for exhibition catalogs on collections of Russian and Ukrainian avant-garde art, including Red Horizons 2018, The Look 1882-1967, Futurism and After 2008, from the Lotus to the Sickle, the Art of Boris Kosarev, 2012. Mudrak curated the exhibition Staging the Ukrainian Avant-Garde of the 1910s and 1920s, uh, a catalogue recognized by the 2016 Alfred H. Barr Jr. Award of the College Art Association. The latest publications include the monographs Nikifa, the Ultimate Outsider, 2023, and the imaginative world of Georgi Narbut and the making of a Ukrainian brand, 2020, translated into Ukrainian and French in 2021. 
as well as catalog essays to the exhibitions of Alexander Bogomazov Tvorchel Laboratoria 2019, Futuro a multi multidisciplinary project 2021-2023, and In the Eye of the Storm, Modernism in Ukraine, 1900-1930s in 2022. In 2020, Modrak was elected as a foreign member of the National Academy of Arts of Ukraine. Pani Marosala, the floor is yours. Please welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for coming out. Um, this is really a pleasure, um, but it's really an honor. And I thank you, uh, Dr. Katya Denisova, Dr. Mileva, for inviting me. And I also would like to thank uh, the organizers of the exhibition that has been traveling uh, since the war began in Ukraine. Thank you, Kostya and Katya, for sticking with it. We appreciate your efforts. So I've chosen a rather unlikely title for a modernist talk, uh, somewhat antiquated, uh, but I think um, it served as a way to thread all of the ideas that I had about the exhibition, about Ukrainian modernism in general, and I hope that you can kind of follow along to see where I try to uh, take, take my ideas in order for us to better understand Ukrainian modernism as diverse and as varied as it is and as complicated as it is as well. So the title, like Mar Marko and Hell, Yak, yak Markov Bakli in the Ukrainian translation, how an age-old Ukrainian idiom laid bare an entire modernist movement. Nearly a century ago, in 1928, the costume designs of Kharkiv-based avant-gardist Boris Kosarev were seen for the first time on the theater stage for a performance like no other. The title of a dramatic comedy written by theater critic and playwright Ivan Kocherha took as its impetus a widespread idiomatic Ukrainian expression, Yak Markov Pekli, like Marko in hell. The saying, the saying refers to a legendary figure from Ukrainian folklore that scrutinized, that surfaced in the public's consciousness in the 18th century. Marko was regarded as a profane character who, after murdering his sister and mother, was left to drift aimlessly through life. To atone for his sin and make up for his ill deeds, Marko was given a directive in a dream in which St. Peter told him that he should go to the underworld and rescue Ukrainian Cossacks from their captivity in hell. Marko took up St. Peter's mandate, and upon entering the abyss, he killed the first devil he saw, causing pandemonium and panic throughout the infernal realm. In a scramble to regain control over the underworld, Lucifer tried to seduce Marko to become one of his hellions by having him join in their raucous demonic revelry. While Lucifer and his accomplices were degenerating into a drunken stupor, Marko carried out his mission and released the Cossacks. Yet despite his action, Marko never enjoyed complete absolution, and he was destined to never find a place of rest. His wayward conduct kept him on the sidelines and largely ignored. Though overlooked, he continued to persist, even if on the fringes of society, seeking to find his place in the world. I find the restlessness captured by the Ukrainian adage, like Marko in hell, extremely apt as a description of Ukrainians scattered around the world today, seeking a place to call home. I think we can all appreciate the emotional toll of such circumstances, much like the forlorn Marko. My focus, however, is to think similarly of the works on exhibition today. If you've seen the exhibition today, then you might be thinking of it along these lines. That is the exhibition that's called In the Eye of the Storm, that has been moving from museum to museum since being adventurously removed from the homeland 
where a hellish war is raging. Western museums and their personnel have been generous in giving these objects some respite from their peregrinations. But whether they can return home under the present circumstances is an open question. I speak of these works as if they were living beings because, well, I see them that way. Any art object will channel the language, the aspirations, the optimism, or existential lows of its creator. In turn, its creator's vision, inflected by time and place, is embodied in the spirit of the object. Ukrainian modernism is therefore not a movement, nor a style, nor a category. It is the expression of a worldview, be it urbane, as we see here in the Murashko painting, or transcendent, as we see in the Mayevich work. It can be restorative, as it builds on a long tradition of domestic arts, as we see in Sobachko Shostak, or symbolic, as it queries the cosmological, as we see in Konstantin Piskorsky. Ultimately, it is about an existential quest, as suggested by this frame from Dozhenko's film. What unites the plethora of these diverse approaches is a sense of personal liberation, a mostly intuitive stance building up over time and finally given release at the right moment in historical time. This liberating sensibility stems from a modernist awareness that any barriers to self-fulfillment must come from the individual. Rampant social unrest in the early part of the century, <coughs> could not the 20th century, could not but cause an implosion of the status quo. The outbreak of World War I was a catalyzer. The demise of the Russian Empire was a launch. Then, as now, Ukrainian modernism was and continues to be driven by the artist's sense of being rightfully present in the world and having a place within it. This is revealed in the work of artists who followed their artistic impulses without being tethered to rules, institutions, or government powers. Unlike in the rest of Europe, where resistance to the rigid standards of an art academy spawned a search for new ways of self-expression, so in Ukraine, it was a release from an imperial mindset that suffocated a nation. Indeed, then, as now, after centuries of colonizing Ukrainian artistic talent, modernism in Ukraine meant that Ukrainian artists no longer felt compelled to establish themselves in the imperial capitals, in Moscow or St. Petersburg. Instead, they banked on their status as a marginalized people and positioned themselves at the ready to look inwardly and embrace their native artistic legacies. This organic return to their cultural core, be it the archaeological treasures of the Black Sea region, the artifacts of ancient Kyiv, the spirit of the Cossack era, this backward look, along with a genuine appreciation for the arts and crafts of their unique indigenous folk traditions, awakened a modernist self-awareness rooted in the spirit of the past. In an attempt to establish a continuum, Ukrainian modernism of the early 20th century certainly followed a trajectory that paralleled the movements of Europe, from realism through Impressionism and beyond, as well as all of the avalanche of isms that followed. But it did so with a difference. A case in point was Georgi Narput, a distinguished book illustrator and graphic artist who belonged to the St. Petersburg artistic elite as a member of the Mir Iskustva group, the world of art. Coming from a gentrified caste of Cossack ancestry, Narbut's interest in the graphic arts stemmed from his early education in Hluhiv in eastern Ukraine, where his schooling was based on the scholastic inheritance of the Kyiv Mohila Academy. Early on, he was exposed to Slavonic calligraphy and ancient incunabuli, and adapted its aesthetics into modern graphic design. While in St. Petersburg, his interest in book illustrations 
vignettes and colophons led to a rarefied creative project, the Ukrainian alphabet. From, Russian art histor from a Russian art historical standpoint, the project may have been perceived as whimsical and part of the nostalgia cultivated by his colleagues, the Miriskustiki, a playful anomaly that characterized many products of the world of art. Yet while creating among the elite in St. Petersburg, Nagut's project was also a signal of his own self-awareness as a displaced Ukrainian. After the revolution, Nagut pursued the project with even more gusto. After returning to Ukraine to head the newly formed and first Academy of Art in Ukraine. As its rector and the head of the graphic arts unit, he galvanized young students to create a graphics art style with a Ukrainian face. What that meant was to draw on Baroque imprints and the Cossack style of the Hekmanot period, the period of the 18th century, the period of 18th century statehood, to create a model profile representative of Ukraine as a sovereign state. Over the brief period of Ukraine's independence from 1917 to 1921, Narbut's vision effected a complete transformation of the arts. His influence captured the official insignia of Ukraine, the new currency, and state stationery, but mostly in a new approach to printed matter. This influence spread to the Western regions all across Ukraine and continued having an aesthetic resonance well after the Second World War when many Ukrainian artists forced to flee their homeland found themselves scattered around the world. And here's Nodwood's resonance in publications from 57 and 1974 from Buenos Aires to Canada. Not until the middle of the 1970s, as the temperature of the Cold War was beginning to warm and artists were beginning to come up from the underground and find their individual voices again, would Ukrainian modernism be discovered by the so-called dissident artists or nonconformists? Until then, the art we see before us today, that is, at the exhibition, was largely relegated to the dustbins of museum storage or secretly held by family members. Several decades later, as the trans avantguardia made its way across the Berlin Wall, so Ukrainian artists rediscovered their unique difference. The first years of independence after 1991 were described as Ukrainian cultural necrophilia, a passion for forms of art that were long dead. Such atti attitudes led to a clinical reevaluation of Ukraine's artistic past, which made Narbut's alphabet project resonate once again ironically, in the new wave of Ukrainian modernism of the 1990s. Participating in a project called Alchemic Capitu Capitulation, a series of installations on the Ukrainian battleship named Slavutich, still moored in Sevastopol, just a month shy of the signing of the Budapest Memorandum in 1994, the Ukrainian group of artists called Rapid Reaction, and this was in reference to the security assurances put forth by Russia or being negotiated between Russia and the West. Rapid reaction addressed the long capitulation of the Ukrainian language to Soviet homogenization through language. By placing three letters in a box, three letters that are not found in the Russian language, that is the letter E, Yi, and Ye, this became part of the ship project where the native language was seen as a powerful as was seen as powerful as the nuclear weapons that Ukraine was required to surrender in exchange for security. Indeed, in 2014, the Slavutic ship became part of the Black Sea fleet of the Russian Federation. Even uh, uh, yes, oh, and before I continue, I wanted to show you uh, that this idea of unique letters in the Ukrainian alphabet uh, were defiantly uh, produced, uh, defiantly produced a monument, uh, here you see on the right, 
in Rivne, in the town of Rivne in Ukraine, facing Tarashevchenko, the monument of Tarashevchenko. On the left, you see a scene that is all too familiar these days, uh, the ruin of Berdyansk, where the bust of Shevchenko is looking at uh, the ruined uh, buildings. Similarly, and even more recently along these lines, is an ephemeral project of type designer Katerina Korolevtseva entitled Ukrainian Letters Temporary Museum. Essentially, it is an installation of the 33 letters of the Ukrainian alphabet, letters she calls works of art, because they are re recreations of the styles of lettering used by 33 prominent Ukrainian graphic artists of the 20th century. <clears throat> the project was originally created in 2022 during her residency in Weimar, Germany, with the support of the Bauhaus Universität. It received a second life in the summer of 2023 when exhibited in New York City on the exterior of the Cooper Union Foundation Landmark Building. A secondary aspect to the exhibition included a display of enlarged reproductions of 33 flimsy book covers and other materials printed beginning with 1917 and ending with publications from present-day sovereign Ukraine. One cannot underestimate the importance of the linguistic vernacular in considerations of Ukrainian modernist attitudes. After Russia's assault on Ukraine in February 2022, when, quote, protecting Russian speakers in Ukraine was touted as one of the motives for the war, it was easy to make out which Russian speakers were not Ukrainian by their inability to pronounce the word palyanitsya, the name given to uh, a common round hearth-baked Ukrainian peasant bread. Contemporary sculptor Zhanna Kadyrova highlighted this moment of linguistic differentiation that separated friends from foes that is the locals from the invaders for a project she displayed at the Venice Biennale in 2022. Her work pointedly underscores how inherent cultural qualities find their way from the interior and out into the world through language that operates on native wit and one might add on idiomatic expressions. So if we can once more return to the multifaceted Narbut, a self-styled Marco in hell, whose insatiable curiosity led to an integration of diverse sources into a branding for modernist Ukraine, then it is, it is his fascination with genealogy that brought him to a careful assessment of Cossack coats of arms as the foundation of a modern visual language. The bright hues and elemental shapes of heraldic signs, their simple shapes encoding long family histories, pattern served as the mo perfect model for modern abstraction. The clarity of linear patterning and the reductivism of natural forms offered a concise visual experience removed from mimetic descriptiveness and literariness. And yet the image, like any modernist work, is layered with interpretive value. In the 1990s, this approach was taken up by two cave painters, Oleg Kistol and Mikola Matsenko, in a project they ironically called Natsprom, a typical Soviet-style acronym or neologism standing for national production, Natsprom. Described as, quote, a micro model of Ukrainian culture in a European and world context, they focused on stereotypic images that in the end become symbols of beauty. Natsprom brought into focus past historic events that bespoke of a so-called union with Russia, such as the bold works of Mykola Matsenko shown here, whose use of Soviet-style insignia tinged with post-Soviet irony make a statement about the way that Ukrainian artists, past and present, have used their cultural inheritance to stake their own place in world culture. 
The Cossack era offered a wealth of inspiration for shaping Ukrainian modernism. The Baroque aesthetic was transformed into an officious style that staked an identity and earmarked statehood for Ukrainians in the 17th and 18th centuries. The aesthetic of Cossack Baroque, made especially prominent by the patronage of Hetman Ivan Mazepa, permeated the cultural sphere. It went hand in hand with the scholastic tradition maintained at the Kyiv Mohila Academy, the leading center of higher education during that period. Modeled on the ancient gymnasium, which aimed at educating the whole person, not only intellectually, but also physically and spiritually, the academy's male students, who were called bursakir, from the word bursa or dormitory, had the reputation of being firebrands. They lived at the school along with the seminarians, creating a tension between the mischievous and the bookish. The creative side of the young academy students was developed through poetics, which combined the exegesis of sacred texts with moralizing folk tales and adages passed down through generations. Mitrofan Dovhalevsky's study of poetics, which he taught at the Cave Mohila Academy in 1736 through 37, demonstrates how the hybridizing of word and image through acrostics, cryptograms, and other variations can reveal an <coughs> article of faith. Here on the bottom, for example, is the phrase, the lamb in the world took up our burdens by the cross. And it is represented by image uh, combined with, uh, with, with text. Similarly, the top line shows you just images, but put together, it reveals another truth, the source, the eye, the heart, the key. This is where we see the beauty and light which opens the door to knowing Christ. Such indexical training would not be lost on the modernists, nor would the academy's curriculum of philosophy, theology, rhetoric, and the classics, which would find their way into the Ukrainian modernist consciousness. Once again, this quality of being different is what was being cultivated, not mainstream in the slightest. Let me, uh, let me go back. Uh, would find its way into the Ukrainian modernist consciousness. Once again, this quality of being different, not mainstream in the slightest, able to exist on the margins, describes the very features of Ukrainian modernism. When in 1922, the Ukrainian futurist Mikhail Semenko, or Mikhail Semenko, introduced his poetry painting as a, most, as a more confrontational way of reaching a lethargic public lulled by romanticism and sentimentality, he not only channeled the scholastic spirit of the Mohila Academy and the Kozak Baroque through a bold display of poetic innovation, but he inspired, but inspired by the scholastic tradition, he elevated the mundane to a purely sensorial level through visual poetics. By sounding out the vowels of this poem painting entitled Village Landscape on the left, it is hard to escape the assault of the vernacular. For in enunciating the letters of the poem, we are essentially shouting at Paul, hidden somewhere in the landscape, to take the cow to pasture. <laughs> The poem painting became a shorthand for expressing the energy of Semenko's revolutionary pan-futurism as seen on the right. Translated, it reads, the colossal chain is unraveling. Be afraid, you maggot eaters at the bottom of slime. The colossal chain is falling downward and will capture you by its million steel claws, by its electromagnets, and will push out from the caves and puddles, the mud will dry in the sun. And you, the colossal chain rises upward. And while we, the pan-futurists, are here to press the bottom, the buttons of the apparatus. Very different in spirit 
but certainly uh, very modern in its exhortation. <clears throat> this revolutionary form of futurism is unlike Marinetti's or Mayakovsky's. It is febrile. It strikes a balance between objective progress brought about by heavy industry and the lofty aims of communism, and yet it remains close to the ground as at the material level, at the level of pedestrian experience, at the ready to facilitate transition into the future, not through a system or a structure, by a means, but by a means of an all-inclusive modernist intervention. Though we, don't, though we don't think of the painter Anatoly Petritsky in the same way as Semenko, who embodies both constructive and destructive attitudes in his persona as the enfant terrible of Ukrainian modernism, we might consider Petritsky, whose work I show you here, as a kind of sidekick to Semenko's adventurous, rabble-rousing spirit. The wide range of Petritsky's style match matches the diversity of his media, as they do the subjects of his art. From the universal Beresleyan preoccupation with the symbolist theme of Salome, and the various sensuous forms of Herodiada, Petritsky draws on this classic theme for a theatrical backdrop and presents it in a molecular style as if designing a stained glass window for an English Victorian villa. Petritsky's generosity of spirit made him a natural co-conspirator with futurist Mikhail Semenko, a pair of modernist knight errants. Their creative nimbleness and versatility triggered a collaboration that envisioned Ukrainian modernism unlike any other manifestation in the world. Like two Marcos in hell, each brought their progressive ideas to bear on a complete transformation of the poetic and pictorial arts. Petritsky's animated design for Semenko's poetry collection, a body of poems he aptly titled Looping the Loop, captures the daredevil nature of Semenko's futurism, aimed not so much at slapping the face of the bourgeoisie, as Burluk would have us believe, but at an internal awakening to new possibilities ahead. Thus, in the 1920s, aimed, the Semenko aimed at bringing futurism into line with proletarian rhetoric by espousing pan-futurism as a laboratory of practice intent on transitioning from stale conventional art practices to fulfilling the transformative potential of art through experimentation with form and medium. Using a technological metaphor, the semaphore, to describe this apparatus of change, Semenko likened the transition to a traffic switch that reorients a moving entity from one stage of action to another. Unlike a semaphore that directs movement toward action, its antipode, the catafalque, represents a state of inert art, stationary and not moving at all. Thus, as a polyproblematic system an organism of art that was all-encompassing of human creative endeavor in the present, Semenko's notion of pan-futurism lay at the foundation of, poly, uh, of his poly-genred poly magazine, Nova Generatia, the most important publication of the Ukrainian avant-garde, published in Kharkiv from 1927 to 1930. As its editor, Semenko actively embraced the fuck-toward abstractions of his sidekick, experimenter in arms, Petritsky, and reproduced them on the pages of his journal. As has already been suggested, the energetic verve of the Ukrainian Baroque aesthetic, at its absolute height in the 17th through the 18th centuries, inspired a modernism of sharp contrasts and a dynamic of op oppositional tensions. <coughs> Nowhere more evident is this opposition of forces than in his work for the theater, in Petritsky's work for the theater. Petritsky's backdrop for the theater 
of Kozalets seems to have a direct analog to the story of Marco freeing the captive Cossacks from hell. Here the image addresses two conflicting cultural spheres that historically have always been at odds. As the Cossacks are ensconced in their born, the Ottomans <coughs> go ahead about their daily business. A hopeful note of release is sensed in the stirrings of the Cossacks initiated by the exaggerated presence of the swooping bird clinging to tree limbs in the middle of the composition. Excuse me, I, I forgot to delete the image underneath it. <laughs> the Cossacks, at once startled and transfigured by this bird, turned their attention toward this interloping force, reminding one of Western religious art, specifically a scene such as the Annunciation, where the winged angel Gabriel sweeps into the sacred space of the Virgin to bring her notice of, of God's plan for her. Here is Murashko's version of the theme, which unfortunately is not in the exhibition, but was part of the um, touring exhibition of In the Eye of the Storm. An attitude of humble gratitude, as well as subdued rejoicing, is sensed among the incarcerated Cossacks, as if acknowledging an unseen but present higher power, as in Murashko's Annunciation. As a sequestered group unified by the thick outlines, by the thick outline of the cave that enslaves them, the Christian Brotherhood is pitted compositionally against an inimical Muslim world. This pictorial juxtapositioning creates a dramatic tension that is only heightened by the contrasting palette that defines the two areas of the composition. The restrained white and red in the sphere of the Cossacks creates an emotionally compactly focused realm of shared experience and serves as a sharp counterpoint to the vibrant and intense, albeit fragmented, world of the Turks. The two energy forces operate in opposition to each other the way that the vigorously energetic presence of Gabriel forces Mary to withdraw and retreat on initial encounter. And I'll go back to that image here and here. The opposing fields of the sacred and profane, a lingering theme of the Baroque, are taken up in Petritsky's designs for the 1925 production of Hohol's V. Adapted by Ostap Vishnya for the theater, the play resurrects the scholastic traditions of the Kiev Mohila Academy to dramatize human weaknesses. Directed by Hnat Yura, an original actor of the experimental Young Theater, uh, founded by the avant-garde director Les Kurbas and active in Kiev from 1917 to 1919. The dramatic plot retains all the supernatural elements introduced by Gogol in his novel, but renders them with turns of phrasing inherent in native proverbs and humorous expressions. A dominant undercurrent throughout are folk sayings that underscore native beliefs and spirits. All of this is presented on a superbly minimalist, multi-level set, as you see here. The plot is driven by characters representing impressionable seminarians away from their studies on vacation and finding all kinds of adventures along the way. In designing their costumes, <laughs> Petrisky retains their male gender, and emphasizing this point, as you see in these costumes of, for Adam and Eve, he retains their male features. By her hyperbolizing on the costuming, Petrisi comes close to a burlesque treatment of Hohoi's renowned novel. The way that, that more than a century earlier, Ukraine's first modern writer, Ivan Kutlarevsky, a former seminarian of the Mohila Academy, made a bold travesty of the Hellenic classic, the Aeneid. You see, I'm linking lots of different things here. <laughs> Stick with me. 
Although grounded in Greek and Latin from his schooling at the Mohila Academy and proficient in several European languages, Kotlarevsky is best known for introducing vernacular Ukrainian in his adaptation of the fundamental classic. The Aeneid, we should recall, was commissioned by the Roman emperor who somewhat like Putin today, wanted to present a history of his empire as having noble beginnings linked to the ancient gods. Virgil made a farce of the Homeric epic, inspiring a spate of more modern parodies and humorous rewritings since. Virgil's Aeneid, a travesty that Kotlarevsky was required to study as a seminarian, inspired a Ukrainian version that he later <coughs> created in the spirit of a heroic comedy, introducing humorous witticisms and native aphorisms along the way, all in the genre of poetics. The daring spirit, spirit of the Cossacks described in the Ukrainianized Aeneid was reflected many years later, and forgive me for this, in Ilya Repin's Saporozhin Cossacks writing a letter to the Sultan. And here I'm showing you the more riotous Kharkiv version, which many people are unaware of. It's an unfinished uh, version of it. In 2015, after, quote, little green men invaded Crimea, Ukrainian defenders enacted their own version of the farcical events, <laughs> then largely ignored by the world, that led to the war in Ukraine today. So, in addition to being written in the spoken Ukrainian language, with all of its turns of expression adapted to rhyme, the date of Kotlarevsky's epic is equally significant. It came out in 1798, two decades after Empress Catherine II destroyed the Zaporozhin siege in 1775, and decimated the Cossack stronghold on the Dnipro River. No doubt inspired by contemporary revolutionary events and the social upheaval in France that sought to alter the power of the rulers over the population, Kotlarevsky's tale, likened to the destruction of Troy, was a direct reference to Catherine's destruction of Cossack autonomy. The trials of Aeneas and his army are reflected in the challenges facing Ukrainian Cossacks scattered from their base leaving them no choice but to submit, like Marco in hell, to a restless struggle to regain a footing in their world. This brings me to another meme that characterizes the frontline character of Ukrainian modernism. It is not unrelated to the unsettled Marco in hell and the unrequited rancor of the Cossacks after Catherine's snub. It is the ubiquitous image of the Cossack Mamai, whom their futurist David Burluk proudly titled his Cossack ancestor. The term Mamai suggests a wandering spirit, the image of a peripatetic Cossack turned out to be a popular talismanic image that commonly graced the entryway of peasant homes in rural Ukraine particularly in the eastern regions of Slobozhanshchina, where the disbanded Cossacks settled. As a cipher of protection, this crudely painted signboard shows a lone renegade Cossack with his trademark attributes, a kobza, a stringed instrument similar to the bandura, the national, national instrument, accompanied some recitatives of epic victories of the Cossacks and thereby the Kozak Mamai kept their history alive among the population. A musket, a munitions pouch, tobacco pipe are sprawled around the Kozak like attributes identifying a saint in religious art. The Kozak's trusted steed rests untethered alongside him. He rests in the landscape sitting cross-legged in Indian style in typical baggy pants, embroidered shirt, and skull hairlock. Verses telling of the Cossacks and their wanderings, their lone adventures and inner thoughts, as well as moral tales would often be scribed in rhyme beneath the image, a didactic for the illiterate meant to be retold to others. 
This convention would be repeated by the academically trained Taras Shevchenko, who after completing the St. Petersburg Academy of Arts, produced an album of etchings called Picturesque Ukraine, images of his homeland compiled and published in 1844. The Bard of Ukraine as the Bard of Ukraine, Shevchenko univer universalizes the scenes of his native land by offering inscriptions, not only in Ukrainian, but in French. The image of the Cossack wanderer befits the spirit of Burnuk the futurist, who lived an adventurous life himself. From modest beginnings in the Ukrainian peasant village of his birth, to the seasoned environment of an urbane literary artistic Moscow, on to Germany where he influenced the spirit of German expressionism, followed by Japan where he sparked an avant-garde in the 1920s, and finally the United States where he influenced American modernism by providing a good dose of rugged Slav Slavic vigor. Burluk was in constant pursuit of confronting a modernist presentness head on. Always fidgety and full of nervous energy, rambunctious and irreverent of the status quo, forever moving, never settling, his unharnessed vivacity allowed for a perpetual taking in of something new and producing something unprecedented. Meanwhile, we should not forget the symbolic value of the horse so ubiquitous throughout Buluk's works that while linking him to the bravado of the Cossack cavalry, underscoring his personal peregrinations in matters of art, the horse signals Burluk's association with the German Blauer Reitergruppe and the apocalyptic horsemen of Kandinsky. At the same time, it conjures up associations with an ancient past that fed the imagination of Slavic of the Slavic modernists from poets to painters. The fighting spirit of the Scythians, a nomadic people whose settlements on the northern Ukrainian shores of the Black Sea region was legendary. Their legacy as renowned horse breeders and their prowess as, as equestrians was encoded in their masterful gold works unearthed from mounds embedded in Ukrainian steppe lands. In a related way, the Amazons, mentioned in Homer's Iliad, Virgil's Aeneid, and in Kotlarevsky's Eneida, would be appropriated to describe Alexandra Exter's own fiercely independent artistic prowess when it came to modernist innovation, be it in ballet or film or in, in her entrepreneurial skills and galvanizing a generation of Kiev artists to mark their place in, modern, in modernity. So let me begin to wrap up. While I have focused on the theme of fitfulness to describe the character of Ukrainian modernism, geography has played a significant role in shaping its diverse orientations. There were many hubs which gave birth to Ukrainian modernism, each with its own singular personalities responding variously to the specifics of the respective environments. Important to this development was the juxtaposition of historical destiny and the repercussions of power politics that reigned over the country. Split between empires before World War I, Ukrainians across the entire land had very different notions of modernity, depending on the territorial divides imposed on them by those who ruled over them. Although not a single artistic style nor place would define Ukrainian modernism in the way that Cubism will always be associated with Paris, German Expressionism with Munich or Berlin, or Italian Futurism with Milan, one could identify pole stars of Ukrainian modernist activity, activity from Lviv in the West to Kharkiv in the East, and everything in between including cave, including cave. Its tracings can also be found in Prague, Istanbul, and New York. 
Before the war, Galician artists living on lands under Austrian rule manifested a strong <laughs> affinity for symbolism and gravitated toward fin de siècle developments in Central and Eastern Europe. Cave was a buzz with urbanity, and artists like Bohomazo were eager to capture its energy. <laughs> um, my slides are a little bit out of place here, so I'm, before I get to that, I'm going to show you um, uh, as making my point about uh, the uh, peregrinations of Ukrainian modernism, uh, the artist Alexa Hryshchenko, uh, who uh, had an influence in St. Petersburg, Kiev, Moscow, then Istanbul, and on to Paris, or Sviatoslav Hordinsky, uh, beginning in Lviv, on to Berlin, Paris, and the United States, or Alexander Arhipenko, uh, beginning in Kiev, on to Moscow, Paris, Berlin, and then New York. And then here is my um, token symbolist work, uh, a cover for the journal Muzahet, um, and then on to Bohomazov that I mentioned already. Uh, Kiev was a buzz with urbanity, and artists like Bohomazov were eager to capture its energy. Meanwhile, in the pastoral environ, outlying Kharkiv on the estate of Krasnopolyana, artists toyed with exotic Asiatic sources, deriving inspiration from Persian illum illuminations, Middle Eastern and Transcaucasian textiles, and even Buddhist tropes. <laughs> After the collapse of the empires, when Kiev declared Ukraine itself a modern state, the city's Byzantine legacy was also exploited as a way of reclaiming Ukraine's medieval historical legacy, offering a means of restoring modern Ukrainian cultural identity. The major exponent of this fresh orientation was Mikhail Wojcik, a daring, tempestuous personality and visionary, who upon his arrival in Paris in 1907, formed a following that exhibited at the Salon d'Autun in 1909, and then as a unique group called the School of Byzantine Revival at the 1910 Salon des Indépendants. From a purely formalist standpoint, Boichukism derived its style from Byzantine icons, blended with the visual shorthand of the Assyrians and the Italian mural painters of the Proto-Renaissance. Boichuk himself was known to restore icons professionally. Thus, Wojciechism's characteristic flattening of form, two-dimensionality of space, and contoured figures all bespeak of the quest for an essentialized image through a sublimated reductivism verging on the abstract, something that Apollinaire himself would take note of in Paris. But Wojciechism's ability to absorb influences also aspired toward the philosophical. The spirit of Tommaso Campanella's major opus, The City of the Sun, dated to 1602, that describes a utopian, egalitarian society which shared labor and goods rooted in Christian values, was reflected in the monumental art of the Boichu piece. Uh, before I show you an example, uh, this is a photograph of Boichuk teaching at the Cave Art Institute. Uh, and of course, you just saw an exhibition of his works. His works are rare to find. Uh, we have a pretty nice sampling in the exhibition. And here's a documentary photograph of Boichuk um, with his brigade of monumentalists and an example of the kind of mural painting that reflected Campanella's ideas. When made a professor at the Ukrainian Academy in 1917, Wojciech blended the socialist aims of the new regime with the utopian values espoused by the 16th century Dominican friar. Thus, Wojciech found, thus Wojciechism found its purposeful expression as a public service in the monumental murals in the 1920s. They were commissioned to decorate the interior walls of many public buildings throughout the country mostly workers' clubs, sanatoria, and even theaters, as in the case of the Kharkiv Red Factory Theater, where Kocherha, Kocherha's play, Marco in Hell, was staged in 1928. 
As Kharkiv became the seat of industrialization, Vasil Yermilov became its greatest exponent. And modern design in the 1920s, a constructivist ethos enveloped the city. Uh, there are many examples. There's a beautiful example of a uh, portrait by uh, Yermilov in the exhibition. Thus, when Marco in Hell was performed in Kharkiv in 1928, two exemplary, uh, I forgot to include this, just uh, to emphasize the industrial aspect of Ukrainian modernism. When Marco in Hell was performed uh, in Kharkiv in 1928, two exemplary structures in classic constructivist style, the Dershprom building on the left and the metallurgist building stood as beacons of progress within the city. So far, uh, there are no reports of damage on the Dershprom, but there is damage on the, yeah, on the metallurgical um, building. So I'm coming to there. Indeed, the 1920s were heady years for Ukrainian modernism. Fueled by Ukrainianization, a government policy that encouraged national and cultural identity against a larger Soviet homogenization policy of insidious proportions, Ukrainianization, which meant allowing the Ukrainian language to be written and performed again after a half century of Tsarist suppression, certainly stimulated an enormous output of creative progress, projects, publications, and performances in Ukraine. During these years, Anatoly Petritsky began a series of portraits of the cultural forces of Ukraine's literary, artistic, musical, and theatrical scene of the 1920s, as if to objectively fix the exhilaration of the era and the personalities who made it so. Yet there was a dark cloud that was hanging over this gallery of, the, of Ukraine's modernist elite. While stimulative in terms of the enthusiasm and productivity of a young generation of Ukrainian cultural class that took as its motto, away from Moscow, Ukrainianization, which meant mostly the restoration of language, also turned out to be a sinister st strategy of rounding up the best of the best, only to cut down both liter literally and figuratively their optimism for a bright modern future in Ukraine. Scores of individuals were executed during the Stalinist purges of the 1930s for merely being Ukrainian. Petritsky, in turn, began to destroy many of his contemporaries' portraits so as not to implicate more of his colleagues and the Boychukis themselves for invoking Christian values in proletarian imagery were accused of bourgeois nationalism. All were brutally killed. So to sum up, the history of Ukrainian modernism is at once an exhilarating story of euphoric innovation, creative freedom, and the restoration of national modernist identity, represented by a cache of inspiring, uplifting work with an unmatched aesthetic charge. It is also a story of irredeemable tragedy. To return to the idiom like Marco in Hell, Kocherha, the playwright, might have seen it all coming when masked by forms of modern popular entertainment, the burlesque, the cabaret and cafe concert, as well as the circus, he put together a dramatic plot, a satirical operatic fairy tale that exposed the lived realities of Soviet life in Ukraine under the control of the Red Army. Through various dramatic scenes, he showed episodes of egregious acts of thievery, corruption, and graft, the sins of modern society, for which it seemed there would still there would be no expiation. Written and put on during the period when Stalin was beginning to consolidate his power and centralize his government, the play tells the story of our hero who finds himself in the heart of darkness, facing a moral dilemma as to whether to expose what he is witness to or to remain silent about it. Marko's existence in the Soviet state is nothing short of hell 
as he struggles to find his place within the intrigues of a supposedly near-perfect society professing to build a utopian state. By blending realistic scenes with fantastical elements, Kocherha puts us, the viewers, in an interstitial realm which tugs at our conscience and begs for a certain kind of release. The production is made tense with internal moral wavering for which there seems to be no resolution. Straightjacketed by the circumstances, it seems one is left to flounder. So, Ukrainian artistic modernism spread across many genres, both traditional, like painting and the graphic arts, as well as contemporary theater, and was primed to involve itself in new forms of art, from photography to cinematography. At the same time, the meanderings of its makers, artists who for one reason or another found themselves on various uh, paths in various parts of Ukraine and beyond, bestowed upon it a character that, although influenced by innovative trends drawn from a variety of external sources and foreign influences, and therefore often appropriated by other cultures, also managed to redeem an aesthetic and philosophical qualities that affirm a continuum of Ukrainian visual culture that connects Ukrainian modernism with a very long past. Maybe the idea of not having a place, not being recognized, sidelined, and ignored by the powers that be has in fact been its very redemption. That the idiom as Marko in hell, like Ukrainian modernism in general, stems from long-standing native roots and is still relevant to the present moment only ensures its enduring power. Thank you. fascinating sweep. Um, we will have questions, five minutes for questions now before we break up for lunch. Um, there is a mic going, so please raise your hand and if you have any questions. Do you want to sit here? Mm -hmm. It's a lot to digest. Yes, I, I went over, but <laughs> Sarah, please. <laughs> Thank you, that was so brilliant. Wait, 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 wait. I was particularly interested in your alphabet, uh, alphabet, and wondered to what extent the artists had contacts with Ilias in Georgia. I'm always interested in the axes as much mm -hmm. as well, of course. But, um, it was really fascinating, and I wondered if you should not propose an exhibition of this material to the Grimm Museum in Castle, which is a kind of alphabet museum, amazingly mm -hmm. enough. This is new to me, so I would have to explore that, but thank you. Any Ilyas connection? Ilyas Danevich from Georgia. Uh, I, I know who you're talking about, yeah. but I don't, I don't think they would associate. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, I don't think they would associate, but um, I think it go, goes closer to Narbut uh, and his resurrecting of the alphabet in his alphabet book. Anyway, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Anna, yes. Thank you. It was really fascinating. I agree with that and I share the same um, comments. Um, my question is, how much of the artwork that you showed are really in Ukraine or in US or you know, or how much is lost? Well, I, I can't give you percentages. Uh, a lot of a lot of it is lost. Um, actually, I I might express a personal fear of the works going back to Ukraine. Um, a fear that more of it might get lost. Um, uh, you know, a lot was abandoned uh, in the storehouses. You know, let, I remember when I was doing research for my dissertation in Kyiv in the late 70s. Uh, I wanted to see Petritsky's art. And uh, after five months of begging to see what they had hidden in storage, they finally brought up the work that you will see in the exhibition of Petrisky, that abstract composition. 
uh, they brought it up. It was tattered, and it had been sitting in water. I mean, the, about this much of it was sitting in water, so it was, it was almost molded and, and dissolved. And at that time, the director said to me, why do you want to look at that? That's just, you know, child, child work. They were just playing with forms. It's not worth anything. So um, there's a lot of, a lot of things have been lost that way um, by sheer neglect. Uh, and so we're lucky that uh, the portfolio of works that were stored in the National Art Museum um, that were considered forbidden works uh, were discovered several years ago so that we could actually see these things. Um, but there's, there's so much that's lost. So much of it is lost. Um, paintings that you showed, uh, where are they? Oh, they're, uh, they, these paintings are accessible. Uh, these are accessible, except for the Boy Chukist photographs, obviously. All the Boy Chukist photographs were uh, covered over, damaged. Uh, but in museums, uh, some of the, uh, you know, more portable works are in private collections, even. Um, in the 70s, there were, for example, Bohomazo, Bohomazo's wife, uh, uh, preserved all of her husband's works uh, under her bed. And little by little, she, you know, uh, certain art historians were introduced to them, and certain collectors were introduced, and they kept them in their private apartments. And little by little, that's why Bohomazo is such an important figure, and yet he, I mean, he's right there alongside Kandinsky, because not only because his art is so powerful, but his writings are very powerful. And his, right, his major thesis of 1913 was never published. And yet it, it just sits alongside the ideas that Kandinsky was putting forth in his treatises, not only on the spiritual and art, but also the, the Bauhaus teachings. Um, so they are accessible, but they're now in private. Many of them are in private collections. Thank you. Um, your reading um, that you ended with of, um, of Marco in hell um, as, uh, as being the hell of the Soviet Union was very powerful. Uh, was it discussed in that way um, at the time in the circles of uh, um, those who participated or, um, or uh, uh, the audience? I think that's, that was the, the main point of the production. Yes. Uh, it wasn't discussed openly. It was very subtle. I mean, uh, it, it was a life, I mean, uh, all of our, not all of them, but many of our mad, uh, modernists professed uh, a support of Bolshevism and proletarianism, but, you know, they were just serving as mouthpieces. What they believed deep inside was very different. Yes. No, there's a gentleman behind you, I think. Thank you very much for your analysis, Mr. Tyler, for which things that I think we're going to say. Can you speak up a little bit? Can you speak up? Can you not hear me? That's better. I'll share that a little bit. Maybe the mic is not working. The presentation brings out all the elements involved in what seems to me of people trying to seek themselves as a separate entity, the language being a very important feature at all. So what do you think do? Though, is a diversification between the West, the Ukraine, the Balls, which used to be called Presto, well, the Austrian Hungarian Empire, it was part of Poland at one time, and the East, aka the Luce, and the history of the development of the Russian state. It would be interesting to bring that out in terms of what you consider to be a unique. Ukrainian modernization. So, a moment, I'm sorry. Um, if you could sort of have a word, a few words about that, I'd be very grateful for the man coming about the subject. I think we're living in a historical moment where those that linguistic divide uh, is being uh, ameliorated. I think um, uh, the war has really brought out um, the identity of Ukrainians. <coughs> And um, the realization that language is an identifier. Um, and yes, the political circumstances. We have to remember that the East was largely Russianized 
uh, through uh, very tragic events, the Holodomor in the 30s, which essentially depopulated the rural areas of eastern Ukraine, and the Russians uh, occupied those territories, so Russian language became dominant. And then every, every government activity was you know, enforcing Russian. So, and then you have to think about the larger policy of uh, so, uh, uh, the Soviet man speaking one language. I mean, all of the republics speaking one language. So all of those historical factors have to be weighed in, in, in better kind of sorting out this difference, if you will. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry for my bad English, uh, but I want to ask you to thank you for your presentation and thank you for this uh, question that you show up with us because it's really important. And I want to ask that about uh, um, a lot of Ukrainian uh, artists and a lot of Ukrainian paintings and uh, other uh, culture and uh, arts objects uh, are now asked, uh, or recognized as Russian. Uh, an object, culture object or artist object. And uh, my question is when uh, comes the time when both will be ready to, to, um, to make new research and to, to divorce Ukrainian uh, artists from Russian artists? And uh, maybe second question at the same time. Um, for me, it is interesting uh, in which way. Uh, I see like the society of historians of East European, European and Russian art and architecture. It is like a uh, uh, sponsor of this um, event. And for me it is interesting, um, what is Russian art is, if we are talking about Russian Empire, Soviet Union and Russian Federation, where is Russian art? Uh, to answer your first question, when is the time? Now is the time. We are in the time, in the time that we are, by educating ourselves and as educators, educating others about this difference. So this is the critical time. And it relates to organizations, it relates to academic programs, it relates to uh, the names of institutes and institutions within universities um, and, and programs in, in, in universities. Um, it's going to take probably another generation, uh, but it starts with an awareness, um, digging into um, an acknowledgement that there is a difference, and then beginning to create courses that will um, strengthen uh, the foundation for understanding the difference. And in terms of, you know, what's the difference between Russia, Russian Federation, and Soviet, um, I think, you know, we, we have a problem globally with that because um, when the Soviet Union was dissolved, uh, the United Nations never took a vote as to who would represent um, Russia. It just simply transferred over. So the USSR has represented the United Nations before the dis dissolution of the USSR. Uh, the Russian Federation just took over that vote and there was the, took over that position. And there's never been a vote that would designate the Russian Federation um, to have the veto power that it currently has. So there are lots of levels at which we need to be more aware uh, we need to educate ourselves, uh, and as I say, we need to educate the next generation. I went, when I was still in high school, I always like to tell this story because it was my first shock. Uh, I was raised in a Ukrainian family, so I, I knew who I was, and in 10th grade in world history class, um, the teacher was talking about the princess of Kiev, Russia, and I raised my hand. And I was told to sit down and not confuse things for students. So, yeah. I think it begins, it has to start very early on in the educational system. And we'll get there.
Thank you. I think we will end with this unless there are any final pressing questions. No. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. with food and water. Um, again, my name is Maria Mileva, and I'm a lecturer here in the Kultov, and I'm going to be chairing our first panel of the afternoon, which is dedicated to the themes and uh, topics surrounding Ukraine's modernism across borders, imperial emigre and institutional entanglements. And we're going to have three speakers. I'm going to make very short uh, introductions. And I encourage you to look at the programs that either you have them printed out. If you don't have a printed program, there is a, um, a QR code uh, somewhere on the door. On the door. Um, but you can also Google the name of the conference. And there is a PDF that you can download. And we're printing some more programs if you don't have it. And the program will have the abstract and the full biography for each speaker. Uh, something else to say is that we will have three um, papers. And at the end, there will be a group discussion. So please uh, save or note down your questions and save them for the group discussion at the end. So I'll be taking questions at the end. So without further ado, our first uh, presenter uh, in this panel is Dr. Michal Borjinski from the Silesian Museum in Katowice. And he's going to be speaking to us about kindred spirits, question mark, on correlations between young Poland, Młoda Polska, and young Ukraine, Molda Muza, and beyond. So please uh, welcome Michal. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor to be with you today. Uh, the, Maria, dear Katia, my greatest thanks for your initiative and invitation. Along with momentous and so dramatic upheavals in the tectonics of the present, there has been still strengthening the very concern to reevaluate ultimately the cultural geography of Europe especially towards and for the purpose of its non-canonical, non-Western, little recognized or lost regions. As announced by the title of the conference and this narrative, I will concentrate on selected aspects of the two ontogenic formations that left a lasting mark as young Poland and young Ukraine intertwined in no small measure, which have recently become of increasing interest to sciences from both the countries and fortunately, at last, to those from the hub's quotations of global information and knowledge. London, thank you. In the writings of uh, experts, the term young Ukraine, like young Slovakia, for instance, may be found very rarely, as if postponed by the neutral early modernism or more common art nouveau. <clears throat> It remains associated mainly with philological reflection on the legacy of Morda Musa, the moderately consolidated Lviv group of penmen, but also painters, sculptors, and composers fostering their philosophy, who stayed close in between 1906 and 1914, actually in the context of their unmediated relations with the Polish leukemia in Kraków. Meanwhile, in a meta-theoretical, horizontal, but multi-layered view of cultural history in Europe, the promoted term would best define and unite so many research and still unknown complexities of Ukrainian literary, artistic, music and theatrical life of that time, as it occurred on the ground of historiography with young Poland, which proved to be an enduring name for notabene various individualities and even incompatible tendencies in different media of creativity. If terminology underpins the crucial element for the visibility of phenomena, 
the stalemate of our case cannot be found, as discussed by and for few people. Up to now, we have not integrated the achievements of logo, icon, and phonosphere of young Ukraine and have not displayed them to the global public, preferably also in English, today's Latin. We have not organized any comprehensive intersemiotic uh, exhibition which would show its vastness and fecundity. Yet, the term itself had been used in a programmatic term by some contemporaries, such as the publicist Tadeusz Michalski and the poet Władysław Orkan, who profusely patronized the Polish Ukrainian proximity. Orkan tries to realize the ideal in the realm of literary translation. We can see the cover designed in a typical bot botanicist mode for the anthology of Ukrainian short stories by Ivan Franco and 13 others. Orkan completed the unprecedented publishing projects devoted to prose and poetry in natural cooperation with his real foreign brothers, Sidit Tverdoklip and Vasil Stefanik, and yet Bogdan Lepki. The last one grew into a key figure to mutual transfers of intellectual and aesthetic production, not only as a café regular and attentive listener of the self-made frenetic psychoanalytical expressionist arguments pointed out by mesmerizing Stanislav Przybyszewski, who had just returned from Berlin, just in the painting, Przybyszewski. Um, Wepke was, later on, as an, uh, um, was an important Slavonic lecturer at Jagiellonian University, as well as the author of the first history of Ukrainian literature in Polish, on one hand, and on the other, uh, of the memoir critical book uh, chiefly about Franco, Stefanik and Orkan in Ukraine. Intimately, Lepki dreamt of an independent Ukrainian state. He pulled for the siege reform and military <coughs> units in conjunction with the First World War. But officially, he was a follower of neighborly understanding up to the point of identity prevalence. Finally, in the end of the 1930s, when again the evident frictions, alas, between the two national policy statements came to the fore, the president of the Second Polish Republic appointed Lepki as senator. Even when the fact was of purely diplomatic character, <clears throat> the origins of the matter must have lied in the output of young Ukraine, which was to gain social subjectivity and brightness post factum, beyond its environmentally confined and internally quite dispersed existence. Ukrainian historiography places its culture between two demarcation domains, that of the West and that of the East, while the third one, Central European, has already been broadly described and put into practice. At the turn of the 20th century, Kraków, as the very example, embraced manifold elements that were enriching the entire macro region of which the imperial Austro Hungarian Habsburg Galicia remained a backboard of poorest um, territory with the contrastingly huge cultural potential implied in its multi ethnicity. Hence, westernization of Ukraine, chiefly in literature but also in art, could not have transpired with a simple shape based on the straight way to Vienna, Munich, and certainly Paris, la capitale du monde of the fin de siècle. The categories of political historical Galicia and of Central Europe postulated nowadays, partly tactile and partly imaginary in reconstructing or constructing mixed communities in their convergences, are directed to resigning from the persistent divisions into centers and peripheries, as considered relative and movable. Galicia and Central Europe offered a lot. Accordingly, three different attitudes of outstanding young Poland artists, professors of tens of Ukrainian students at the Krakow Academy of Fine Arts, founded in 1818, came to focus. Yes, the living protagonist Józef Mehofer drew constantly on the French modern in his inventive transformations, but another giant, Stanisław Wyspiański, 
who also experienced the French capital, cut himself off even from the Viennese milieu for a living truth to be set out only in native sources. And then the further academy's rector, Jacek Malczewski, took a middle path and developed an extraordinary style akin to continental symbolism and simultaneously rooted in the idiosyncratic inheritance of his tribe predecessors. All this semantic and formal ferment in the field of aesthetic declamations influenced effectively the Academy's high-flying alumni, whose uh, activity also spanned between two distant poles of early modernism in Central Europe, cosmopolitanism and ethnophilia. The mentioned formations were governed by the two main cultural forces, centrifugal and centripetal, which clashed in polarized areas of interactions. The first set the direction of exploration toward what was other and somewhat prestigious. The second, in turn, prescribed the unveiling of what was geographically and imaginatively near, more or less tamed, treated in the firm conviction of local property. The two paintings of the same artist, Osip Kurilas, trained in Krakow, can literally authenticate this deduction. The intricate words of Galicia was a half self-governmental province uh, of the monarchy uh, and emitted an opportunity for the flourishing of national identities. However, their expanding and overlapping went naturally far beyond it. The artist met in the West, often in Munich, permanently longing for historicism, and in the East, where many Ukrainians and Poles were born. Educated in Warsaw and Paris, one of the most legendary professors of the Academy, Jan Stanisławski, regularly came back to the country of his childhood to small towns and leaves with pistols, atonized also by Mikhail Berkos, and yet to Kiev, probably where he was portrayed in a significant manner within the large format by Oleksandr Murashko. Acclaimed the most prominent representative of his generation in art at home, a co-founder of the Ukrainian Academy of Fine Arts only in 1917, Murashko <coughs> elevated the painting at the institution's introductory watershed exhibition to thus reinforce the memory of the Pole who had been a member of professional societies in Krakow, Vienna, and Kiev. Perhaps, even if not explicitly, this art, this act, could have symbolically been intended to connect the Eastern and Western geocultural wings of Ukraine, and uh, as well as to make the unfeigned Slavonic ties more visible. The Western wing of young uh, Ukraine stretched uh, clearly uh, in, the, in the organic intermeshing with young Poland in Lviv immediately and in much smaller but royal scholarly Krakow pragmatically in a full condensation of possibilities between admiring um, highlights of, of the Middle Ages and perceiving the pioneering pre-avant-garde experiments. Most uh, of Ukrainians, as well as many Poles, arrived there from peasants or non affluent families thanks to private donations and then strove for progression and going abroad by dint of state prizes and grants. Eventually, the graduates with ambitious, uh, of ambitions of <coughs> building pretensions, Ivan Trush essentially, settled down rather in Lviv or its vicinity and attempted to implement some Polish mode of attainment for the intensifying of necessary processes of the national institutionalization. Trush sincerely admitted <coughs> that besides his cooperation with the Shevchenko Society, Scientific Society and his contribution to the series of documentary portraits of its members, he grew out of um, what was happening in Krakow. It mobilized him to establish the Society for the Advancement of Ruthenian Ukrainian Art and to organize the first all-Ukrainian art exhibition and to print the first art magazine in which he spoke out against conservative mentality and belated taste of his nation. Moreover, Trusha co-founded a group of six, together with his Polish brothers, 
with whom he generally shows tens of his works, signed in Ukrainian and Polish, in many spots and for many times. One of the most talented students of Stanislavski conclusively and his own discreet aesthetics that despite appearances lost the aura of any limitation in favor of competitive quality. It resulted from the inner vividness and elasticity of the painting made with the adjacent silent power of the brushwork means of expression in miniature. <coughs> Both the early modernist visions of national cultures were set up with several trends. One, thematically universal, often immersed in impressions of domestic or exotic nature and of uh, multifarious cities with towns, Stanislavski and Jews, for instance. Uh, second, uh, emanatingly solemn and pompous, usually linked to the old past, to secular and ecclesiastical authorities, and verging on the horizon of a uh, sovereign homeland. Uh, the example of it I, I will deliver in a minute. And next one, in the spirit of folklore mania, drawing on the resources of ethnic groups, like the Hutsu one, uh, with uh, their vigorously accentuated <coughs> distinctiveness. Unlike his master, Trush embodied all these modalities in painting. He embodied the fascination of Carpathian Highlanders in the works of Władysław Nierowski and others, as well as throughout the resounding the discourse about new vernacular and urban architecture, especially in Lviv. The Hutsul fever touched Trush, also possessed by the peculiar experience of Egypt, quite palpably, as it did to Owena Kulczycka, educated in Vienna for a change. Uh, atmospherically stylized and still embedded in mimetic realism without idealizing, the depiction of Hutsu everydayness and festivity assimilated their picturesque familiarity with other distinguishing features in the secessionist dimension of collaterally Polish and Ukrainian art. Furthermore, they both were strikingly brought up on romantic traditions, so they reached far beyond the reality here and now, emerging into the repository uh, of folk stories and beliefs um, among which the figure of Bernihora held their particular esteem. The songs of this seer or 18th century Cossack bard contained a prediction of the fall of Poland and uh, its final rebirth. Not surprisingly then, in relevance to the country's three partitions and its collapse, the breweries uh, had been regularly reactivated in Polish literature and art including the nocturnal piece by Leon Wytukowski, who portrayed him as an elderly blind man in an uh, oniric momentum, as if in the mysterious forest-like space. In turn, Modest Sosenko, another Ukrainian initially found in Krakow, situated his thoughtful hero, maybe of the same meaningful status, <coughs> in a dull landscape shrouded in the misty air of dusk or pre-dawn, pervading the whole of this melancholic scene. Both the artists must have known that Nehora provided with impetus in a gesture of extreme exaltation by the previous academy's director, Jan Matejko. However, only his compatriot, Bytukowski, followed him with some reference to a composition arrangement and color palette, whereas Sosenko, notabene during his later years in Paris, uh, decided to reassess the famous image of uh, by Le Zemchuznyko, the very friend of influential Shevchenko. Regarding this strong conventional coincidence, the scope of question arises as to what extent the currents of native iconographies might have determined the choices, the choices of artists, or, uh, or in other words, to what degree such repetitionary procedures pollinated young Poland and young Ukraine to be interpreted with the term neo-romanticism too. Indeed, these were the heights of uh, uh, emotional crescendo uh, which resonated from the studios of the national prophets, new prophets. Wyspiański's moody view of the alley with leafless trees 
around the old town conveys a referee around the transience of uh, the ent ent entities counted by the times of days and seasons of years, thus on the cycle of awaited renewals of nature and on the tenuousness of man's earthly life. The flowing, supple, chimerical line of the branches is evoking a scene gravitating even towards decadence, so similarly and somewhat differently to the painterly etude more nuanced in texture and colors by three younger, uh, three year younger Oleksandr Novakivsky, a keen observer of his teachers and peers' doings. In Vespiansky's um, ecstatic maximalism, steeped in the historiosophic vivisection of Polishness, the trajectory of universal values of the art of art's sake and its patriotic saturation are blurring. Yet because of the outlines in the background of the painting of the rubble castle and cathedral, meaning the national acropolis, the treasury of the Polish tenacity and dormant autonomy. On the other hand, the full crystallization of Novakivsky's national idealism, who, like Vespiansky, married a Polish peasant woman on the wave of um, amalgamation of social strata, took place primarily through his acquaintance with the Greek uh, Catholic uh, Archbishop, uh, Archbishop uh, Andrzej Szeptycki, also a deputy for Galicia and the whole of Austrian Cisleitania, the initiator of the funding of a national museum in Lviv and of the magazine Young Ukraine, and last but not least, the consistent patron of more than tens uh, of compatriot artists including Novakivsky and his students in the interval period. The exquisite portrait of the dignified metropolitan with the sign of faith on his chest and the sign of authority in his hand shows the evolution of the painter's idiom towards the nervous but sublimeing flurry of impastor brushstrokes, typically, typical mostly of German expressionism. As an aside, I would underline the fact that the work was found in a dumpster some years ago. Once again. <laughs> the widespread circulation of aesthetic ideas and forms in the era has removed, in my opinion, the negative axiology for Polish or Ukrainian works as secondary to their alleged prototypes, and it allows to proceed with comparatist enlightenment. So many visual and verbal visions taken from both the cultures are lavishly articulated in the fondness for transitional states of time and space, such as autumn and spring. What was to correspond to agony and procreation in general, as well as the individual wafting in between subconsciousness and awareness of the entire state with proper privileges. It was a soulscape filled with nostalgia, weariness, and presumably hope in the limitless mountainous or sea setting to where it frequently refers. Sentimental verses of Jan Kasprowicz, like those of the young muse, resounded in the rhythm and anaphor, with, even with uh, inertia, the feeling of meaningless this destiny or all this indefinable grief. At other times, the topos of spring was personified with naked children, sluggish boys or girls, who were keeping new vitality in sight, and then the promise for the future. Novakivsky's compositions in particular, with a crucifix in the background, seemed to carry uh, this message, the message of the national resurrection. The romantic uh, meandering of young Poland and young Ukraine were uh, thoroughly imbued, imbued with symbolism, and thus uh, they widened the polyphony of their language to mythological and biblical motifs. This too um, propelled the processes of the correspondence of art and the totality of the work of art that were realized in little books as well as in monumental stained glass windows. The holistic commitment to painting, graphic design and poetry guided not only Vespiansky, but also the Academy's award-winning student Mikhailo Zhuk, 
who befriended many Ukrainian and Polish Bohemians. In his memories, Trush remembered and brought highly about uh, Zhuk's early work Sadness, which participated in the Ukrainian exhibition in 1905, although he pointed out that it contained the, the obvious traces of Wyspiansky and Malczewski. Intriguingly, secessionist undulations with florals, typical of the former, and the winged heroes of the latter, Ophius or the god Pan with a flute, wandering in the wilderness, made up also the best-known piece entitled Black and White, or White and Black, uh, dated to later years. More interesting, to my estimation, is the confluence between the idioms of Zhuk and Nehofer, the author of uh, the stained glass windows for the cathedral is Swiss Freiburg, with whom the young Ukrainian took classes too. They both pursued concepts of interior decoration and reconciled naturalist representations of plants with abstract elements advanced to slight geometrization. In painting, two fabulous works, Strange Garden and Fairy Tale, have given the evidence of their pinnacle imaginative and technical skills while evoking one of the most fundamental confessions of young Poland and young Ukraine, uh, Art Nouveau in general, uh, in dreaming of a better, even if vague, more beautiful world all around. Undoubtedly, in the face of unusual but rather homogeneous legacies of the movement's other representatives, Zhuk's truly rejuvenated, somewhat poster-like portraits from about 1920 were a source of discovery uh, for an original, very original formula. Prepared in uh, diverse techniques and even with diverse materials, such as textiles, uh, they uh, effected uh, in combinations of inherently contradictory politics, that of decorative horror vacui and that of purifying simplification. Together with Pablo Kovshun, who studied in Kyiv and from where he moved, he had to move to Lviv for political reasons, Zhuk manifested the cultivation of a paradigm shift by crossing the waning order of Art Nouveau with the strict avant-garde that also in Ukrainian and Polish transmutations was just celebrating its pervasive uh, ascendancy. Thank you. That was really visually uh, stimulating. We will um, move, please save the questions. We'll move on to our next uh, speaker, who is Dr. Aksana Kandrativa, who is an independent scholar and artist. She will speak to us today about modernist stained glass in Ukraine, from Western to Ukrainian tradition. Uh, please join me in welcoming Aksana. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you very much for kind of production, and uh, uh, thank you to the curatorial team, uh, Dr. Maria, Mile Maria Mileva and uh, Dr. Katarina Denisova for interest and invitation. Staying glass and Ukraine. The initial perception of these two notions might be controversial. Indeed, the history of Ukraine's stained glass, or architectural glass art, in broader sense, had been terra incognita for years. Although it's a cultural phenomenon, rich and many-sided, spanning from the medieval Kievan rules until present. But in my lecture today, I would like to showcase how Ukraine's stained glass had developed from the Western European to Ukrainian tradition at the turn of the 20th century, how stained glass channeled countries' cultural diversities and international relationships, and thirdly, what role the stained glass played in shaping all of Ukraine's visual culture in modernism on the whole. So, in the watercolor painting, Night in the Manor, by Georgi Nakut, the colorful stained glass window shines through the indigo night. The diamond-shaped quarries of glass are set in a lattice of lead. The stained glass is a focal point illustrating a symbolic statement on the art medium. It proves 
that the stained glass was present <coughs> in modernist visual culture. But how did it begin? The beginning of modernism in the 1880s witnessed the flourishing of religious stained glass in ecclesiastical architecture. The constant demand for stained glass by religious institutions stimulated commissions to renowned Western European <coughs> stained glass studios. They covered all stages of manufacturing, designing, cartooning, and lading. Stained glass cartoons are the templates for cutting glass and painting on glass. So a series of stained glass windows in the Roman Catholic Metropolitan Cathedral in Lviv brilliantly illustrates the dominance of foreign studios. The most acclaimed studios, such as Royal Bavarian Court Stained Glass Studio Frank Soviet Settler, France Mayan Company of Munich, the studio called Gehling in Vienna, Tirole Glass Malerai und Mosaikanstalt in, in Innsbruck, Krakow Kizakal Tetrazov uh, Zelensky, produced stained glass across the entire territory of Ukraine, divided between the Austro Hungarian and the Russian Empire at the time. Only Maya and Company of Munich had executed over 35 windows for churches in Lviv. Nikolaev and Odessa between 1881 and 1899. At the same time, insisted capitalization of the economy resulted in the rise of individual fortunes and patronages of the arts. It was the grand bourgeoisie above all who had both the desire and the financial means to commission stained glass. Thus, stained glass windows appeared in the residential buildings. The former home of the Tereshenko family in Kiev, top art collectors and philanthropists in the Russian Empire at the time, was furnished and decorated with the best exemplars of art. Tereshenko commissioned three arched stained glass windows to the Royal Bavarian Court stained glass studio Frank Soviet Settler in Munich in 1885. As you can see on the cartoon on the left, the artistic language follows a strong Western European visual canon. This kind of windows could be found in residential buildings across Europe at the time. But gradually, established artists began to be involved in stained glass production. In particular, they designed and cartooned stained glass generally through open competitions. However, the manufacture windows was executed by stained glass studios, as illustrated this uh, three light windows by Teodor Aksentovich, a Polish-Armenian painter and director of the Academy of Finance in Krakow. The reason for the tendency was twofold. First, many artists were educated at the best art schools in Paris, Vienna, Prague, and Munich, and were familiar with the medium of stained glass. Secondly, numerous artists worked in various art media who sought to create Gesamtkunstwerk, in architectural space, where stained glass was an instrumental medium. One of the most prominent Kharkiv architects of the era, Alexei Baketov, had envisaged his family house as a universal artwork. Along with building, he designed a range of decorative arts features, including stained glass, the muse of architecture, a muse on Parnassus purely invent invented by himself. Thanks to frequent traveling, Beketov developed various contacts across Europe and became a transmitter of ideas in Kharkiv and Slobozhenshina, working with most acclaimed European factories. Remarkably, he, dis he sought to incorporate stained glass not only into residential buildings, but also into religious ones. Stained glass gradually became a common element in Orthodox church decor, successfully adapting and developing a local tradition. The stained glass iconostasis is a true masterpiece of sacred art made of glass and metal. It was privately commissioned for a domestic church in Kharkiv, structurally designed by Beketov and produced by Zettler Studio in Munich in 1905. The stained glass iconostasis was an absolute innovation in ecclesiastical decor, yet followed a canonical iconographic system and conventional structure. The glazing itself exemplifies the best tradition of Munich stained glass with application of exquisite painting, silver staining, and acid etching techniques. However, the iconography is a stylistic cocktail, as illustrated on the slide, with a mixture of Western and Eastern features. 
At the same time, a specific cultural episode full of emotional content and personal techniques developed in the Carpathian region. Icon painting on glass was a rare type of folk art. Although the method of icon painting has always been called, that means not fired in the kiln as uh, with traditional stained glass, and therefore it's not considered as traditional stained glass, it's worth mentioning this extraordinary approach to painting on glass. The practice developed in Hutsulchen and Pakutian areas close to glass workshops, providing access to locally made glass. Icon paintings referred to a variety of iconographical sources and references. This includes lithographs, engravings, xylographs, and paintings by well-established artists from Central and Western Europe, as well as by local professionals. Ironically, glass icons were officially banned as the church decoration by the clergy and functioned exceptionally as separate domestic objects. But coming back to the traditional stained glass, one of the first Ukrainian artists who envisaged a holistic decorative program in ecclesiastical architecture in Halichina was Modest Sasenko. Along with wall painting, he personally developed full-scale cartoons for stained glass at St. Michael Church in Pibiristi in Lviv region. I'm a matter of Krakow and Munich Academy of Arts. His artistic career developed under the patronage of Metropolitan Andrei Sheptitsky. It was quite often that only thanks to Sheptitsky progressive thinking, the churches received new stained glass windows. Another extraordinary example of universal decorative program with stained glass has been in Brazilian church in Jopo, designed by Julian Wutzmanuk, a student of Modest Sasenka. Also alma mater of Krakow Academy of Arts and Prague Academy, Wutzmanuk worked in various art media. The stained glass windows here was produced by Krakow's Kizapat Vitrajol, Zelensky exemplifying a well-established partnership between Ukrainian artist and Polish stained glass studio. An intimate and lyrical artistic language by Butzmanuk has been in tune with pre-Raphaelite iconographic canon, similar to Burn Jones and Morris stained glass windows, as shown on the slide, however, with the time difference between 30 and 40 years. Perhaps the era's triumph of the synthetic approach to stained glass design appeared in a series of windows by Petro Kovodny, the elder, for the Dormition Church in Lviv. The resulting design scheme was a successful fusion of Byzantine iconographic tradition, universal geometrical design principles, and folk art. For background, Kovodny applied, as you can see on the slide, geometry from the north road Rose window at the Shard Cathedral. At the same time, his encounters with Carpathian folklore illustrated in the ornamental Hutsul tapestries. In 1925, Holodny had gone to Krakow to collaborate with Zelensky's stained glass studio. It was such a success that the stu studio used his design in the advertisement. These windows represent one of the most significant stained glass works of the period in ecclesiastical architecture at the time. In a decade, Petro Holodny designed three more stained glass windows, however, this time in a different composition and color palette. The narrative windows illustrate notable personalities from Ukraine's history. Modernism was the time of various experiments in art, but not only in painting, but also in stained glass. The highly expressive Eastern Dancer by Maria Narshevsky image on the right resonates with three female figures by Alexander Exter. The three figures depicted on stained glass give a dynamic impetus to the <coughs> space, and remarkably, the stained glass was made of opalescent Tiffany glass by a leaf-based stained glass studio, Leon Hoppel. It shows that the local glazing <coughs> shop achieved a great technical command in stained glass. Along with Art Deco, stained glass channeled futurism. The burst of stars and cosmic hurricanes surround the rigorously structured space, creating a rhythmical contrast between motion and stillness. The stained glass windows is set in a former building or chamber of commerce in Lviv. But just before the outbreak of the First World War, modest Sasenka embarked on the journey to decorate a newly built premises for Listen to Music Institute in Lviv. 
uh, designed by Alexander Lushpinsky and Yvonne Chervinsky, the building exemplifies the big secession. Its interior is a vivid ornamental fabric Vasa Senta aimed to create a universal space uniting various parts of Ukraine. His visual vocabulary, vocabulary comprised of elements from Poltava and Husul folk art. Was the artist's endeavor to create an, the nation's garden of Eden? Seven oval stained glass windows rhythmically interplay with ornamental murals representing music in space and time. The decorative scheme has been a quintessential interior tech and educational building at the time, but Sassen legacy is one of dedication and excellence in the field of art. In search of national identity, there was an unprecedented appeal to the national traditions and history. A movement entitled to Ukrainian architecture honorable was inspired by vernacular architecture that channeled a great wave of interest in all things of glory. Windows design received a particular attention from the architects and became one of the notable features of the movement, in particular trapezoid-like forms. Appropriately, stained glass design had transformed, adjusting to new architectural forms. Ukrainian narratives dominated as featured in the Poltava Province Council building, a magnus opus by Vasil Prochevsky. Along the glazing scheme, although the glazing scheme was sim in simplified ornamental forms and varied graphically, the use of color was rather restrained. During the burgeoning of constructivism, stained glass lost its importance in the architecture repertoire. Along with uh, economic post-war hardships and new societal and political models, function of the building came to the fore. Architects sought, to, sought for new forms and space working under the motto, returning to the past leads to the creativity loss. Light and color were differently addressed in architectural space, however, sometimes with experimental journeys. It was the period when the state policy of Ukrainization, Stalin repression and establishment of the socialist realism dramatically changed the stained glass scene. Stained glass had occasionally been featured in public buildings becoming an exclusive decorative feature as exemplified in Shevchenko Memorial Museum in Pani, designed by Vasil Prochevsky and Petro Kostelka. This type of building was possible only because Shevchenko was a trusted personality who conformed to the official ideology of correctness. Here, classical architectural forms merged with ornamental deco inspired by Ukrainian opera. Modernist stained glass was locked by the Soviet paradigm but Ukrainian context continued to incline into, in the interval period as the nation, national version of Soviet ideology. <clears throat> the end of modernism in Ukraine became the setting sun for Ukraine's stained glass. And with this example, I would like to conclude that we have seen a rapid evolution of stained glass as a specific artistic form in modernism. The confidence of artists and craftsmen engaged in glasswork had grown dramatically. They became familiar with all major techniques and stained glass was used in the ecclesiastical, educational, commercial, and domestic settings. The ethnic and religious polyphony of the region brought, regions brought a distinctive richment, richness in subject matter and themes. In the context of Ukraine stained glass history overall, modernism was a pivotal revival period. First, it brought back Western European tradition of stained glass to Ukraine, which was absorbed by and transformed to the local context. Secondly, modernist stained glass channeled countries, cultural diversities, and international relationships. And finally, modernist stained glass had, have had an enduring impetus on Ukraine's visual culture in the second half of the 20th century when stained glass was reborn by legendary Phoenix. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, that was absolutely uh, fascinating. Uh, we will move on to our third uh, speaker for this panel, the final speaker. 
Dr. Jakob Hauser, who is a curator at the Museum of Czech Literature in Prague. And uh, Jakob is going to be talking about the presidential portrait that never came to be a Hidoka, Prague, and the Ukrainian emigre community. Please welcome Jakob. Thank you so much for the introduction and for the incredible care I was provided with during the all stages of uh, the preparation of the conference. And especially I would like to thank you, uh, Matthew Stevenson, for providing me with uh, images from Archipenko's uh, exhibition in Prague that I uh, didn't find in, in local resources. Um, on July 25th, 1923, Miklós Shapoval, the chairman and founder of the Ukrainian Civic Committee in Czechoslovakia, wrote a letter in Ukrainian to the Czechoslovak Ministry of Foreign Affairs offering a portrait of President Tomasz Garik Masaryk to be made. This offer was presented as a gift from Ukrainian citizens in Czechoslovakia and elsewhere who wanted to donate a bust of the first president of the Czechoslovak Republic as an expression of their affection and gratitude. The magnitude of the offer was underscored by the fact that the portrait was to be created by the best Ukrainian artist, stated in the, in the letter, the sculptor Alexander Archipenko. Chapoval asked that, I quote, appropriate measures be taken so that Mr. President would grant the artist Archipenko permission for several sittings, end quote. Archipenko was to produce a bust which will be cast in bronze in the artist's studio. This letter, which was received by the ministry about a month after Archipenko's monographic exhibition in Prague ended, was forwarded to the, uh, by the ministry to the office of the president on 12th September 1923, with a letter signed by Václav Gerza, who, on behalf of the ministry, recommended that the request be granted. He stated that it was, I quote, a sincere expression of the devotion of the Ukrainian nation to the President of the Republic, and that the artist who is to make the best is an excellent sculptor. The European Civic Committee's request was almost certainly related to Archipenko's exhibition organized by the Devetsil Art Association at the Artist's House of Dom uh, between April and June 1923. It was probably discussed with Archipenko in person during his visit to Prague in June uh, of that year on the occasion of the last days of his exhibition. The Daily, Czechoslovenska Republika, Czechoslovak Republic, published a brief report of an uh, intimate soiree uh, at the Graf Hotel, organized by David Sill, to bid farewell to Archipenko, who was to return to Berlin after a few days in Prague. The newspaper even claims that Archipenko expressed his desire to settle down in Prague, which can be read either as a manifestation of sculptor's politeness or as a popular narrative of the periodical, as it had published the same information about Stanisław Przybyszewski only a few weeks here earlier. <laughs> Archipenko's Prague exhibition was organized by one of the leading representatives of David Sill, the theoretician, critic, and typographer Karel Tajke, a central figure and ideological leader of the Czechoslovak avant-garde. Uh, actually, the poster is, is golden. It's maybe not that apparent from the slide. Uh, they told me the archive of the National Gallery is really difficult to scan. By the way. Uh, the exhibition was accompanied by Taika's small catalog, which was published in a similar graphic design as the revolutionary anthology de Vietzil, which was put out at the end of 1922 as the first collective publication of this group. Archipenko's show took place between the first and second group exhibition of de Vietzil. Although both of these group shows at the artist house took place in short succession in the spring of 22 and the autumn of 1923, they documented the radical transformation of David Sill and its shift from the predominant, predominantly poetic naive art uh, of the first exhibition to a show that, under the title The Bazaar of Modern Art, pointed the way to a celebration of modern civilization and playfulness with references to the Berlin Dada Messe of the summer of 1920. At the same time, uh, the second exhibition testifies to the group's growing involvement in the international art scene. 
most notably by inviting Mendre, who exhibited a series of photographs from his cycle Jean de Lucier. Sculpture was represented here um, by several ready-mades, large ball earrings or a mannequin from a hairdresser's, described in the catalogue as a fashionable sculpture. The exhibition and the pub publishing activities of the Rensil in these years uh, were major milestones in the process of the group's personal and programmatic transformation in search for a new relationship to the Cubist tradition on the one hand and to purism and constructivism on the other. Archibenko's exhibition thus, um, was outside of the group's established conception of program. The Rensil was undergoing a dynamic development and its relationship to Archibenko was not entirely unambiguous. In the catalog of Archibenko's exhibition, where the accompanying text is more of a broader reflection on the status of contemporary sculpture than a focus exclusively on the work of Archibenko, Karel Tagge writes, somewhat paradoxically, that, I quote, the future of sculpture is very bleak. The more admire admirable are the heroic efforts of some of the most brilliant modern sculptors, the braver is their hope, end quote. The bleak feature of sculpture, according to Taige, stems from its relationship to architecture, which, um, I quote, iron and concrete, constructive and purist, renounces sculpture because it will not, not allow its pure beauty to be uh, artistically disfigured by, by it. The text for Arch Archibenko's exhibition reflects a certain dilemma of Taige's uh, caused by his fascination with constructivism, which was based mainly uh, on Ilya Ehrenberg's portrayal uh, of it in his manifesto, and yet it moves from 1920, well, these years. Uh, Ehrenberg's quotation that new art will cease to be art, or nové umění přestane být umění, the top of this uh, page, the top uh, part, uh, was printed as a programmatic slogan in the anthology Život 2, uh, Life number 2, um, one of the key collective publications of David Sale in those years, and edited by the architect Jaromir Kreitzar. On the other side of Taiges belief that progress would, would an end to erstwhile artistic expressions with no utility, stood his real interest in Cubism after a visit to Paris in the summer of 1922, where he was guided by, among others, the collector and art dealer Adolf Basler. Even so, Characteristic of Taiga's constant tension between theoretical concepts and interest in real artistic production, Archibenko is for him the first and boldest of modern sculptors who, before the war, had indicated several paths to a new development by his use of new materials, new means of expression, his abbreviations and omissions of form, um, his cubist composition, and his sculptural painting. In any case, at the time of, of his monographic exhibition, Archibenko's work was not only reproduced in the earliest publications of De Wetzel, referenced above, um, which presented him as a founding figure of modern sculpture, but was also perceived by the previous generation of authors as a classic of modern art. This is shown, for example, by the fact that the painter Josef Czapek, in a review in Lidové Noviny, was able to express his preference for Archibenko's earlier works over those currently on display at the artist's house. Partly, no doubt, thanks to the 1914 group exhibition organized by Alexandre Merceau at the Manes Association, where Archibenko was represented by a set of four plaster and one wooden sculptures. Taike had also presented uh, Archibenko as a classic in the architectural journal Stampa, uh, where he writes in ref reference to 1902 exhibition of August Rodin, which had a major impact on the local art scene, that since Rodin's exhibition, Prague has not seen a more important sculptural show. Um, as, uh, I quote, In truth, Archibenko is to modern sculpture what Picasso is to painting. Uh, um, at the same time, he mentions that works were purchased from the exhibition. Uh, I quote, it is to be welcomed with gratitude that several outstanding works were purchased by progressive individuals for their private residence uh, and will thus be preserved in Prague, while the state and modern galleries simply ignored the exhibition, which could have been a good opportunity for important purchases." End quote. 
Even so, two of Archipenko's marble sculptures from the exhibition later made it into the National Gallery's collection. The older white torso was purchased by the gallery in 1965 from private collection, and the newer seated woman uh, was transformed, uh, transferred, sorry, transferred uh, to the collection from the originally original collection of the Modern Gallery, uh, which had acquired it in uh, 1938. Um, but what was the role of the Ukrainian civic committee in these events? Activities of the committee included mainly practical support for Ukrainian immigrants from providing basic needs uh, to education and the organization of the library uh, and the Ukrainian house, for example, Ukrainska Khata. Um, it presented its activities to the local public at several exhibitions during this period, most notably with a large-scale exhibition of Ukrainian prints and book design in April 1924, both at the Ukrainian studio of plastic arts and at the artist's house. The same location as Archibankos show presented exactly one year before. At the same time that the Ukrainian committee came up with the idea of commissioning Archibankos portrait of President Masaryk, the art circle, the Hurtok Plastichnoho Mistestva, at the committee was uh, organizing an exhibition of local Ukrainian artists. Uh, the circle soon, soon transformed into the Ukrainian Art Society uh, and in December 1923 uh, its chairman, the art historian and theater scholar Dmitro Antonovich, founded the Ukrainian studio, not also, known also as the Ukrainian uh, Art Academy in Prague. In the following year, the Ukrainian Civic Committee also founded the Ukrainian Museum Archive, uh, which, in 1925, uh, transformed into the, the Museum of Ukrainian's Struggle for Independence, which Antonovich headed for the next 20 years. As an art historian, Antonovich sought both to lay the foundations of the history of Ukrainian art and to create a certain ideological program for the Ukrainian studio. In his lectures, he focused on liberating the history of Ukrainian art from the notion of Russian art and um, redefining the existing perspective on the relationship between Russian art as a center and Ukrainian as its periphery. A certain non-hierarchical approach is evident in his collection of lectures entitled Ukrainian Culture. Uh, the section devoted to contemporary sculpture presents a rather broad catalogue of artists and Alexander Arkhipenko is at the end of the list in which very different figures such as Mikhailo Havrilko, Mikhailo Paraschuk, Vasil Ischenko or Ivan Severa are featured. Apart from these artists, Antonovich claims that most sculptors of the time work in Prague and that, I quote, here the famous sculptor and master of animal forms, Konstantin Stakovsky, plays a major role, noting that his professor at the studio uh, founded a whole school of young Ukrainian sculptors. Regarding Akipenko, Antonovich writes that he is, I quote, richly gifted by nature, armed with an advanced background in technique and mastery of both classical drawing uh, and plastic form, and that he was exper experimenting uh, from a young age, experiencing all the extre extremes of artistic currents that characterized a nervous and restless time in Paris. However, according to Antonovich, the logical reasoning, balance and beauty of pure forms and unusually pure colors distinguish Archipenko's works, raising them from an eccentric experiment to a through artistic insight." End quote. From the brief summary of Archipenko's career in Antonovich's text, one can sense that the author had more confidence in the beauty of pure forms of the uh, sculptor's recent work than the experiments and extremes of the earlier periods. Nevertheless, if Antonovich was, was reflecting on Archipenko's Prague exhibition, no evidence is, um, of this can be found. The offer by the Ukrainian Civic Committee for Archipenko to produce a portrait of the Czechoslovak president was ultimately in vain. But before Chapoval's letter was forwarded to the office of the president, a discussion took place at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs about whether Archipenko was a suitable candidate for Masaryk's portrait. On August 3rd, 1923, the political <coughs> section of the ministry stated its concern, concerns stemming from the fact that, I quote, Archipenko is a truly outstanding artist, 
but he leans toward the most modern trends in sculpture, so that the likeness in his sculptures completely disappears. <laughs> he makes all flat planes and does not pay attention to form. He is a cubist. He is 45 years old, and it is feared that he has forgotten to model. <laughs> One should look at the Prager Presse, where some of Archipenko's works are, were depicted. End quote. Uh, ultimately, on the basis of the reproductions in this newspaper, the ministerial department concluded that the, scul the sculpture, the Schwangere, the, the pregnant woman uh, there on the, the right, um, shows that he can still model, and that Archipenko can be recommended uh, to the president's office. However, the office of the president replied to the ministry on uh, uh, October 11, 1993, that, I quote, for the time being, it is not possible to comply with the proposal from the Ukrainian Civic Committee. There are already a number of artists who applied much earlier and who have not yet been received. This application, uh, the application of the sculptor Archipenko has been inclu included in the list in view of, of the recommendation there, and he will be informed as soon as he, his turn comes and as soon as the president can give a session, end quote. Archipenko's inclusion at the end of an apparently extensive list of potential portraitists, which can be read as a polite rejection by the presidential office, came at a time when Archipenko was already moving from Berlin to the United States at any rate. On the other hand, the positive reaction and recommendation from the foreign ministry may be directly related to the figure of Václav Girza, the man who forwarded Chapel's letter to the presidential office. Girza, born into the Czech community in Ukrainian Shepetivka, had worked as a doctor in Kiev before the revolution and with the Czechoslovak legions reached Prague via Vladivostok, where he organized the evacuation of Czechoslovak soldiers. And in the early 1920s, he became chairman of the Interministerial Commission, directing the famous Russian aid action in which the state also supported a wide network of Ukrainian institutions and individuals throughout the 1920s. Despite its effort to convey Archivenko as a portraitist of the president, it is clear that the Ukrainian committee focused primarily on working for the local Ukrainian community, and building international contacts in the field of art was certainly not one of its priorities. Thus, the idea of Archivenko's portrait of President Masaryk may have been motivated primarily by the hope of generating interest from the presidential office, rather than an effort to highlight Prague as a center of modern art and specifically the Ukrainian footprint in the city. In any case, this unsuccessful attempt from the Ukrainian committee marks a deviation from the otherwise fairly consistent classification of Archipenko as a Russian artist in the local environment. In his brief monograph on Archipenko, or the exhibition catalogue, uh, Taiki lists both nationalities, so Ukrainian and Russian, in his archival collection at the Museum of Czech Literature, in one of the copies of the catalogue, the word Russian is crossed out by Taiki's hand. <laughs> Even so, the connection to Ukraine or Ukrainian art history does not appear in the reflections on, of the exhibition. However, it is almost certain that, that Taiki was not in contact with Ukrainian organizations during the negotiations for the exhibition. The exhibition organized by Taiga uh, and the activities of the Ukrainian Civic Committee thus remain parallel stories that took place at practically the same time in the same place, so the artist's house. Yet, they never intersected. Archipenko thus continued to be appropriated uh, by the Russian and Czech language art history in the local environment uh, as a Russian artist. Uh, for example, uh, at the exhibition organized by the Slavic Institute in Prague in 1935 at Klamkalas uh, Palace in Prague and entitled The Retrospective Exhibition of Russian Painting, uh, was Archipenko represented with a bronze sculpture from the private collection of Arne Laurin, the editor-in-chief of the Daily Prague Presse. In the year of Archipenko's exhibition, Karel Taike created one of his best known and most, most ambiguous works of art the collage, or picture poem, uh, Departure to Kithera, referring in its title to the Antoine Vato's uh, iconic painting, The Embarkation for Kithera, but in this case transforming the island of Venus from Greek mythology into, in the words of the literary historian Josef Vojmodík, 
an imagined world of the future, the world of modern art and life. The topos of Greek mythology exists in Taiga's picture poem uh, as the site of the wonders of American modern life. End quote. The motif of travel, of distances, and modern civilization at the same time is represented here by an ocean liner sailing from Europe to America. For Taiga, Utopian space and metaphor for the power of poetry, art, and their ability to imagine paradise on earth became a reality and a permanent refuge for Archipelago that very same year. Thank you for your attention. That was an incredible kind of thriller, um, <laughs> uh, and uh, we want to know the next installment. <laughs> uh, so thank you so much, and I would like to invite our speakers to um, sit down at the table so that we can take uh, questions. <laughs> Okay, thank you so um, thank you so much. I think there was uh, so many synergies between the three uh, papers and they also kind of unfolded in time and also media and uh, kind of historiography, which I thought was fascinating. I wonder, I'm going to take Chair's privilege and ask um, the first question, which is also quite kind of practical. Um, I'm interested in thinking about um, what um, kind of um, the um, kind of the, the skeleton underneath, or what, what we didn't see in a way, so, or what we did actually see, I'll explain. So you, um, Oksana, you mentioned the um, cartoons for the stained glass, so I um, want to know if they survive and what one can learn from the cartoons that you don't just see from the stained glass windows themselves, which are of course so fragile, and you showed in your slides how they, um, some were destroyed during the Second World War, but also during the most recent full-scale invasion. So I'm interested about the, in the cartoons. And Jakob, you talked about um, uh, the sculptures and how in the response, um, uh, Archipianko's um, modeling was critiqued. But I think his drawings were also displayed in the exhibition on the walls. So I'm interested in where kind of his um, uh, classical drawing technique was more visible. So if you could talk a little bit more um, about the uh, drawings that were on display. And Michal, uh, for you, I'm interested in the, maybe like the uh, educational, the institution of the Krakow uh, Art <coughs> Academy and the um, kind of the structure of the teaching and if there are the syllabus and what we whether you've looked into the archives of the academy and what we can learn from the pedagogical models within the academy that then kind of um, have the legacies and the works fascinating beautiful works that you showed us so I'm just going to um, leave it. Uh, Oksana, maybe if you start to ask the first question. Thank you for the question. Cartoons are crucially important for stained glass making. So it's, um, it's a drawing for cutting the glass and painting every piece of glass or applying other techniques. And um, look at, looking at the heritage, what we've uh, uh, received. If we are talking about cartoons for um, uh, developed by Modest Sosenko, 
they have been survived in the National Museum of Shpitsky in Lviv, and they are accessible, and they, uh, they, there is a brilliant monograph uh, dedicated to Sasenka, and they are presented there as well. And uh, recently there was uh, um, an article published in the Journal of Stained Glass here in London dedicated exclusively to uh, Sasenka's uh, legacy in stained glass. So they are available. If we are talking about other cartoons, especially in um, of the uh, early era, uh, those cartoons, uh, for instance, for um, uh, Teresian cars <coughs> in Kiev, <coughs> the majority of settlers, it was uh, um, it was made by uh, Royal Bavarian. Um, Court stained glass studio Franz Xavier Zettler, and uh, during the Second World War, the bomb hit uh, the, the studio's archive and they are lost. And only thanks to the publication, uh, which was dedicated to the 40th anniversary of Zettler's stained glass studio, we can trace uh, some uh, stained glass cartoons that were applied to the architecture. On, on the territory of Ukraine. So this is one of the sources. There is a Munich archive uh, which assesses some of the cartoons. Unfortunately, um, as I said, uh, uh, during the Second World War, there was a boom at the uh, Zettler Studio was merged with the Meyer Studio. And uh, uh, unfortunately, the majority of cartoons uh, was destroyed. So we can still trace some uh, bits and find some references. Uh, and uh, they are crucially important to restore, uh, to, to, re to restore what, what is behind and how stained glass evolved. Um, I think. Yeah, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. should I continue? Yes, I'm thinking now of what to answer. But the discussion I mentioned was more of a people at the like employees of the ministry uh, who apparently did not visit the exhibition. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, what was interesting for me was exactly how these people who are not uh, art critics or art historians and have to express some position uh, on, let's say, cubist art in this case, uh, how they reacted and they reacted in a uh, rather funny, funny way, uh, in a, um, this perspective that they feared that uh, the Cubist culture would uh, create a portrait of, of the president. Uh, so, um, yes, yeah, so, so, so that's the first part of the question. Yeah. I think that, uh, uh, that it wasn't a, um, a discussion by, by competent uh, people. Uh, and uh, the drawings, uh, I think they were understood more as a supplement to the, the like a sculptural uh, exhibition and uh, as far as I remember, no one really reacted specifically to the drawings, except for uh, Josef Čapek, who was a quite famous painter of the previous generation. He uh, was a main uh, art critic of uh, Lidové noviny. Uh, that was a really important newspaper. Uh, and, and he was uh, overall critical to the, to the show, and I, I think he was even more critical to the, to the drawings. That, uh, <laughs> I don't remember the exact words, but, uh, um, but the other... Uh, reflections on the exhibition, I think, didn't really pay attention specifically to, to the drawings. There were also some lithographs exhibited uh, alongside uh, the sculptures and, and drawings. And, and were any acquired for collections the, in Czechoslovakia? Uh, some lithographs were acquired to the, the private, so some okay. private collections because right. it was the cheapest uh, thing okay. to buy, yeah. apparently. Uh, <laughs> but for the drawings, I, I don't think so. Okay. No. Thank you. So uh, coming back to Krakow <laughs> and to the hours of uh, uh, the turn of the centuries, um, uh, I think that um, it was uh, it was really modern. Just uh, thinking of of um, the Hebel Academy, who uh, transformed uh, you know from the School of Fine Arts into the Academy of Fine Arts um, in 1900. But uh, five years ago, in 19 in 1895. Um, you know, the rectors changed. So, of course, uh, 
we should talk about you know diverse visions for uh, pedagogical um, education and of course for aesthetics. So uh, we saw the painting by Jan Mateiko and of course um, rooted directly in Munich and uh, historicism and uh, you know all the uh, uh, really really heavy I would say in Krakow on one side and on the other one uh, the, uh, you know a new rector uh, Julian Fawad who um, invited young uh, painters, educated in the West especially, but indeed sometimes too, um, to um, become uh, professors of, uh, of the, the new academy. And then, of course, um, I would say many, many positive changes happened uh, related to Lenner painting and, uh, um, yes, uh, it, it is known uh, in, in Polish historiography um, as uh, the Krakow um, Landscape School um, provides, uh, let's say, with education uh, of Jan Stanisławski. So um, I think uh, it was quite modern, and um, I would like to emphasize the fact that almost uh, 130 uh, Ukrainian students were there until um, 1931. Oh, wow. So it was, I would say, a, you know, a, a beautiful amount of uh, graduates uh, and, and so many interrelations between um, two cultures in, yeah, in their neighborhood and in their overlapping, in their intermeshing. Mm -hmm. And uh, but on the other hand, so I would like to, and, and, uh, with um, my personal uh, reflection, that alas, the avant-garde did not come into um, uh, you know the, the ways or um, meanders of Ukrainian culture from Krakow. It was it was um, I would say um, quite um, closed or quite directed towards Art Nouveau. Secession and and, uh, and the arts around 1900. So if we compare um, the the uh, artworks, especially um, to, uh, in terms of their um, dates, uh, it's it's the very difference because uh, we um, cannot find anything what would be uh, of uh, you know the very avant-garde character uh, in Krakow, in, Krakow uh, in the first uh, decade of, of the 20th century. So it is really interesting to me how, you know, how, uh, it, uh, uh, how it occurs and, and uh, that we've got so many layers uh, uh, and so many directions um, that um, were, um, uh, I don't know how to say, combined or that uh, um, existed in the same time, um, just throughout the whole Europe. Thank you. Um, whilst we audience think of questions, would you like to ask each other? Um, <laughs> <laughs> just to give you, there will be plenty. If you do, you can use the privileges now. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I would like to um, underline another fact that uh, you know it's it's really amazing and it's it's riveting that um, I'm a Pole certainly and I'm really you know uh, um, <coughs> interested in our historiography and uh, in London it is for the it's been for the first time uh, when I uh, you know can uh, get to know some facts related to to um, the, the art uh, of, of, of the turn of centuries. So uh, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's really amazing. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's great. Konstantin, <laughs> uh, uh, first question. Do I need uh, a microphone? Yes, yes, you do. Stay, stay, stay. It's for the recording. And then I can see... Uh, I give a question to Dr. Borodzinski, and uh, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. But I am interested in dynamics because let's say let's go a little bit back, 1880s, when in this romantic and late romantic Polish art, Ukrainians are present uh, constantly. Josef Brandt, Cossacks here, Cossacks there, Cossacks <laughs> that way, <laughs> that way yes. which are becoming like kind of Polish Orientalist version of uh, Arabs <laughs> in the desert. Yeah. So what is the direction or dimension of these relations 
uh, between Mlada Polska and Mlada Ukraina? Is it relation of the older brother who is trying to civilize um, <laughs> uh, this population of the elite? Uh, uh, I'm just interested in yeah. what is the feeling, what is the motivation? Yeah. Uh, it's a wonderful but complicated question, of course. Uh, I'm not a historian, fortunately, yeah. so uh, that's why I, you know, I'm absolutely concentrated on um, all the phenomena related to uh, literature and fine arts. Uh, and of course, there are some uh, uh, tensions or even frictions between these two spheres. Uh -huh. But uh, it, uh, you, you said, Brandt, you know, uh, showing. Um, uh, Cossacks, yes, and, and battles, of course, and uh, coming back to you know the very history uh, of, of ours. Uh, it, it was not my example uh, within the presentation. <laughs> yeah, you're good, you're good, you're good. <laughs> yeah, of course. And and uh, yeah, I, I was thinking uh, about it uh, a lot uh, because of uh, you know because of uh, so many uh, once again layers of the same reality. So uh, even um, you know, in the end of the uh, 19th century, even uh, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, it was almost the same. But uh, I wanted, you know, within my presentation, I wanted to show a positive narrative based on, based on the facts too. So there are many facts, there are many points of view, and uh, um, of course, um, I think that uh, you know the uh, circles of uh, young Poland and Mora Musa, mm -hmm. um, respectively, uh, young uh, Ukraine. Um, it, it was uh, it was, let's say, like like the underground even, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for for the whole. Mm -hmm. um, and then there were many critical voices related to the publishing projects um, of Orkan and uh, his. Uh, bro you know, brothers Bro uh, from U Ukraine, uh, of course. Um, so um, uh, it, yeah, it, it um, appeared even you know uh, at the turn of the centuries and even uh, later on in the interwar period. Uh, however, um, you know, the, the fact remains that um, that uh, there are, uh, there were beautiful examples for cooperation. And um, I don't like this, this you know, methodology related to uh, post-colonial theories. Mm -hmm. I am not sure about that <laughs> because uh, because I think that it was not you know a, a one-way inspiration, and uh, I you know, I found many reflections um, on you know two directional uh, in, how to say that in in. in Inspirational, you know, inspirational um, atmosphere in in some articles. So, so there are, uh, there are you know more authors, there are more art historians, literary historians, who um, who want to show in that uh, in that uh, you know it, it happened it happened. I would say um, uh, in, you know in one way and um, in another. So, so I think it's it's really good, and that's why you know it is uh, the manifesto uh, taken from uh, Ivan Franko's poem, uh -huh. "Oh, if you fraternize, be honest, uh, so that the, the pact is promised." <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You. Um, let's take several questions uh, straight away. Um, the first one, Blant, uh, you, and then uh, second, and then uh, the back. So, Vlad, if you go ahead. Uh, hi. Uh, you can ask a vulgar political question uh, because uh, I'm interested. I'm really interested. I work on Chapitsky a lot uh, because Chapitsky is beloved by everybody. Where unambiguously sweet, nice, heroic figure in in into war Eastern Europe. Poles love him. Jews love him. Ukrainians love him. It's great, and it's uh, it's very well known. And uh, I think it fits into all three of your uh, presentations that he sets up institutions. As you already said, for Ukrainian and Polish art students, and he's a great collector, and he, he uh, buys up, uh, buys up art, and he creates them a national uh, museum in Lviv, and he uh, has all these uh, artists students that he finances. Uh, but 
politically, the, the several dozen or even a couple hundred artists that he was financing out of his, uh, out of his own pocket, politically, where, where did they go as young Polish and young, young Ukrainian artists? Thank you. And there was another question at the back. We'll take two questions and uh, then we'll see. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there's a really interesting exhibition of young Poland in one of the Soviet Union going on. And it was a remarkable show that he's making textiles of fitting up stained glass. I wonder if you can talk a bit about the relationship between stained glass and art. Okay. It was an exhibition in um, of Moda Polska at Walthamstow in Walthamstow, and um, the question was specifically to talk about the stained glass. There, I don't know if you, Oksana, if you saw that exhibition or not. I haven't seen that exhibition, but I've seen another exhibition. Do we want to take yeah, we'll do one more. Mm -hmm. We'll do one Sorry. more question. Sorry. Any, Sorry. any Sorry. more? Do, uh, Maybe there are no more questions. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> or, Okay. Who wants to? Uh, uh, Oksana, you are beginning to um, answer this. Uh, I can. Um, I can start with uh, Metropolitan Andrei Shevchitsky. So, as uh, you seen from my presentation, he he supported uh, Modest Sasenka, uh, Yulian Botsmanyuk, uh, um, Damian Arnetkevich, uh, and many others, but uh, I'm talking about those artists who were involved in stained glass and uh, decorative uh, um, de uh, monument monumental art or architectural, uh, architectural art. And uh, I think uh, thanks to those artists, we, we received a holistic decorative spaces, especially in Halicina, where artists, so thanks to, he, uh, thanks to the education at top European uh, art schools, art academies, they were able to, um, to implement their thinking, their um, ideas into particular architectural spaces. And uh, quite often, so it, it's not easy to install stained glass window. And it was uh, important to have uh, metropolitan support also to, uh, to move ahead this medium of art. And as with um, um, Modest Sosenka, he, uh, he envisaged that space. He, he worked on all details by himself. He wanted to express, uh, to, to create a Gesamtkunstwerk, yes, a space, uh, a holistic space, a universal space. And I think, uh, so in this context, so there was, uh, uh, the, 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 there was a chance for artists to work on Ukrainian land and to, to, to absorb, yes, to absorb the tradition and to, to create something new. Uh, I think it is good to add uh, that our great professor, Mr. Mudrak, wrote an article about that. I remember it, Andrzej Szeptycki and uh, many artists, I think more than 150 artists uh, supported by him uh, during the interview period. So I, I think um, you will find more information on that in this article, for instance. Thank you. <laughs> I would like to add there is uh, a good monograph by Dr. Irina Bach. It's called um, uh, Epocha Metropolita, which covers um, his uh, uh, diverse activities and through the prism of art. Um, Miroslava, one, one second. We'll, um, so we'll take a question from Miroslava and from Katya. Yes, thank you for that. Uh, those interesting topics, um, and thank you for kind of reviving them 
um, at least in my mind. Uh, I'm happy to see that they are alive and there's more that we can do. Um, I wanted to ask about the stained glass and about Shapisky. Maybe I'll start there since we just stopped there. Um, Shapisky, because he was the head of the Catholic Church, the Union Church, um, and because he was Western oriented, we could, you know, his aristocratic background and everything. Um, so it would be a natural extension for him to support this rather new art style, stained glass, because it's not traditionally something that would come up from the Byzantine period, right? So my question is, did it go beyond Halichana? Did it go beyond Galicia? Um, do we have evidence of stained glass as it developed? I mean, is there any stained glass in the Polish uh, churches in central Ukraine? Um, is there any kind of developing interest in the medium in other parts of Ukraine? Thank you for the question. Uh, is, uh, it, is it related to... What, uh, uh, so I would like to uh, thank you for the question. I would like to specify: Are we talking about uh, the whole 20th century, or in particular um, the beginnings of the 20th century? Well, I'm thinking about: Is there an evolution? Evolution. Yes. Thank you. Yes, there, there is, and uh, modernism was uh, a pivotal period. It, it was a revival for Ukraine. Uh, medium of uh, stained glass, because if you look in a broader context from the, from the medieval Kievan rules, when there was a stained glass and it was brought from Western culture and numerous archaeological excavations um, which were made in the second part of the 50s and actually recently, just before the outbreak of the war. So we know that the stained glass was present. However, yes, through the hurricanes, historical hurricanes, they appeared, disappeared, appeared, disappeared. There were waves. And in modernism, we see how this um, med art medium came again to the territories of uh, Ukraine through various channels. But, uh, as, as I mentioned in my um, in my talk, from uh, mostly from Western, well renowned Western European studios, and then so it settled down, so it absorbed and uh, developed. And uh, <coughs> after the Second World War, we see how stained glass revived again, and it was uh, uh, one of the one of the brightest art medium for modernism uh, architecture in the Soviet time. And uh, uh, Dal de it's a slab glass, was flourishing on the territory of Ukraine. But this is another chapter of, <laughs> of research. And of course, um, uh, so it's, uh, I would like to say that Jew, Jew, Jewish uh, communities commissioned stained glass, and in Kharkiv, uh, there is a synagogue with, for which stained glass was uh, designed and installed, and across Ukraine. So the media has been present, presenting in the culture, however, it's, it, it has been remaining quite exclusive. Yes, thank you. It just reminded me of uh, stained glass, the most famous. Yeah. Yes, it, it is one of the mm -hmm. um, most uh, tragic, perhaps, uh, stories when the group of artists worked for almost a year and then the stained glass was smashed in one night. Yes. And after that, uh, another stained glass was designed and produced, which was, which conformed conformed the ideological um, system and Ukrainians, so the narrative was quite direct where Ukrainians were presented as a folk people, so in very simplified and narrative forms and they are still there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
and at the University of Shevchenko in the main. Thank you. This is the yeah, we'll go question Katya and then Olya. Thank you so much, all three of you, for absolutely fascinating presentations. I actually have a question for Jakob. When the Ukrainians were proposing that to the president's office that Archipenko does the portrait, have they actually discussed it with Archipenko? Like, were they in touch with him? Uh, even want to do that? I, I, I suppose they, they did. Because okay, but, I can't, can't imagine that they would uh, explain that he was he would uh, cast the best in bronze in his studio without uh, discussing it with him before. Yeah, it's just, I guess like, the, the reason why I'm asking that is like, what was the communication and relationship of the Ukrainian community and the committee with, with Akhitinko? Uh, I suppose there was some. Uh, mm -hmm. It could, could have been only in words, maybe, and uh, there could, uh, could be no existing evidence about okay. it. And I don't know whether Akhitinko's archive uh, has some materials. I could do some more research on that, but uh, I I doubt there's anything uh, in evidence exists. Okay. Um, there is a question just behind. Yes, um, I'm actually I'm interested in this conversation that's been lost. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> this, is, this is the first time I actually hear the presentation in Ukrainian standpoint. And uh, so you mentioned that uh, a couple of those projects, uh, first half of the 20th century, were commissioned uh, and executed in Germany. Uh, so why? Uh, you know, why people at Russian government choose a uh, German workshop? Is it because there, uh, there were no Ukrainian local workshops, or is it, is it because of the Ukrainian? Thank you for the What was the local? Was there a local workshop? Thank you for the question. The Roman Catholic Church has appoint, um, appointed my and company of Munich as a major executor of stained glass. So it was very important uh, connection, and this is how the majority of stained glass came into Catholic um, religious buildings, uh, Catholic churches. Uh, and uh, at the same time, other religious buildings, other religious institutions commissioned stained glass to Western European studios because locally there was a lack of knowledge because it's stained glass is a laborious art medium and it requires uh, particular knowledge and skills to, to produce, to manufacture. And uh, uh, gradually, gradually uh, stained glass, the next stage I would say it was Poland, Zelensky studio, which was uh, uh, important uh, production uh, hub for um, stained glass for Ukrainian uh, premises, and also Bilecki uh, in Warsaw, Krakow and yeah. Warsaw, two major Polish stained glass studios. However, in, uh, um, uh, in uh, Second half, just before the outbreak of the First World War, there were local studios in Lviv, so the knowledge uh, came and settled down and developed. And uh, there were Appel Studio, uh, Stengla Studio, there, were, there was um, Nijinsky Studio, and the first atelier for stained glass and decorative uh, paintings. So this is what in my mind, so the local studios were established and uh, started competing with um, Western European studios. But then the First World War, and again we had the wars. Um, we have the last five minutes, so um, let's anyone who has questions, please raise your hands. So we've got one, two, and Miraslava. So um, let's go to the back. Uh, there are two questions at the back, and then we'll take, we'll talk, we'll take all three questions and then do final remarks. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Very Can you speak up? Uh, sorry, it's quite hard to hear us. I've got a lot of the same answer to your question, sir. I'm interested to see your work with minors and artists yourself, acting in the same class. So I was curious. 
um, like how your research has influenced your own art making, or also the other direction, how you use what you learn in making to relate to what you're looking at in one's Thank you for the question. I also have a question about the same thing. We need to say glasses. I wonder if there were any existing tensions between artisanal and industrial production of the same class. I'm thinking specifically in the second half of the 20th century with for example, more state banning, um, which emphasized a more utilitarian rather than creative output. And I wondered what, how artists would have negotiated between um, quotas, essentially, and creativity. Thank and you. And um, Miroslava. Thank you. Uh, this is for Jakub, it's about Archipenko. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask the same thing that Katya asked. Was it uh, by Archipenko's um, request, or did the community want to help Archipenko that the commission might have, might have come about? But what I wanted to really emphasize is, um, well, I was intrigued by the commentary that Archipenko didn't, didn't use models and he didn't know how to make a realistic figure, right? Um, <laughs> But uh, I think what would be interesting to cap your, your research is to actually look at the realistic busts that Archipenko did finish. And um, there's one at the National Art Museum in, U in Ukraine of a conductor, a very expressive work, a bust. And then there is one of Ivan Franco in uh, New York. Uh, Maybe not New York, Cleveland, and I think also Shevchenko. These are realistic busts. Uh, so, you know, he did know how to do that. Right, thank you. Well, maybe it wasn't a question, rather a commentary. So, uh, thank you for, for this, uh, uh, the, the, this, this mentioning the uh, realistic portraits. Uh, well, it's also related to the, uh, well, you could develop this. Um, uh, the subject also in focusing on what were actually the portraits of President Masaryk uh, <laughs> and this uh, rather uh, conservative, um, which is kind of in contrast with, a, um, with the idea of a modern Czechoslovak state of 20s, uh, progressive uh, entity. Uh, but uh, yeah, well, of course, the employees of the ministry could not know at the time that, uh, that Archibanko also <laughs> made such portraits. And they are from what years? Were they later works? Maybe uh, I think they were. They were later. Mm. They were later. Um, I don't want to make Chanko mistake. ones in, in the late twenties, early thirties. Yeah. So he mm. made one um, during the Holodomor, so that it yes. could be sold mm. to raise funds to then yeah. um, send Ukraine. Yeah. So, so that's probably important because what uh, what the local environment knew about Archipenko was from the nineteen fourteen uh, exhibition. Uh, French modernism uh, in Manus, uh, and then from, from this monographic exhibition in 23. When thinking about whether he is uh, apt for, for creating a, a presidential project. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you for the question. I will start uh, with the second one. So if you are talking about the second part of the 20th century, so the uh, political scene changed, and uh, of course the infrastructure uh, for stained glass making and Daldever uh, production changed dramatically. So there were no private commissions; all commissions were state uh, commissioned by the state, and uh, there was um, a union of uh, Soviet architects, uh, Soviet artists, and they were divided also uh, the um, union of Ukrainian Soviet architects, etc. Every republic had uh, a union of artists. And uh, uh, state commissioned uh, stained glass for a particular architectural premises, and uh, there were factories 
Um, for instance, in Kiev, there was a famous uh, factory which produced uh, numerous stained glass and tardiware for, um, uh, for, um, for numerous buildings across Ukraine. So th that was uh, uh, a partnership, so a cooperation between the state, so the state financed uh, of, um, the commission, parties who designed and actually factories who produced uh, stained glass and tartar. So that was a new, uh, there was a new uh, system, working system. But this is completely another topic and both different uh, lecture and research. One other thank you. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> conference. Gladly. <laughs> And so the first question uh, regarding uh, stained glass and art, inevitably, of course, and uh, stained glass, Ukraine, but not only stained glass, the whole culture of Ukraine um, hugely influences my art. And when I um, graduated from Central St. Martin's in glass and architecture, I uh, um, of course, I questioned what is stained glass of Ukraine, and there was no publication. There was it was 2011, and uh, in um, since I've been living in London for 20 years, and uh, I'm I've been uh, uh, I'm a member of British Society of Master Glass Painters, and we have uh, conferences, talks, and my colleagues often asked. Uh, oh, are you from Ukraine originally? I am. Do you have stained glass? Yes, we do. <laughs> and that was such a frequent question that at some point I decided to embark on the journey and to do research. And uh, the first research was published in London at the Journal of Stained Glass by the British Society of Masterclass Painters. And uh, when the war began, and uh, so the full-scale invasion, second uh, round. Uh, I uh, published, I made another research on uh, stained glass at war, and this is also another topic, and uh, uh, this uh, research is available on uh, free on the website of the British Society of Master Glass Painters, and there is a list of damaged stained glass windows and Taldeware during the first year of war, of course, uh, the number has been increasing. Thank you so much. We'll have a, a final the, remark from Andy. No, Andy, but uh, the, a remark from Andy. Uh, remark. Uh, thank you very much for all the three really illuminating presentations. I wish to be back to Archibald of Shuplitsky <laughs> just to remind you that he's Polish origin. Yeah. He's from yes. noble Polish family. And the fact I learned just half a year ago in the place of Oleksa Novakinsky, he first invited Jacek Malczewski at the time when Novakinsky was living uh, in a village next to Krakow <coughs> with his wife. Just, just, just a reminder that how, how this construction is coming. <laughs> Shuplitsky, leading figure, of course, of the Ukrainian National Revival of the Absolutely. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. I think this was a great uh, uh, final comment on the entanglements that we also created today. And uh, I'd like to thank our speakers um, and uh, also remind you that it's a 20-minute break and there is coffee refreshments. But before Whatever. we go, thank you. I'm delighted um, both personally and on behalf of um, our students that we're able to uh, host uh, this uh, conference and very, very grateful to uh, Masha and Katya and everybody else uh, and all of our speakers. Um, our uh, penultimate panel today is entitled Modernisms in Ukraine, Continuities, Ruptures, Legacies and will be very ambitiously spanning a period of about 100 years 
I'm going to be interested to see how these three papers from the 20s, the 50s, and the present speak to one another. Um, and we're going to follow the same format as um, in the previous panel, where we'd ask you to save your questions for a round table um, at the end. Our first speaker is an artist and research fellow uh, from the Documenta Institute and the uh, University of Casa. I'm very pleased to welcome Lada Nakonech. Hello, I'm delighted to present to you. Thank you for invitation. Um, Okay, I would like to begin this two studies, which will serve, which will serve as a ground for discussing the pedagogical practices that we have introduced in the twenties. So, the new art of the first part of the twentieth century, the period I will focus on today, was conceived in terms of development, historically grounded and with a sense of anticipation for the future relationships and was meant as a fundamental recapture, uh, a turning point in the history of art. The continuous line of artistic tradition was broken, and the inter international and inevitable process of destruction within the art began. The next phase was meant to be constructive and built upon the scientific theory of art. The challenge was to synthesize the liberated elements with a new ideology of recombining them. I cite, I just cited the proclamation of the future, futurist artistic and literature group called Art Futurism, arguing that their ideas reflect the mood and creative processes in art manifested at the Kyrie in the 20s. I would like to focus on two key figures at the Institute, Alexander Bakhmazov and Mikhail Botchuk. Bakhmazov, who was a teaching member of the faculty from 22, um, okay, maybe I go here. Uh, teaching member uh, faculty um, in, uh, from 22 referred to the force breaking and contemporary artistic forms in a dynamic tendency and also saw these processes as historically in inevitable. Mianwell Boychuk, a professor in Kyiv since 17, discussed the needs for a new synthesis, agreeing that official academic art having the following into the extreme decline had to be overcome. Ukrainian artists alongside their international peers were equally engaged in developing their artistic thinking and approaches and the widespread prioritization and involvement of the artists in the educational sphere served a two key needs, fostering experimentation crucial for the new synthesis and simultaneously institutionalizing those findings. A tendency emerged among various agents and educational institutions across Europe to investigate the fundamental means of artistic expression, such as color, line, space, the basic and the universal elements common to all creative activity, uh, the visual language of art, though it's uh, through specific uh, science and conf configurations, is capable to transferring the senses and reflecting and forming the new sensibilities as a ground for future social relations. So considering the perspectivism, my approach is follows. Um, first, to reconstruct the ideas of modernist pedagogy within the specific historical context of 20s at the Kiev Art Institute. And second, to con contextualize these ideas through our contemporary knowledge of our developments. So rather than limiting the ideas of modernist pedagogy to their past influence on the modernism in Ukraine, I will cover the potential key hope, uh, hope uh, for the future and the programs that remain relevant to this day. Uh, I'm focusing on these two pedagogical approaches as they developed the most complex uh, theories, Bojok and Bogomazov. Uh, Bojok began developing his theoretical approach through practices uh, by gathering a group of colleagues around his ideas in Paris, uh, uh, where his uh, inclination toward monumentalism emerged. He then continued his work uh, on his own monumental art studio in Kyiv from 70 as one of the first professors of the institute. Bogomazov had the opportunity to put his programs into the practice following uh, his 22 appointment as a professor. Prior to that, in uh, 1914, he combined his thoughts on art 
uh, in the unpublished manuscript Painting and Elements, it became the foundation for his proposals to reform the art school. Initially, Bob Mazur declared the need to reorganize art school during his speech delivered at the Congress of Workers of Ukrainian Art in uh, 18, uh, 1918, he emphasized that uh, schools must create favorable conditions for critical artistic knowledge and joy in the learning process. According to him, the primary task of an art school is to foster students' critical understanding of pictorial elements, such as shape, line, color, and the picture plane, emphasizing the synthetic nature of art. Bogomazov pointed out that uh, while these main elements are constructive to art, they were not reflected in traditional schools, still tied to the strict practices of academism. He offers a scientific fight against the spirit of academism by integrating all other directions into the school and studying the basic elements as the essence and objective foundation of any art. Bogomazo was yet not affiliated with the Institute this time, so um, while he wasn't limited in expressing his views, he was in power, and the Soviet already, he did not, I, I mean, uh, he was responsible for the education you know, uh, reforms. He did not have uh, the authority to influence uh, the uh, Kiev Art Academy yet. Uh, however, the protests since the foundation of the Institute allied with the anti-academic ideas that led to a parallel presence of different art directions presented by professors. The establishment of the Institute unfolded in several uh, stages as a political project of an emerging state. As a successor of the Academy of Art, Kiev Art Institute experienced a period of flourishing beginning in uh, 1924, benefiting from the temporary stability granted by the Soviet rule, which ultimately uh, asserted control over Ukraine. Institute became a platform for realizing Bogomazov's idea on the parallel study of all contemporary directions, as well as Boychuk's concept of monumental painting studio based on the collaborative uh, I will discuss the projects of both pedagogues concerning several uh, aspects within the context provided by the Institute. So, uh, first, um, we will expose the, the means of art, discussing the main elements, materials, and understanding of composition in these pedagogies. Uh, the objectivity of formal principles and the study of the basic elements related to plane, volume, and space laid the foundation for the innovative for tech, formal and technical faculty introduced at K latest 25. This was the basic course for all disciplines which were seen as not hierarchical and closely interrelated. Painting remaining the most widespread medium, punching as a laboratory material for Bogomazov, uh, painting, uh, for Bogomazov painting related to the problems of color and drawing, while sculpture focused on volume and space. Bogomazov uh, stated that the value of formal and technical disciplines lies not in studying painting for its own sake, but in, in analyzing the objective aspects of object organization using, for example, of painting materials. He believed that uh, deriving properties solely from the material itself is an organized example for students on how to work with any material. Furthermore, the thinking should be kept within the limits of the restricted material, as it would offer a greater objectivity in their consciousness. Both pedagogues um, relied on the rational attitude, prioritizing an analytical approach. The analytical decomposition of examples was aimed to bring the elements to the synthetic unity achievable in our time. To study the realm of compositional methods, Boychuk introduced the practice of copying from photographs and reproductions. Students were encouraged to engage in individual drawing analysis, sketch analysis, mm -hmm. uh, the Rysovka analysis, preferably in a larger format, or to work collectively by alternating at the large blackboard with chalk. The production of copies was not the main goal, and uh, exact similarity was not required. The educational task was to learn compositional regularities through sketching. The analysis proceeded as follows. The main lines were drawn to schematically indicate the geometric structure according to which the composition is built. Then the marked planes were filled in in order to study the interpretation of details with attention to their interrelation to the, uh, to the whole. 
That this task was uh, to trace construction uh, of the given artwork using sketch analysis and discovering the laws of its compositional connections. Students analyzed schematic, stylistic, and technological aspects. This comprehensive approach to understanding composition, while attem attempting to avoid repetition, ultimately led to groundwork for it. In Bohomazov's program, the study of any stylistic examples was organized in a way to prevent imitation. Mm -hmm. The assignments meant to the, uh, discover the principles inherent in the studied direction by applying them according to the given task. Each direction uh, corresponded to different tasks. For instance, when studying Impressionism, students had to create still lives that questioned the ability of impression to generate form. When studying Cubism, they focused on the subjugation of color to the formal requirements of volume and texture. In Bogomazov's approach, analytical decomposition of the image itself aimed to extract compositional principles related to the dynamic expressiveness. His study of composition went through the detection of relationship between elements, which uh, reveals the dynamic psychology of the work. He was interested in the influence of these dynamics on perception. His task was to stay within the framework of synthetic thinking while studying composition. Synthesity consists in the combination of color, volume, space, composition, and texture, as well as sources and conditions in which these elements acquire different dynamic expression, thereby considering the environment in which the form develops. Therefore, uh, he divided the study into the analytical and the analytical synthetical parts. The latter supports an idea of the development of the perception of the object's separate elements, their meaning, and their significance within the synthesis, and to keep the student's consciousness uh, at the level of the general cultural development of artistic forms. With this understanding of the historical development of the approaches, styles, and directions, we arrived at the question of the freedom of their choice. Bochuk introduced a wide range of stylistic examples in his assignments tied to his preferences represented by the photographic collection gathered during his travels across Europe, and based on the idea of, of the perfect work in the artistic heritage of all centuries and peoples, uh, at the proper cultural as the proper cultural material for learning. For him, chronological date and origin were not important, where it was, whether it was Egypt, Assyria, or Renaissance. He states that artist becomes the creator of a great future by merging with the timeless world of art thanks to practical engagement and the study of the creativity of artistic cultures. In his art of the past, he saw the living value of creativity, asserting that an artist will find a way only by relying on the great achievements of the past cultures, rich in diverse materials. During their study, students acquire a body of knowledge that introduces them to the realm of the perfect high art and connects them with broad traditions. According to Boychuk, um, a synthetic form arises from the observations of entire generations and are transmitted through traditions from ancestors to descendants. The achievements of the local uh, cultural realizations are preferred for the new Ukrainian culture. Art seeks its ground in the nation where it develops, and only at the next stage it becomes international, evolving into the into part of the world's cultural heritage. Therefore, Bochuk students learn sources to encompass the ideal formal solutions found in exemplary works of the great art. At the same time, uh, Bogomazov students focused on differentiation of principles and uh, properties of each art moment, allowing them to explore different manifestations of artistic elements. In the study programs of Bahamazov, various directions such as Impressionism, Neo-Impressionism, Cubism, Primitivism, Futurism, Suprematism, and Naturalism were addressed as a case studies for exploring artistic materials and were reasoned from the perspective of the evolution of forms. He considered each direction as merely a representation of an individual form within the general development of art. Any direction could not serve as a basis for education. 
as this would lead to the mechanical replication of its norms. Regarding the discussions about the possible basis for the new art collaboration, Bogomazov challenged Boychuk's appeal to primitivism and pointed to naturalism, which he believed, uh, it was already late 20s, uh, offers uh, artists a great variety of tools. Bogomazov shifted toward naturalism, especially after his ultimate critics of academism, uh, stemmed from his belief in dynamic tendencies. His assignments emphasize the practical study of evolutionary art forms or directions, analyzing the logical development of the uh, forms of an artistic object and their succession to the next stage. So the application of naturalism is happening on the next level of the sensibility development that recognizes the complexity of dynamic relationships. The degree of awareness of these relationships is cru cru crucial. So let's look at these formal approaches in relation to the social sphere. How did the new synthesis uh, envisioned by Bochuk and Bogomazov manifested within society, and how was the social aspect integrated into their artwork? First, we should clarify how these pedagogical methods position themselves within the broader framework of reconst uh, reconstituting the field of art based on the arts call to social engagement and collectivist approach uh, that dominated in the 20s. The Institute's uh, reformation corresponded to the intentions of establishing a new educational approach uh, that would meet practical needs of industrial production and the organization of new life. With most of the students entering the Institute without proper preparation, the Fortech meant to provide a basic knowledge of artistic means. However, it would be wrong to reduce pedagogical approaches and try to simply training qualified workers for material and ideological production, as they uh, accommodated proposals intended uh, for the new mutual relationship between art and society. According to Bogomazov, Fortech provided students with theoretical skills a phrase that illustrates his understanding of theory as distinct from strictly intellectual knowledge. <coughs> the idea of the labor school was fundamental to Bogomazov's philosophy, as he believed in empirical knowledge, where ideas and concepts develop through observation. His tasks for the future museum workers, he taught, uh, were based on the practical examination of material, aiming and uh, enhancing sensibility and activating perception. Bogomazov underlined the importance of inquisitive eye, which requires an internal correspondence between what is seen and the emotional response. Similarly, Boychuk strived to engage students in all stages of art production, including preparatory work, such as mixing pigments. Uh, he viewed, viewed craft as a particular skill of knowledge, believing that an artist must be educated through hands-on work. His sketch analysis methodology emerged from this same idea. Contrary to theoretical or speculative uh, perception, he advocated for learning through direct involvement. According to Boychuk, the artist experiences the composition physically, meaning that bod uh, bodily knowledge is connected to an understanding of the essential aspects of composition. Um, art was not seen as a privileged individual practice, but rather as a social practice. Mm -hmm. As Boychuk preferred a collective approach in this strive to develop the monumental synthetic art of the revolutionary era. He encouraged both <laughs> and self-willed use of samples. Uh, this is where freedom is manifested, rather than limitation, and believed that through the process of collective work, the individual would emerge naturally. Obviously, the new era uh, guarantees the appearance of the new forms dependent on the new economic conditions uh, determined by the monopoly of state order and imposed ideology. The visual language uh, he elaborated was aimed at certain people of the working class as well as students. <coughs> Monumental forms placed in the public space or objects of common use designed by his followers were supposed to create a common cultural environment through material culture and science available for reading by the public. In this aesthetic of lines, shapes, and colors extracted from essentially naive, primitive, and Christian local cultures, various themes could, be, could have been framed, representing the universal <coughs> problems of the peoples 
and nations inhabiting the lands of Ukraine. For example, his student Manuel Shetman created a composition on the Jewish pogrom, depicting the suffering of people, while other of art folks represented the prosperity that the land can provide to its inhabitants. Therefore, in Bochuk's case, the share, uh, shared centrality was based on the trustworthy visual language appropriate to the local culture, built on its inherent visuality and common human subjects. The joint uh, execution and ritualistic repetition of composition made them familiar and graspable. Bogomazov's complex thinking of the history of art development as the history of the development of sensations understands the audience not as consumers to whom art is addressed, but rather as co-authors and co-creators. In his own words, different creative impulses arise from diverse external forces in the surrounding environment, resulting in specific material in, in implementations that define the appearance of artwork in a certain <laughs> historic period. The modern time demands artwork that in both content and form depend on the active um, forces shared by artists and their audience, given that the perception of the visual object's formal element is constantly reshaped by dynamic tendencies. Bogomaza viewed exhibitions as uh, spaces for mutual understand, uh, aesthetic understanding and sought to clarify the objective perceptual conditions. While discussing the ideological content of an artwork, he stressed its interconnection with form. The formal content actively contributes to the formation of meaning. Bogomaza re uh, relied on the principle of interrelation between art and society as well as between form and context, context content, which led him to an approach that is not entirely representative. Bogomazov includes the viewer as an element in his theory, studying audience perception as that of his own. He states, every artist has their own audience, shaped by the demands of the viewer within, and adds, by educating the viewer within themselves, the artist simultaneously educates the public within. This formula prevents fusion of views in a complete mutual understanding, as he maintains the artist's autonomy as a producer and emphasizes the dynamism of elements is as essential. The aesthetic moment occurs when our consciousness reveals the mutual interest of objects, and the emerging relationship becomes more, more apparent. He believed in evolutionary complexity of our consciousness and its ability to, to differentiate. So both uh, pedagogues uh, intended creating a new synthesis uh, adequate to the time. Judging, uh, judging from their visions of art and society, it became clear that their attitudes paved the way for artists of different kinds. Each proposal was based on their approaches to the audience. In Bogomazov's pedagogy, the viewer, while in agreement with the whole of the artwork, is an active element capable of changing the state of affairs. On the contrary, in Bochuk's pedagogy, the viewer tends to be claimed down, come down in the stable, timeless agreement. This represents two different aesthetic paradigms. From nowadays theoretical perspective, the transformation brought about uh, by the avant-garde shifted the theoretical sequence of progression of styles toward a simultaneously of the radical differences. Yet these differences should not be considered strictly in terms of visual appearances, such as abstract realist or approaches, individualist, uh, or collectivist. Instead, uh, as my investigation reveals, this distinction lies in the combination of artistic elements, their allocation toward each other, and their placement within the social field. It is clear that the modern, um, rather avant-garde shift, is not rooted in the uh, denial of the naturalist liberation. It represents a liberation of all art forms and approaches. In Bogomazov's work, the new understanding builds upon the ruins of the old. Released from normative constraints, elements become accessible to us, the people of the future, who are capable of distinguishing much more complex compositions. 
The theoretical insights of Bogomazov and Mnuchuk provide key tools for rethinking the avant-garde legacy and applying this concept to contemporary art inquiries. Ironically, Boychuk, who was eliminated to make room for socialist realism, provided ideas that aligned with the very principles underlying it. Uh, where, uh, where universal problems uh, were represented to passive perception through a fixed artistic language. The source chosen by Bolsheviks was merely different, revealing the need to establish common ground within the tradition of the Russian realist art. Furthermore, my analysis suggests that socialist realism pedagogy should not uh, be viewed simply as a return to academism. I would like to believe that my findings and conclusions will both contribute to the further development of scientific research and inspire thoughtful discussion. Thank you so much, Lada, and I'm very excited to um, and I look forward to asking you more about the, uh, the amazing diagrams that you just showed. Um, and I think that your paper is going to um, speak very, very interestingly to our uh, next um, uh, paper. Um, and um, and, uh, and we'll kind of find interesting common ground between these principles and, uh, and socialist realism. Because our next speaker is um, in the process of finishing her thesis on socialist realism at the Central European University um, uh, of, of Buda, between Budapest and, and Vienna. And, um, and this is going to be uh, Polina Baitsi. Hi. Hello. Thank you. So I recently have heard uh, some complaints that it's been exhausted and it's really hard to listen. Um, so I just want you to take um, some time. It will be the time taken at my expense to shake your body, to <laughs> yawn, uh, to do everything that you want to do, to stand up, to go to pee, please. Let's disarm this disciplinary regime that is instilled by conferences. <laughs> I mean, would you like some water? Yes, yes, I would like some water. Oh, no. Since we're all standing up and we're conversing with all That's a fantastic pause. <laughs> So I already scared Dr. Blaker that I have 70 slides. <laughs> um, I will talk about two artists, um, Ada Rybachuk and Volodymyr Malyshenko. They're quite known in Ukraine. Um, now you will know something about them. And um, I will talk only about their early work that they did in their use. Use, right? What is the British pronunciation? <laughs> yes, yeah, so this is a preferred uh, transliteration of Volodymyr's name, which is yours for a specialist in Ukrainian art. Um, yeah, and this is their portraits around the X time that I'm talking about. So let me also get you briefly acquainted with the structure of my talk, and it's um, straightforward, uh, but it's also circular or circumpolar. Um, that's an Arctic pond that is understandable only for me, I guess. <laughs> um, so first I will talk about a bit about the duo R RVM. This is how we know <coughs> Ukraine after the initials at the Rybachukan or the Romanichenko. Then I will make something that is that I call interlude, like camouflage. <laughs> That doesn't make sense to you now, but it will make in a certain time. This is about Russian colonization of the Arctic. Then I will talk about something that John McCann uh, titles the myth of the Arctic in the Soviet culture. And then I will come back to the RDM artworks. And then I will make some um, make some of myself explicit because it's a project that I'm working for seven years now, and it's a side project. So 
if I tell something to you that doesn't make sense, uh, please tell me. I will be very grateful to think about it together, as uh, you can notice that I'm a very slow thinker. Yeah, and this is the, the colors of the book that I used uh, for the contextual part. You can consult them for more details. You can take photos now. I'm going to change the slide. <laughs> Okay, so Ada and Voldemort both of them were born in Kiev, and they both died there, unfortunately. Voldemort died in 2023. They were both studying at the same, and this was the only middle school artistic education facility, and I believe our previous speaker is also from that school. Right, Slava? No, you were not in the Okay, that was a failure. <laughs> um, Yes, and um, what is important from here is that uh, Volodymyr, as a child, he stayed in the occupied Kiev, uh, and he was transferred to the local orphanage. And this is the photo of that time uh, that we found in the foundation. Um, and presumably, Volodymyr is behind the girl the, in the center that has a very impressive hair made to. Yes, yeah, so they were studying together at the one um, art school, but they were not acquainted. And they formed a duo when they um, started to study the Kiev Art Institute, which was definitely the subject of the previous presentation. And uh, upon the suggestion of one of the artists, Ukrainian artist Tatyana Yablonska, uh, to go to artist student practice somewhere to a usual place. I guess many artists are going to the practice. Um, Ada decided to go to what is called Soviet Arctic, somewhere unusual to the Barents Sea, and she invited Volodymyr to accompany her. And uh, yeah, they ventured on their first trip in 1954. Um, they spent May and June on the White Sea. July to September on the Kogul Island. This is the Nenets Autonomous District in Russia currently. And here you see the days of <coughs> all of their first North trips. Mm. Um, but I will also wants to, uh, wants to talk about months. So this July till September, it's called the navigational season. It's one of the most important temporal categories for the Arctic. And basically, this is the month when the risk of your ship stacking in the ice is lower than usual. Now, as the Arctic melting four, <coughs> times, four times faster than uh, other areas in the world, um, the navigational season is expanding for Russia's profit. And IBM also did what is called wintering in the Arctic. They stayed through the Arctic winter during their trip in 1957-1959. Um, and this was the year when they made their graduation artworks from the Kiev Art <coughs> Institute. Uh, and they give it as a gift, so they made their diplomas, and they give it as a gift to the local people, uh, the Nenets people, along with 116 other pieces. And they established, in, through this deed of gift, they es established allegedly the first museum in the Soviet Arctic. And there will be a slide that will help your geographical imagination. This is where Nyanmar is. This is my Google Maps, so you see what I like in this part of the world. And, um, and this is one of the archival photos of the exposition of this museum that was established in 1959. So this is the basic information of, uh, about this artist. And now, as we learned a bit, about them, I would like to unwrap the question how this itinerary from Kiev to Mariana became even possible in the 50s. But before that, the brief intro. Um, so the systemic occupation of the Arctic areas is a 20th century phenomenon. And now in the 21st century, the confiscation of the Arctic lands is fierce and vehement. <laughs> There are more knowledge about its ne rich natural resources, its geography, climate, ice, and it's significantly more infrastructure developed. The Soviet industry, built largely by the Gulag labor, was a recipient of local timber, or opposite 
concentrate non-ferrous and precious metals, nickel, copper, cobalt. There is a city that is called Nickel, um, dedicated because of the mine, Nickel Mine, that was built by the convicts here, there. Of course, not talking about gas and oil. There is an estimate that circa 30% of the world oil and gas reserves, um, and most of them undiscovered, lie in the areas of Arctic, and this impedes a peaceful sleep, sleep of governments and fossil fuel magnets. Now there is an, the Arctic Council that includes eight countries, all who possess the landmass in the Arctic. It's the United States, Canada, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, and Iceland. Mm, and as you know, after the invasion of, you know, the invasion, which invasion I'm talking about, with Finland and Sweden, Finland and Sweden joined NATO. And this September, Russian state media broadcasted uh, the statement of uh, Russian foreign minister Sergei Lavrov that they are fully ready for the war in the Arctic and it shouldn't become the NATO territory. And I highly recommend this article. This is a very recent article, fresh article of Ben Taub about Russian intelligent activities um, in the Arctic. So, and this is also one of the recommendations. Um, it's a film of Ukrainian fil filmmaker, recent one where Russia ends, which also knows on the subjects of the people of North and some of the um, kind of metaphors of the Arctic language, language of the Arctic assimilation. Okay, I finished my interlude. Um, so, now Russia spans 11 time zones, Russian Arctic, covering one quarter of the total Arctic areas, and Arctic accounts for 90% of Russian recoverable hydrocarbon reserves, including the 70% of these reserves located in the Barents and in the White Sea. And it's defined as a key military outpost and a principal source of natural and mineral wealth. And this understanding was actually developed in the 30s. Um, the main institution that was responsible for the development of this definition of Arctic, which was also one of the biggest, which also represented one of the biggest economic incentives for Russia and a kind of a long dream cherished in Russia, in Russian Empire as well, is the development of the Northern, Northern Sea Road that you see now. And this is the shortest road connecting Russia and the Far East. And because of the war wind, it's going to be used by Russia much more. And it's used now. Um, so the main institution that was in charge of it was named the Administration of Northern Sea Road. Um, oh my god, this is a horrible typo. Okay. No, it's not a good no? Okay, so. Um, it's called Galaxian Mokhut in uh, Russian and um, also was called the Commissariat of Ice. This is a gigantic techno bureaucracy comparable to Gidro project that also was founded on the Gulag labor means Red Marsh. This was development of the nuclear and hydrogen equipment enterprise and today's Gazprom. Uh, it was established in 1932 under the guidance of Otto Schmidt. He was a graduate of mass, uh, of mass faculty at the Kiev, Art, uh, Kiev University, just university. And under the Soviet times, he pursued a career of polymers. And in the 30s, he was a kind of not, a, not only a rare case of the Arctic explorer who was not purged, but a sort of bash style hero. Uh, and also paternal figure for all polar explorers, uh, superseded only by Stalin, of course. He was nicknamed Ice Commissar, and he was responsible for organizing the number of epic campaigns, the first uh, vessel, the first kind of campaign of crossing the Northern Sea Road in a singular navigational season. It was a vessel called Sibirikov. Then for about Shiluskin epic, I don't know if you know about it, it was a uh, uh, it was a ship that crashed and they survived in the in the um, 
in the Arctic, uh, together with Schmid, and they organize a camp Schmid, and now one of the caves in Arctic is named after him. It's a very long story, so for anyone interested, we can talk talk about it informally, but also about, but also one of the most important kind of elements of this myth was um, in 1937, the year when the Soviet aviators were, bre uh, were breaking the world long distance aviation records, he kind of was a ma mastermind um, behind the first aircraft landing in the North Pole and the first organization of the drifting ice station, which is called 70.1, and now Russia have, uh, like there's a variation SP, I think like 35 or something, because so this is a continuous tradition. Um, some of the elements that are also known of the Arctic is Maybe there's no realization of how big the scale is of it. It's um, so basically everything that was happening in the Arctic, the whole modernization, also the building of canals, railroads, um, hydroelectrical station, nuclear station was done by the convict labor. I think the most famous uh, project is White uh, Sea Baltic Canal. It's the only canal that was built. Uh, to connect uh, Baltic ports with, um, with the White Sea, to give uh, the, U the Soviet Union access to the warm water, the only one, uh, the second one, because the only one was Black Sea. Yeah, so we will not, I will not stop about this, uh, on this uh, in detail. And, um, and the third element sort of of the myth of Arctic was the perceived backwardness of the indigenous population, especially shamanism, which was um, yes, it was the opium of the people, of course. And um, in the 90s, there was a developed classification. There was like 26 groups of um, this small people of the Normans. And then its people were one of them. And they were, of course, the Shamanese culture. So in the order and its thirties, we know there's a collectivization campaign. There's also indigenization campaign. So in order to kind of um, attract the Nenets, they establish the city Myanmar, and it's from the Nenets language, it's a red city. What is also interesting that in the beginning, Russians developed a special alphabet for the Nenets people, because this is a literate people, they don't have, um, no, they don't have alphabets, and in first it was uh, in the la in first it was in the Latin, and in 37 they decided to turn it back to Cyrillic, and it's completely based on the Russian alphabet. And the first book of kind of this Nenes folklore was published in 33. So this is how we sort of end up at Narayanmar. And Narayanmar was a city that was established in 1913 uh, on the Pechora River. And this is some, already some artworks from RVM. Um, this is, of course, late 50s. But what is interesting, the first building, the first brick building in the city was built in 1960. It was a part of building and it was built, I assume, with a, a convict, with, by, the force, by the labor of convicts. And this is um, before that. Um, and they sort of captured the construction works near the um, traditional um, housing of the Nenets. And this is another kind of clue to understand in what sense, like how uh, the artists were able to go to Myanmar. Um, this is the document that endorsed their, um, their, their kind of trip for it there. And it's signed by the uh, vice president of this organization, Russell Mosput. So eventually they needed some institutional baking and they got it because Ada's father, Federer Gribachev, was a very high standard persona in the Ukrainian party. So they, that's how they get to the Narayanmar. There was a lot of elements that persisted in the 50s uh, from this uh, original sort of, from this Arctic myth that they were developed and one of them was I don't know if you know that, but I also personally experienced it, it in the 90s. The swaying circulation of uh, Jack London's translations. And they started in the 1930s, and they sort of were um, kind of, as Eleanor Gilbert puts it, um, 
uh, aligning with the romanticism of remote places, the adventures of harsher and terrains that became the central narrative of this song. And I'm not going to read the whole quotation, you just like tackle what you see there. I think what is interesting there is that at the moment when MoMA was promoting abstract expressionism <coughs> and um, uh, the Soviet Union decided to also engage in the relation, cultural exchange with the American artists and they chose Rocco Kant, who also was very well um, suited for this idea of the, for these ideas that are developed around the myth of the Soviet Arctic. And um, yeah, and they were in touch. So the first exhibition of Rocco Kant in Kiev happened in 1958, and they met each other. And then Rocco Kant was writing to them uh, while they were um, at the Kogoy Island or somewhere else. And this is just an image of, their, of his art just to understand what was. Um, what was kind of what he was working with. He was also kind of an big traveler and that's how they wanted. Yeah. And so now I will talk about art briefly. Uh, <laughs> I'm a historian of the Soviet Union, you can see I guess. Uh, so what is interesting about this art, and uh, they arrive um, they first uh, arrive um, in the Arctic they start to produce, especially Alice art, for example, what I'm interested in, they start to produce this sort of, uh, how to say it, this sort of artwork that are full of ethnographic gaze. And uh, you will see it in May, uh, like basically before 59. Um, it's uh, uh, attention to clothes, attention to faces, which is also kind of a legacy of uh, portraiture accent that comes um, from the Russian Imperial Academy in, in, in general, like academic hierarchies of the European art schools of the 19th, 19th century. Um, this is Volodymyr's works. This is archival works made by Gouache that I just, uh, and they, they are probably lost, and I just recently found them. They also kind of, they are definitely before 59. But even in this artwork, I think there's, this is interesting because, so they arrive in the city and they cannot really speak with Nina's people. So at that moment, some of the Nina's are actually speaking Russian, but they are paying attention to the traditional causes. And for example, this disc is a representation of San Hayar that they will use that after that a lot in the public spaces of Kiev. Yeah. And uh, yeah. this is also the disc. And then around 59, what happens after they establish the museum, they became ostracized in the Ukrainian um, Union of Artists, um, especially through the very, let's say, widespread um, media campaign. And uh, what is interesting, they were praised in Moscow, but are completely ostracized in, the, in Ukraine. And they started to move to sort of this kind of a bit different language. And it's also about time, I would say. And uh, this is already some, some later uh, series, this is the date of this series. And they completely move to the modernist sort of expression. expression. And they also, at the moment, they start to establish relationship with these people. For example, one of their portraits, this is Archie, they were friends with her for 50 years. And they start to have like more communication. You can see it through the printing records because Ada was um, journaling all her trips. They start to realize, um, they also start to kind of follow their lifestyle completely. So they don't do anything that is connected. Um, to modernization while they are, they are there, so they of course they use aviation and they ships when they travel to, to the Arctic. Um, yeah, this is more of this artworks from the early sixties. Um, and you can actually see more in the Ukrainian unofficial art archive. Um, of other ritual, which we just figured for to get a sense of this sixties. Um, and here I come back. I don't want to talk about ruptures 
I, for some reason, I don't like to talk about ruptures. Mm, so that's why I have a very present, like a presentious title. It's called Suspensions in Island Time. And um, I guess you may be familiar with the expression Island Time. Um, island Time is a sort of uh, derogatory way to denote a subject failing to conform to the imperative of urgency. And uh, it's usually used, um, someone is said to be on island time, uh, when they cannot organize their schedule according to externally installed obligations of, of servility. And it's an expression that is inducted with judgment and disapproval. And um, it's usually kind of conjure up the spaces of the Hawaii, Caribbean, the Pacific. And for me, it was interesting what um, if we use this expression, which is a linguistic marker of power relationships um, between the demand and visitor of this tropical paradises and the locals, and we use it in a sort of radical inversion way, and we can think about the, what is potential of island time, island time in Arctic for the Soviet people, um, and the peculiar temporary stance of the Arctic, and how it can affect and how it can produce affections between the Soviet and Ukrainian artists and local indigenous population. Yeah, that's all. That was not hard, right? <laughs> Showing those incredible images and uh, that really interesting and important history with us. Our next speaker is um, is joining us from uh, Mexico online. Um, so uh, I'm hoping that um, she's still with us. Um, uh, it's going to be Svetlana Vidarieva, uh, um, who um, uh, is uh, an independent art historian, artist, and uh, curator. Um, who has been extremely uh, active and impressive um, in recent years and has edited um, some really co edited some really important volumes? And I'm uh, pleased to um, have uh, had the opportunity to work with her um, alongside um, Professor Sarah Wilson, my colleague, um, uh, when she uh, wrote her PhD here uh, at the Courtauld. Hi, Silana. Welcome. Uh, I'm really pleased to participate in this event. Uh, thank you to Maria and Petra for organizing this, and to, to Clara for moderating this panel. And so uh, I was, uh, I wish I could be present uh, than in person, but uh, I managed to see part of the uh, live stream, and I was so in your uh, dear colleague from the audience. So hello, everyone. <laughs> and, uh, Cool. I'm going to talk uh, today uh, about uh, a topic that is uh, relatively new for me because, as uh, some of you might know, I work uh, in the last few years, I work predominantly about the Ukrainian for time art, uh, the art uh, that was produced after 2014. And uh, this presentation on tracing uh, legacies of uh, avant garde. Uh, in Ukrainian post-Soviet art is an attempt to uh, amplify the perspective and to develop uh, probably certain new uh, insights in, the, in, my, uh, in my research that I am regularly doing. Of course, uh, inevitably, this presentation will touch, touch upon the topic of, uh, of uh, work as it left in art. And uh, so in this way, I'm, I'm merging this to two of my interests. So now I will start the presentation. And I, after, after the presentation, I will uh, really look forward to your comments. So the topic of my paper is uh, Tracing Number of Legacies in Contemporary Ukrainian Painting on examples of works of Alexander Roitford, Peri Selvashi, and uh, Lateralko. <laughs> So, uh, Ukrainian painting from the 1990s to the present reflects the turbulences of the changing epoch and the dramatic shift in the post-Soviet period. 
A greater surface as complex as liberation identity and conduct of summer. The reference to the modernist impulse of novelty and the simultaneous deep historicism has resulted in several ambitious projects that nourish political commentary with historical reconsiderations. These projects often seem to explain narratives erased or suppressed during the Soviet period, while positioning Ukrainian art with the broader, uh, within the broader global discourse of decolonization and cultural justice. Uh, for the introduction, I have selected the work by Yuri Solomon uh, called Malevich, 20th century, which creates a context for further discussion of the profound impact the Ukrainian avant garde has had on contemporary Ukrainian art, just as it did on Soviet and post Soviet Ukrainian culture. Porcelain, uh, porcelain soldiers' boots with a massive heel are adorned with quotes from Kazimir Malevich's works uh, from 1915 1916. The gold of their souls imitates dirt. It represents the giving of Baroque frames and characteristic carved clothes, which the ruthless 20th century trampled into the mud. The artist himself proposes that the 20th century began with the black square and uh, with its weight towards the Ukrainian famine, Stalinist repressions, plundered everything that existed before, palaces, churches, and gold uh, embellished art. Uh, one could add that uh, the 21st century continued and intensify the destruction of both material and non-material heritage and cultural memory in Ukraine. This time, contested and appropriated cultural legacies are engaged by the neo-colonial war of Russia and Ukraine in an even more direct sense. The difficult relationship between the dramatic present and the unreachable, almost ephemeral complexity and splendor of the different parts, particularly in subjects as external to Ukraine as Western European art, uh, has received critical attention from the painter Alexander Royko. One of his most known paintings, Goodbye Caravaggio, was created in response to the disappearance of the painting uh, Judas Kiss or the Taking of Christ, attributed to Caravaggio's circle from the Odessa Museum of Western European and Eastern Art in uh, 2008. This work initiated the large uh, cycle uh, called uh, Royko vs. Caravaggio. Uh, in which the artist quoted classical works by the old master in reinterpreting and deconstructing them with the postmodernist fragmented aesthetics, rooted in the Ukrainian trans avant-garde movement within the so called Ukrainian debate. The upper measure deconstruction of elements of the past and Roybord's uh, large scale painting echoes the post colonial condition, marked by uncertainty and the need to reconsider history, as well to recombine the complex and scattered elements of public memory both internal and external to the Ukrainian culture, as some kind of uh, consideration of uh, the law. Into a coherent, uh, uh, to combine them into to a coherent picture. <coughs> in, in the early 2000s, this process was largely linked to Ukraine's traumatic past and the quality of a new present, filled with the uh, controversies, the flourishing of regionalist divisions, societal distortion, and the absence of a unified field for cultural action. The first to rectify the situation was made by Rosenblum himself, 10 years later. When he uh, applied to become the director of the Odessa Fine Art Museum in 2018, and which he successfully for the until his death in uh, 2021, contributed to a profound positive transformation of uh, cultural scenes in, uh, in the region. The opening of Rosenblum's work from the pro Russian political bloc in uh, local parliament claimed that he was unsuitable for the role. Uh, accusing him, among other things, of a hypothetical possibility of selling works from the collection and replacing them with copies. In response, the artist created his series replacement copies, where he removed pieces from the museum's collection, some of uh, European or Russian origin, uh, but mainly directly due to the contested legacy of Ukrainian born artists, who were open regarding the graph. As, uh, for example, uh, uh, he born uh, Dmitry Lidisky, or uh, the Russian one, uh, uh, Beyond the sharp political commentary, and the to address to the contemporary, uh, the genius uh, came to challenge the past and centuries long projections. Rothbard employs the academy of Malayish approach to supermatism for the interpretation of the work not accidentally but utilizing it as a critical tool for disentangling the epistemic value of the work uh, from the profound Russian cultural impact. Examples of these are the paintings, 
Uh, the border of Colonel Weinmannbach, based on the realistic work, and Putin on the shore of the Red Sea by Ivan Lewandowski. The figures in the painting appear as faceless together with the details they uh, together with the details they lose the individuality. Also maintaining similarity to the original. This is this depersonalization of the Russian culture of the modern continuation of fashionism. In contrast to the analytical use of uh, uh, the references in this work, an important reflection on the fragmentation of the Soviet past with both the violent and reconstituted as the Goldberg's painting raising the standard, or raising the thunder, which references social realism as the adversary of the avant garde. Roybert's detachment from the past is rendered through uh, his tribute to the uh, Aquarius painting by Soviet severe style artist Gilly Porter, a centerpiece of his cryptic communists. In both of painting, a communist activist leads the red standard from the ground after it has been dropped by the fallen comrade. Formative for the socialist ideology of uh, Khrushchev's era, the war became an iconic representation of the global struggle for socialism. In one particular interpretation, the painting depicts his self portrait raising the Ukrainian flag. His body is fragmented into parts, definitely recombined into a grotesque collage where the limbs are twisted and disjoint. The flag is handed to him by his own arm, which suddenly appears from the opposite side of the painting. This ironic self-realization of Roy Bort, who actually participated in the Euromaidan the same year he did this work was painted, alongside its representation of collective effort as an individual act, allows for a deeper understanding of the symbolic weight of a revolution that dismantles and reassembles the social and political body. This fragmentation draws a parallel between corporality and speciality, marking the shattered integrity. It the loss for breaking with the, uh, the hunting path and the oppressive ideology, replacing it with new, uh, just as a new struggle for emancipation. The repetition that brings us back to the solitary figure in uh, Roy Poor's uh, work evokes the equality and solidarity uh, in, 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 the work, in the work of a collective acting as a, of a collective acting as a singular entity. And uh, conversely, a singular entity, uh, uh, an individual entity, Acting uh, within the collective. So uh, this is uh, this leads us to the work of uh, Vitaly Trivashe. I'm very sorry, I have your technical issue, which we can see this. Okay. In another important representative of the Ukrainian New Year's movement, his large scale practice emerged from the collective gatherings organized by the youth section of the Union of Artists in the late 1980s, known as the Semi Planners. The development of his unique approach, centered on color and dimensional qualities, such as painting texture, for example, and brought him renown and placed him in the leadership of the European collective. Which collaborated with uh, the Transfer of Guard movement, yet deviated from them in several ways. The writer Boris Boriskevonian and Yaroslav Kolokutinsky described his practice as derived from uh, Byzantine monumental reference, similar to the Wichuk uh, school suppressing the nation's church. In contrast, they attributed the work of the Transfer of Guard of the 1990s like, and its legacy into uh, 2000s to an interpretation of the Baroque heritage. Characterized by eclecticism and the constant house of the configuration. Features of a post colonial condition, or an Ukrainian literary scholar Tamara Kudarova called it tragic culture. This is something that we have already seen in the Thunder Road Post Wars. In the post Soviet conditions of the 1990s to early 2000s, the Russian explored modern interest in color and speciality by creating an immersive space in his trademark shape, which became known as Silvashiv. Uh, According to Silvashiv, his work uses speciality as a political tool, dismantling the dominant systems of coordinates and extending the spaces beyond their official use or functionality. This was exemplified in this project during the exhibition painting, Malarsko, uh, Silvashiv and uh, Lontarasevich. 
which took place in one of the early 18th century buildings of the National University of Philadelphia in, uh, in the year 2000. The academy served as Ukraine's main educational center between 1632 and 1818, when by order of the Russian Empire officials, it was transformed from a center of fine liberal sciences with the deep intellectual tradition into a religious academy. Soviet authorities in turn dismantled the religious academy, destroyed the monastery, and most of the earlier buildings on its territory, excluding them in 1935, and created a military polish, erasing nearly every reference to the preceding intellectual history and academic excellence that had originated in the early Baroque period. The academy then reopened only in 1990. Uh, in the center for contemporary art, uh, which was hosted by uh, one of the academy's only surviving buildings, the worship placed a pool of water that reflected walls painted in deep blue, with occasional accent of yellow and pink, challenging the coloniality of memory embedded into the empty historical space. The ultimate demilitarization after the military college and the simplification of the historical space versus the Russian global university division project. The work shifted attention away from the routine functionality of the world, which had been reworked and simplified by a series of interventions from the spaces given occupants uh, throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. Instead, the artist visually expanded the space, evoking the patterns of the past that the building once contained, while offering a way to reverse the historical process through the mirroring qualities of art. Silvashi says, Empire's work was space. By working with space, the empire lived under the illusion of time to day. Uh, but for this, the empire needs expansion into space, which fuels this illusion and gives meaning to its existence. This illusion will not disappear on its own. It can only be dismantled. So, in 2022, the artist began exploring the profound speciality of both in called neo colonial war and uh, struggle for freedom through objects representing territory. One such work, a uh, valid proof of it, uh, that you can see in the center of the screen, uh, features an actual insert from a military ballistic vest at uh, Firth Palace, which the artist transformed into a map of a recently shelled territory, dividing a green field with a gray line. Silvashin views the world with the characteristics of time, marking its temporality and dimensional transience as an external framework that the empire bears for splash, taken to the losing Guattari's definition of uh, the war machine. The fragmented artifacts from Russia's war in Ukraine help him trace this temporality with the intrinsic hope that the war will soon end along the same time. The world exhibition, Silver Circles Circle at the International Convention Center Ukrainian House, is his most important retrospective in years. The centerpiece of the exhibition is a large blue pool on the ground floor of the building. When the installation of the chef activated the profoundly modernist architectural space, which was built between 1978 and 82 as a museum of planning. The, it was a, Original branch of uh, the museum. And the board the space and simultaneously absorbs the existing structural repetitions of the buildings of the texture into existing attacks. During the uh, first months of the invasion of Kiev, the show worked on the visual diary, documenting the change in sky over Kiev day by day as a representation of the external, something that will endure after any war takes. He also created a concurrent series featuring Pofi as a marker of his daily connection to both his work for his home, symbolizing stability and openness in contrast with the possibility of war for his kids. That was, of course, uh, uh, quite a possibility for everyone uh, in, in, in Ukraine in uh, the Soviet uh, this, uh, this visual diary work uh, where depths challenged the tension brought about uh, by Russian violence was later published as a book in German. A very global connection to Wim Wenders and Moscow, of course. The group pool at the Ukrainian house will visit the iconic project on the south and continue with exploration of that, both in power and space, as a mark of stability and resilience in the face of that distress, using the symbolism of water as a reflection. It's never in the stand shelf, addresses complex topics such as the impact of colonialism and the extended action of its anti colonial politics. <coughs> It is also a constitution of space beyond its original functionality, that immerses the viewers into the encounter between the past and the present. Uh, the other word also matters the symbolic presence in the works of Vladimir Rolko. Similarly, the legacies of trans avant persisted in the large scale of her works, 
some of which our uh, gallery walls and then collage, collages of images. Unless it was she who tends to look away from war wounds, her work examines them closed. Her work reflects uh, ongoing events through the complex symbolism of Ukraine made for choreography, which was also formative for the Ukrainian avant-garde of the 1920s and 1930s. Her deep connection to Ukrainian modern living is evident in her use of both color, expression, and figurative forms. As well as her focus on schemes of anti colonial resistance, ambiguous identity, and historization of the narration. These are particularly compelling themes for artists of the Ukrainian avant garde, seen in the Ukrainian series by David Burduk, or the work of his brother Rosen. For example, David Burduk's work, Man with Two Faces, uh, from 1912, created alongside his Ukrainian theme works, uh, such as the Ukrainian, from the Bob Mamai, the same year, <coughs> brings to life the metaphor of duality. Being split between Ukrainian and Russian cultures, by portraying a young state man in his seventh attire. The bearded man in a village uh, with uh, two faces looking uh, in different directions perfectly visualizes the artist's position as the bearer of the antipodal two cultures, which often manifests not as a peaceful fusion, but as long history of travel. This dichotomy is especially evident in uh, Rousseau's work uh, for contrast uh, for contact line series, where she addresses the border as both a gender and political life. The is a female figure piercingly resisting her male counterpart. In the painting speaking, the woman eliminates the man with the left, revealing his ambivalent, general space nature. The two headed, rigid, postured figure dressed in either a form of suit or a military uniform. The position of the figures, female figure to the left, male figure to the right, corresponds to the geographical distribution of Ukraine and Russia along the shared border. The, male, uh, the man's two green spaces structurally resemble the Russian state temple. Of the two-headed people. The ambiguous title of the series in English, where contact line can also be translated as the marcation line, reflects a geopolitical entanglement and Ukraine simultaneous effort to detach from this hybrid condition. Lateral force is uh, where lateral force extensively uses modernist references to the mostly uh, drooling-based uh, deep fantasy series. Named after the city where she found shelter after the outbreak of violence, during the post-scale invasion. As she explored the profound drama of war by merging the Russian polycharged images with depictions of extreme violence, the visual language of her drawing shifts from formal and figurative to more expressive abstract and satanic culture. The works are extensive and grotesque, as the artist feels nearly the entire paper with sketches of male to male and in some cases treated like figures. They represent different stages of a struggle with a cephalic fiction like people. The sense is only the decapitated head of this monster that appears in the drawings. At other times, we witness an epic fight as part of the heroic character. In both the religious and iconography, <coughs> as well as pornographic imagery, this series engages in a figurative and battery interpretation of the colonial entanglement between Russia and Ukraine, highlighted by the Soviet symbols that occasionally reemerge along the text of the Soviet imagery. The series offers a detailed exploration of the deep wounds inflicted by war. And then world resistance, as well as the hidden power dynamics of society change as the military situation evolves. In the broader context, wherever Ukrainian artists look, whether to the sky as the Russian, the human body as the Rocco, the past of the present, they engage with colonial trauma, with of memory, and the former subaltern space, which has the potential to become a state of liberation. Either if you look retrospectively, in the post-colonial condition portrayed by the Ukrainian and the parties, or through ongoing active uh, cultural resistance in the world. So, um, just to conclude, I would like to uh, speak a little bit about the upcoming publication of two books. And the first is this volume in which, uh, well, in which several of my esteemed colleagues participated is dedicated to the way Seeing, dismantling, and reinterpreting identities in Ukrainian society after two revolutions, and also 2004 and 2014. And from the beginning of the Russian occupation of Ukraine in 2014 to the outcomes of the full scale occupation. The second book is my monograph on the coloniality and, and war, the Ukrainian Russian case, which partially looks away from our historical perspective and even in to analyze the complexity of mutual cultural impact that. Uh, in uh, an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary manner. 
It proposes new ways of understanding the colonial entanglement between the two countries beyond the methods used by both post-colonial and decolonial theorists today. <clears throat> and uh, just to mention that I was uh, deeply honored that Tiberius uh, Tegwashi uh, allowed me to, uh, to do his work on the cover when I was preparing the summary year of work. And as, as it's uh, revealed by this ongoing exhibition that he has in that Ukrainian house, uh, the topics of speciality and coloniality, both in terms of imperial aspirations and resistance to them, have become a key point of convergence and discussion for Ukrainian art today. So that's all what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. And I look forward to uh, And, um, and I'm very excited about your forthcoming books, and um, uh, I hope that you will come and uh, launch at least one of them um, here, and so that we can hear more. Um, so I'd like to invite our, um, our speakers now to come and sit here at the front with me, so that we can uh, continue the conversation across the um, suite of these um, three um, generations of um, of uh, extraordinary avant-garde artists and and think more about relationships between inter about intergenerational dialogue and um, continuity of thinking about uh, power and uh, and spatial uh, dynamics. Um, can so Tivana can hear us? Yes. Yeah, so if you uh, repeat any questions. Can hear through. So should I stay here then? Okay, if there's a question for Susanna, if there's a question for you, I'm going to come up here and repeat it for you. So I was really struck, um, thank you, I was really struck by um, the uh, synergies between um, your two papers and perhaps um, I would just like to begin by um, inviting you to perhaps uh, speak to one another because the way that you ended uh, your paper uh, talking about, um, uh, well hinting at, uh, um, at what you felt had been a, a kind of a misconstrual um, of um, the relationship between the historical avant-garde moment that you were talking about and, the, and socialist realism um, led in so interestingly to your um, re-evaluation uh, of socialist uh, realist artists too. So, um, well, uh, I have a good note about that, which I forgot to mention in the presentation because I think that was a complete decline you um, the, in the first article that was uh, very critical of what Aria did in the article, accused of being Wojciechis, which we heard now a lot about Wojciech, and that was uh, the most territory insult at the time. Uh, and what is interesting, I think, I mean, there's a whole story about how Wojciechis became the embodiment of this animus. Of the people, I mean, they were classified as the animals of the people. Um, but I think the, the brilliant moment of this whole story that the Aryan, they didn't know what you was. <laughs> and the moment they were accused, and they were massively grateful <laughs> for discovering this artist <laughs> in this way. No, we don't have questions for anybody. No, no, just to respond as well, please. Uh, uh, yeah, I think this acquisition of Portuguese, uh, they have their history, and I would not really rely on this acquisition. Uh, Speaking to the microphone, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I think that it's a tradition of uh, like, um, blaming someone to be Portuguese, is having its own uh, way, so I would not use it. To, in this discussion, that, yeah, it, it's uh, it's a tradition to, to blame the nation like uh, enemy, which we have seen in Bojuk. So, but, but what I try to um, uh, envelop in, uh, or uh, like show in my um, uh, I, to to, the, to try to uh, go to the. Um, uh, 
to the uh, formal analysis also to, uh, to, uh, to understand that um, um, Boychuk and uh, Bogomazov and everyone there, they, they were interested in the, uh, in, um, in, the, in the formal things, but they uh, came to completely different uh, um, paths. And uh, that what is, uh, um, yeah, and that uh, this all legacies which we see from modernism, they are sometimes more like replications of shapes. And that it's not enough to say that something is having legacy of modernism because it's similarly to it. So it's about, a bit about different things. So um, modern legacies could appear in very naturalistic for, uh, formal, formats. And that uh, I think it's a bit simplification when we just see something similar to Bojukism and then we say it's in modernism <coughs> or Bojukism. I think we are on other stage of perception now that we could understand that it's not so simple. Like we just see some similarities, visual similarities, and then to judge out of the similarities. Yes, thank you. Great that we're in a moment that we can begin to think about these complexities. So, yes, and, and uh, Constantine, do you want to ask a question? <coughs> Uh, I have question comments to both uh, Lada and Farina. Lada, very, thank you very much. It's very interesting. It's very needed. Uh, of course, that's an opening possibility to serious research and the serious book, because practically in the same time we have in the Institute Bogomazov, Boychuk, uh, Palmov, Malevich, and Tatrin. If we saw something about Malevich teaching programs, not too much, but something. We have no heck of idea what Papa, what Tatman was doing. So we never saw any explanation of what Tatman was doing at this uh, theatrical photographic department of the Institute. Uh, with Palma, uh, information is very fragmented. So I hope that maybe all this will inspire you to the quest to work on serious book on this issue, because it's extremely exciting topic. My question to you, uh, as we saw from your presentation, you obviously work with archival material. So what is the volume? How much documentation we have for Bagamadov and how much documentation we have for Bulich? That's questions to you. Then uh, questions and comments to Padi. Parina gave a very interesting speech. It was, I think, I can say, embrace the whole history of humanity. I want to come to more specific um, uh, elements. First, through your speech, I personally did not understand what is your take on this um, uh, artistic output of uh, Rebaychuk and Melnichenko in the north. What is the place of them, which is not was covered in your speech, in the whole Soviet system? Because we have two periods of this, uh, let's say, fascination with the north, which is 1930s, of course, around Schmidt, which is coming to different manifestation, like from the top of the head, 1933 edition of Young Alma, uh, a very funny book with two translation of the same text by Plotnikov in which Kov and with uh, illustration of Elisa Perret uh, making this typical um, Philon of analytical art illustrations, who never been too close to this uh, Norris. But it's producing, no, it's not on the sheets. Uh, uh, of course, in the 50s, it's the second wave of this Nordic uh, Soviet fascination. Again, Rebaychuk and Melnichenko are not alone. There are um, uh, Russian counterparts. There is a full cultural model, like in this moment, like, um, what is his name? Ritheo, Richtel, you know, this famous. Um, um, uh, um, first creation of the local intellectuals. Ah, yeah, yeah uh, right here. Uh, translation of, okay. finally, so needed translation of Pushkin and Gorky yeah. into uh, Chukcha yeah, language, yeah, yeah, yeah. etc., etc. So, what is their place there? Short comment, two. 
uh, uh, first, uh, uh, Robin Kent yep. was not just selected. Robin Kent was on payroll. Yeah, I know. So the <laughs> embassy secretly was delivering money to Robin Kent. Uh, so it's a complicated story with Robin Kent. Second, if you're addressing Putin policy, on um, uh, Arctic today, there is an interesting story which is not covered by New Yorker. It's a role of uh, Chevengaro in forming of this policy. I can tell you more later. Uh, yeah, I, I'm pretty aware of the 2007 um, events, let's say, about Chevengaro. Chevengaro. Should I answer that? Uh, well, yours was the second question, so perhaps would yeah. you like to yeah, begin? Yeah, I think mine will be shorter answer <laughs> than the questions to you. <laughs> In my case, it's quite clear that uh, uh, Boychuk's, uh, on, on, on Boychuk's teaching, everything is published, and um, my attempt is to um, review this and mm -hmm. try to analyze it differently than it, it just published everything. It's uh, uh, only what I uh, still trying to get. Uh, I think I, it's quite difficult his programs in uh, Leningrad because then after Kiev he moved yeah. to Leningrad and there are some programs existing and I, I know this but I still didn't get them. Uh, trying and uh, uh, regarding Bogomazov is more interesting. Uh, his programs uh, for the uh, uh, for the pedagogical department um, he was responsible for. Uh, they are in uh, in Kiev archive and they are not reworked. So it's uh, they are re really amazing. Um, very contemporary ideas which I found there, for example, of translation, that artist is trans he's even like translating from one uh, medium to another, and that translation is, of course, it's another language, so it's about different languages. Also, uh, for example, about him, many texts uh, about Bochuk or about Bogomazov, that uh, he's more like individualist but he, it's really not in his views. You see how he is working with uh, establishing some uh, aesthetical uh, common with uh, uh, public, and uh, it, this all is in his program, because it can show differently also his figure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Colina, do you want to uh, respond? Yeah, I briefly <laughs> respond. So uh, first question, what is my take? So uh, actually I had I think like my main mission was to show that they were well inscribed into the Soviet culture. Um, the culture remains was sort of, sort of popularizing narratives of exoticizing maybe they are or something like this. This is the first point, and the second point, but I also wanted to show that their the picture is more complicated, it's not about uh, Let's say replicated and real use of socialist realism, ethnographic knowledge, like ethnographic tradition, which was also destroyed by the surface, but it's also sort of certain, certainly a confluence of factors and also the rise of modernism, and you can see it in their art. So, this is, I think, the kind of the type. Um, about cheating art, I mean. Um, this is a fantastic subject, and I had to cut today in the morning two sides about uh, um, nuclear, uh, nuclear waste in the Arctic that was by the Soviets. So there's definitely a lot to tell. Yeah. 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 yeah, so I, unfortunately I had to yeah, shorten my presentation to more to the point. Yeah. Thank you. I think lots and lots of people are burning to ask questions, so I'll collect um, three. Any hope? No. <laughs> Thank you. Three really excellent presentations. And I suppose my question is mostly inspired by Svetlana, but as you refer mostly to Svetlana's presentation, but also to both of yours, uh, to all, all three of them. So I thought I tried to make it even shorter than Constantine's. But <laughs> 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 well, it, mostly, it mostly refers to the, the category of ambicoloniality, which uh, Svetlana very humbly and very briefly introduced at the end, which I think is a brilliant category, and which I remember you gave a talk about this in 2022 in, in Copenhagen, and I've been waiting impatiently for the, for the book, which, which is excellent to see the cover of. And I, I mean, it's, what I, uh, I suppose the category is ambivalent or ambiguous, and so I'm not going to attempt to define it, but I suppose I, I was wondering how, um, how you, um, Paulina and Nada, see, do you see ambicoloniality too? 
in your in your um, research, and then Susanna, kind of what do you think? What about whether they the, the way they see how coloniality in their work does that match with your definition of it? And in, in particular, I suppose uh, Alexei Ladinsky's film that you also referred to, probably that shows very well, I think. Um, coloniality, and not simply as something that Ukraine receives, but also performs, right, in, yeah. his, in the journeys of these Ukrainian filmmakers and scientists in, uh, in the Arctic and in, in, in the, in the furthest regions of Russia. And I suppose, of course, with Lebatchuk and Manichenko, it's, it's very pronounced, too, that they are, and they are also white European uh, scientists and artists at the same time extracting information. But I wonder whether they also see themselves as having a special status which is more in solidarity with or somehow equivalent to, in the way that Malinovsky saw himself as yeah. more savage than a Western European yeah, yeah, yeah. ethnographer in the Turbulent mm -hmm. Island. And so, yeah, and does that also apply to the king? Thank <laughs> you. And the coloniality, we'll come back to that in a second. Um, another mm -hmm. question here. Yeah, Susanna, I think you're going to have to the questions, both Lumada and uh, Palina. Um, rather, I'm also very interested in archaeology, as we told before. Um, I'm curious about the question of the medium uh, at the time. Uh, so you mentioned that they were kind of translating from the Indian, but was there any conversation, was there any uh, questioning of the of different media per se? Like, what, what were they trying to expand uh, media and um, when they introduce you know, new things or other things. And I'm asking this question specifically in relation to one of the books in the exhibition, in the this one. There is a, there are a number of collages of um, the um, and you know, some of them are kind of uh, typical, the paper cutouts, but there is one where he uses uh, grain for mm -hmm. hair, I think it's like barley or something. Uh, so it's completely non-artistic, um, material that is introduced. So, um, you know, this kind of gesture, was it a total adoration or was it actually thought at the time already within, the, within that? Um, and then the second question is for Dina, and I think I'm probably echoing both uh, Constantine and, and Michal, but uh, so Rubashuk and, the, and you know, the artists, are they actually complicit in this um, colonization of the or are they were they critical, not in terms of discourse, whatever they might be saying, but in actual in their actual visual mm -hmm. production, where is the criticality mm -hmm. in this colonization? Because I kind of see the you know the typical ethnographic work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. So really just, yeah. Great. And the and from Sarah. Um, thank you very much. Well, um, I was fascinated by the Arctic scenario, but I precisely don't just see straightforward ethnographic work. I've seen a lot of socialist realist ethnographic work, and I thought that they were exceptionally extraordinary, and the minute you got to them, you just accelerated and dumped them. I mean, the one which had the cross-section of the tree trunk but covered in blue as the background was absolutely beautiful, yeah. and the subjectivity of the expressions. I'm very interested um, since also his work by a colleague on Marc um, Allegre in uh, Africa about uh, intersubjectivity, and especially you think he's been spending months and months and months and months and months there, as you said, going all through the winter and so forth. I thought the work was exceptional, and surely one of your jobs would be to ask those kind of questions, as well as kind of historical determinist questions, and actually put this this wonderful couple back on the map. And also, I'd just like to ask you, I don't understand if ARWM is an acronym that you invented, or they... No, no, no. Yeah. They use, yeah, no, I think it's absolutely amazing work. Because they should be proud of it. Well, you didn't even show the sculpture. So let's um, go back to the beginning and, um, and involve um, Svetlana here. So Svetlana, do you want to just say a few words about the AMBI coloniality, and then we'll ask the other two to respond to the concept. You're muted. <coughs> I'm afraid I don't hear questions very well. So the, the main question. Most of the questions were for the others, but you um, began, um, and you were the um, the one who offered the um, important um, 
dynamic concept at the beginning to initiate the discussion about ambicoloniality. So if you could say a few words about your concept, that would be very good. Is it already been published soon? And uh, this is a notion that I put in because I thought the necessity to describe the mutual uh, <coughs> impact of uh, Russian and Ukrainian culture that coexist uh, for centuries with this shared border, and uh, uh, to uh, trace in particular how uh, the cultural influences do not work only uh, in one way. From if uh, we turn to the classical post colonial theory, uh, colonizer making an impact on the colonized, but uh, vice versa as well. And uh, how, in, in which the cultural processes and uh, various uh, phenomena, this uh, impact, reverse impact, is reflected. So, in the, uh, some kind of symbolical uh, colonization of the uh, self symbolic of self colonization of Russia with. Uh, uh, Ukrainian culture uh, that we can trace uh, through uh, 19th, 20th century and which uh, culminates with uh, all this ongoing uh, uh, war and uh, the cultural impact of, of uh, this war in particular. It, 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 uh, I, I think I will, not, I will not be able to uh, kind of speak in detail about this concept, but this is something that I introduced at the end of this coming book. Thanks, that's really um, great. So do either of you two want to talk about how this um, uh, concept plays out in, in your work? Yeah, I will say two controversial things. <laughs> the first one, um, I um, am very skeptical of the application of colonial theory to Ukrainian art. Uh, so I don't personally um, don't use colonial theory, though if we're talking about this particular case, we have to think about it a bit better, especially if we're thinking about the media's relationship with with Ukrainian artists coming to draw them. So this is something I think different. I would mean, say maybe it's the only one situation where you actually can apply colonial theory uh, to Ukrainian art. I'm sorry. I'm, I really, I am, we can talk about I'm very critical, so that's why I don't use Arabic coloniality. I, um, for me, it's a, the invention of new nice words that has no heuristic capacity. There's no what? Uh, heuristic capacity explores very potential. Um, okay. Uh, well, I just to, to add a few minutes. I think we're going to keep coming back. I'm also not using these approaches uh, to talk about the 20th century, like beginning of the 20th century for sure. But, yeah. I would rather speak about the colonial, uh, colonial approach towards the viewer, like how to rule uh, over the viewer, but it's not that uh, colonial theory. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, that's interesting. But um, in relation to the uh, all of these questions around um, the Arctic, how do you navigate this? Um, uh, and these expeditions to the north without engaging with coloniality at um, all? Yeah. Uh, second, um, yeah, I have to say that I'm primarily a historian, a historian of Ukrainian art historiography. So the theory of social studies and everything. So um, this is this is a case that I'm kind of developing on my scope and scholarship. Um, the second controversial thing, I think the question about complicity, it's a question that perceives power as a homogeneous kind of uh, force. So whenever yeah, so whenever we are talking about the Nenes people, those there's Nenes people who gladly became the party, party functioners, and those the nearest people who became gladly, um, like who retreated to the, their tombs, uh, who didn't want to tie their economic, economic to the Soviet Union. And Marienberg, for, for example, was a city that was established with the same manager. Because Nenets are traditionally, 
traditionally great here herd builders, and they integrate with their herd. And um, so establishing a city is in fact like an attempt to control them, and they living in the city is also kind of part of this attempt. So what we, like the question of complicity is is much more complicated, I would say, you know, and uh, uh, I know that it's not cooperative, not cooperative to think about it in this mm -hmm. case. But, but the whole, mm -hmm. you know, the current discourse and debate about the decoloniality and, and even post-coloniality always took that on board, that it's more complicated and that the process as are internalized and, and mutual, that's been part of the conversation about colonialism, about which I'm not an expert, but since the beginning, so I don't think it's quite as black and white as you're presenting. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm presenting it's not as black and white completely, this is my point. But you're rejecting the use of the I'm, term because yeah, you I feel that it's too black and white. And um, it yes, so. I, I think uh, the, the colonial vocabulary in Ukrainian art context is not working. Yeah, like I think in Ukrainian art, not in this particular situation. Yeah, because I'm talking here. We're talking about the relationship between which is triangular. Yeah, there is a Russian Russians who like colonized colonized the city, and it's actually the Russians. So it's but it, it's also it always will be like yeah, there will be Ukrainian art functionaries coming there. So the question of nationality is also reducing as always. Then you have Ukrainian artists who are backed by the institutions and by the parties who are coming to be with the Nenets people. And the more they are like kind of in the more they the longer they live with the Nenets people, the more they became critical of their own art doctrine. So this is a bit different situation when we're talking about Soviet art, for example, in Ukraine. Do you understand me? Like, uh, so, so, <laughs> <laughs> well, very complicated. Yes, yeah, I, I think it's. Um, but it's portrayed it's like yeah. because there is a portrayal of Ukrainian art as being kind of always under oppression of Russian artists. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah, so that's where I, I just think, think that there's yeah. scope to not reject the term, but to think about how, uh, you know, in what ways it is or isn't generative. But um, it's, um, you know, this is how you're working, and I think it's very interesting for us to hear your perspective. Did you um, uh, want to add something? Uh, no, I just to uh, ask a other question. Okay. We, uh, well, we, I think we're going to keep coming back to this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so maybe uh, let's take a, a second round of questions. So I'm, still, to... I'm still here. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, yes. Uh, so, yes, about uh, the expanding the media. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, the biggest discussion uh, was um, in between of uh, like using monumental uh, approaches like in, in painting uh, or easel uh, approaches and easels uh, became the, the more laboratory form and it came towards the uh, idea of the monumental and monumental it's of course not only painting, it's a, a thesis of everything, architecture and uh, more so, uh, in, but uh, it's if, if to speak about already almost thirties, but uh, at the beginning of the academy, uh, uh, academy of art when it was established, it was a division of the um, studios or workshops, and uh, uh, it was also uh, divided uh, like named by some approaches, the, but not, not material uh, but approaches, and it was also very formal. So uh, it, it was a critics uh, about this already in the texts that okay we uh, uh, making this division, but we understand that, of course, it's not re really relevant. That we should rethink now a whole um, st a whole structure, how how to think about art and about this. So it was a discussion about language, and material uh, helped also to um, understand this language through the. Um, Facturas, materials, so everything were released to uh, rethink the new combination. And that's why it, it was easy to use all materials, like in, in theater, like metal was used very, very strongly. And that was very... Thank you. Um, let's collect up um, three more questions. Um, I think that's all we have time for. If you could keep them to one question each, please. Yeah. Hi. Uh, 
I want to go back to the word for people I loved and also hated. Um, he was Sorry, a, I didn't hear that too. I loved, I loved Roy Burke. He was a friend of mine and, and of course he was a typical person. He once tried to kill me with a, with, with his cane in front of the governor, so I just really know that's not the difference. Um, story. Um, I, I, it's been exactly three years since he died, uh, just this summer, and I really want to know what all three panels think about his legacy in terms of him being a public intellectual. Roy Burke. Roy Burke. Roy Burke. Uh, Roybert's legacy as a public intellectual, he's a rare, rare artist who's also a first rate political thinker, head of a museum, links to Porchenko. Okay, uh, yeah, thank you. Svetlana can't hear you, and I'm not going to be able to repeat your whole question, so if you could just. Oh, just the legacy of Roybert. The legacy of Roybert. The legacy of Roybert as a public intellectual rather than an artist. Thank you. And another person? Yes? You said that they were not well received in Ukraine at all, um, but they were better received in, in Moscow. Okay. And I wonder if you could speak to, to why that yes. is. That was cultural distinction. Yes. Okay. And the final question. Mm -hmm. I just have a question for Lana, and um, a kind of um, how the teachings or how this approach to teaching that you're describing, whether that had any reverberations outside um, of the Institute or um, internationally or what would be the case for or what, what would happen with it afterwards? Okay, so Svetlana, um, the first question um, perhaps you could um, answer to begin with and um, we had um, um, uh, a, an audience member who knew uh, Rod but, um, personally and, um, and um, I was asking about what do you think about his uh, legacy uh, as a public intellectual? Can you hear me? Oh, you hear you hear you? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. So, Roy Gordon's legacy <laughs> as a public intellectual, you know, how significant um, do you think uh, he uh, is today? Uh, I, I think that uh, his legacy uh, forms uh, part, uh, very, of a reflection on a very interesting epoch, which was uh, the period of transition, uh, particularly of the times of uh, uh, 2014, for example, with only the of the Euro Maidan, the beginning of the war, and then the way how he transformed, he attempted to transform uh, uh, the culture in uh, in in, in uh, both locally in Odessa and on the on national level, and uh, I think uh, that uh, this two two separate legacies so Freud board as a painter and as a uh, as a, a museum for professional they are uh, quite representative uh, quite representative of the changes through which uh, the all this uh, last decade. And there was like a proverb saying, um, maybe Constantin can help me in this, that uh, Robot is taking your um, finger in Moscow, in Kiev they will cut the head. So that's the correct one. Yeah, so there's also um, one of the kind of offshoot of the centralization politics in arts that. Uh, um, so when the body is, is moving from the center, it's, it's always the areas of this directive, so how it should be implemented on site are perceived in a different way. And what happened in Ukraine, they were perceived much more severely. But it is also like the case that you have, you know, institutions are operated by people, and people who were in the Ukrainian Union of Artists were specifically didn't like the artist, so it's always an influence on many factors. Yeah, so this is, yeah, this is how this answers your question. My your question, yeah, and so the thing is that basically they were, um, for example, they started after, because they were oil painters, and so I'm coming back to the question of medium, 
And this was the most healed Hanover Center in the Soviet Union. And uh, after they opened the meeting, they couldn't um, exhibit their artworks. And um, they started to work in children's association, which was less censored. And they, some of their children's books they couldn't publish in Ukraine, so they published it in Moscow. Yeah. This is what happened. Yeah. There was like one, this, this, there was one that was a book of Kokori, so it was refused in here, but then in Moscow they picked it up and published it. The vicissitudes of censorship. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, Lada, would you like to um, respond? Well, thank, thank you for the question. It gives me the opportunity to say why I'm doing this <laughs> <laughs> research, because I'm a practitioner, I'm an artist, and uh, I just very critical towards education. I started with critics uh, to our education in Ukraine, which is traditional post-Soviet, but then I found out that in Europe it's not Better. It's a feeling that uh, like all you should 20th, be censored. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the 20th century ideas are just forgotten. I don't know. It's again the professor and students around just copying his style, his way, and his contacts, and that's, that's what we. And that's why uh, I'm like, yeah, quite instrumental also toward the history. And I think that Boychuk's legacy is not really studied in pedagogics, and he could uh, be like, revolutionary in changing the education problems. Maybe it's, if, if, uh, if you allow me to say this, this is not worth saying that you have yourself developed. Yeah. educational program and kind of critically approach it so you're not just kind of looking at it critically but you're actually also experimenting with it. Yeah, yeah, I'm and doing this in practice. As an artist and like in, in conceptual terms, so which I think is very interesting. Thank you. Thank you all very much for your um, questions. Thank you again to our speakers and we're having a short break. Coming back at 6 uh, and 6 p.m. <laughs> Okay, hey, good evening everybody. Welcome back to the last session of today's marathon. <laughs> to say the least. It's, uh, it's been absolutely fantastic, fascinating, rich, and what an amazing program. Thank you so much, um, Katyam and Maria, uh, for being here. Such an amazing event. Uh, my name is William Blacker. I'm uh, Associate Professor of Ukrainian and East European Culture at UCL and the School of Stomach and East European Studies. Um, just around the corner. Uh, I'm really pleased to be a part of today's event, and especially to be a part of uh, this part of today's event, which is about multicultural dimensions of uh, Ukrainian modernism, uh, something which I work on in my own work on literature from Ukraine, so not an art, but on uh, literature. And I think we've already seen in lots of the panels today how important understanding the multicultural nature of the cultural life in Ukraine is. Uh, we've seen uh, discussion of Polish-Ukrainian uh, cultural contacts, of Czech-Ukrainian cultural contacts, we've talked about multiple different empires, multiple different cultural contexts, different contexts and how they intersect um, on the territory of Ukraine. Um, the multicultural dimension is something that we encounter everywhere we look at Ukrainian history, Ukrainian culture. And those things I think it's, it's useful to return to what for me at least is one of the founding texts of post-1991 Ukrainian studies in the West. That's a very well-known article by Mark von Hagen called Does Ukraine Have a History? Uh, with a provocative title, Does Ukraine Have a History? Um, and in that article, Mark von Hagen, this is written, I forget the exact date, but in the early 90s, uh, he writes, what has been perceived as the weakness of Ukrainian history for its defects when measured against the putative standards of West European states, such as France and Britain, ought to be turned into strengths for a new historiography. And by weakness, he means 
the lack of a long tradition of statehood, essentially, and a long tradition of uh, national institutions of all kinds, which Ukraine hasn't had. And he goes on to say precisely the fluidity of frontiers, the permeability of cultures, the history of multi-ethnic society is what could make Ukrainian history a very modern field of inquiry. Ukrainian history can serve as a wonderful vehicle to challenge the nation state's conceptual hegemony and explore some of the most contested issues of identity formation, cultural construction and maintenance, and colonial institutions and structures. And I think this is, this is definitely a great place to start any investigation and discussion of uh, Ukraine's history, in von Hagen's case, but also Ukraine's culture, like literature, and also artistic production on the territory of what we today know as Ukraine. Um, of course, I think there are complexities that maybe uh, we can miss when we, when we take von, Hagen, von Hagen's approach. Um, it's very, all very nice to talk about the fluidity of frontiers, the permeability of cultures, multi-ethnic societies, um, from a Western point of view, from the point of view of a culture uh, and a political context and a national context which has had the chance to consolidate itself over centuries and hasn't been hindered in doing so, is there perhaps a slight arrogance among Western scholars who approach Ukraine immediately telling it to start dismantling the national narrative and thinking about permeability and hybridity and all of these things before the national tradition has even been consolidated in the way that ours has been. Um, and it reminds me of some of the discussions that happen in the field of comparative literature, the, some of the challenges to the idea, the kind of idea of the depoliticized, borderless world literature, um, global literary sphere, uh, which appears in comparative literature at a certain point. And some of the challenges to that, for example, by scholars like Pascal Casanova, who has talked about the fact that, yes, literary cultural borders do not adhere to political national borders, they, uh, they cross over them, they blur them, but at the same time we can't ignore those, the, the political fact of those borders, we cannot ignore the political fact of those borders perhaps not existing. Uh, we can't afford, we can't ignore the histories of unequal access to resources, for example, um, which affect in her case, literary production, but we can also talk about resources and institutions in relation to art as well. And we've, we've already spoken in some of the other sessions about, for example, um, the fact that the first Academy of Arts in Ukraine appears, uh, appears only in 1917, it was 1820. So there are complexities, I think, to opening up <laughs> discussions about hybrid permeable cultural frontiers and overcoming the nation state and I hope that we're going to get into some of those complexities in our uh, discussion um, to close uh, today's proceedings. Uh, we're going to have two presentations. Uh, we're also going to have a short film um, first. And so I'll introduce our first speaker for today who is uh, Andri Boyarov, who is a visual artist and an independent curator and researcher from uh, Lviv. You can read further details about Andy's career in the program, but I'm told that we're doing a short introduction, so I'm just doing a short introduction. Um, so, Andy, over to you. Thank you very much. So, the most important in this introduction is what's the time from Lviv? <laughs> because uh, we will start this uh, not even discussion, just conversation much more earlier, both with Katya and Kostya. And the point was that Lviv is absent from the exhibition, and not only this exhibition, but two other exhibitions who was traveling around Europe last year. It was a kaleidoscope of histories. Of art of Ukraine for 100 years with big historical part, 
and exhibition on uh, Ukrainian futurism, which was shown uh, in Tallinn in Kumo Museum, Modern Museum, actually due to my effort, and then in Belgium. So in all the three exhibitions, Lviv as, uh, as the center of modernism, of Ukrainian modernism, I will insist, in 20s and 60s, uh, 30s was absent on, on this exhibition. Actually, both Katya and Kostya reacted, and in Vienna, in Berlin, the Lviv appears, but in a part of uh, like earlier works, and, and actually an ethnical dimension. So my aim now just to present, just to introduce uh, Lviv as center of modernism in uh, interwar period. And uh, of course, 20 minutes, it's, it will be not introduction, just a glimpse of introduction or just sketch for introduction. So that's why I decided to, to show a short film on the beginning from the Lviv from the 30s five minute long film with there uh, a lot of aspects and features for Lviv modernism at that time. I just wish to remind that it's not allowed to record it because of the copyright. So in, in fact, uh, I have no title for my presentation, but just a few minutes ago I thought that water Voda, Voda will be a good one to show the local context, intercultural encounters and transnational exchanges in the uh, uh, interwar milieu. So the author of the film is the Vitor Troma. Uh, so courtesy of his granddaughter Barbara Roma to show this film uh, for this event. So Vitor Troma was the professor of Lviv Polytechnic and head of workshop of Institute of Photography from 1931. And he was expert in photochemistry, one of the founder and member of avant-garde movie club and magazine in, in Lviv. So that's the magazine. Roman tour and Ukrainian uh, belonging to the club too after his return from, Ger from Germany and France with new newest type of cameras. He working there for leading production companies and directors. Arturo Genina, here you can see them on the plan of in, in Paris. As well, Roman Ture presented first exhibition of Nikifor Drovniak in Paris uh, back in the late 20s. So, of course, the film expressed excitement with a new development of popularization of sports, rapid modernization of the 20s and 30s, showing three new public swimming pools in Lviv actually pictures of the pupils, uh, students of Vito uh, Troma, uh, of, of photography at uh, Polytechnical, uh, Wodimierz uh, Pucharski and uh, Leon Lutek. Probably the most known picture, or a picture of Vito Troma is start uh, from the same period of 1936. He's an inventor of visual effect of isohelia, quite a complicated technique, actually all the photographic journals of the time in Europe was writing about this, let's call it a graphic effect. So you will need until 10 negatives must be produced and used in printing one picture. But Romer was involved as well in aerial photography, of which Lviv was a center in, in European scale, scale, where professional, all the professional magazines was writing about the news from Lviv at the time. And as well, the glider sport was popular in the whole region. Probably that's why one can see traces of aesthetics of futuristic aeropictura in some of the shots. Uh, me personally, I can see it clearly. Just three years before Romer started this film, Tommaso Filippo Marinetti visited Lviv for three days. <laughs> Among many others, lectures, he gave a lectures which we have no record, but I think Aero Pitura was on the top for sure at the time. He was speaking about this. Actually, he, he came uh, for the premiere of his play, uh, Prisoners, at the city theater. And uh, the scenography was made by locals, by Andrzej Pronashko. He, he treated much more higher than Brampolini's one. And actually, the local composer uh, made the score for this. 
uh, he he had the two bankets, one official and one unofficial. He made he paid few private visits as well. Actually, one of the banquets, uh, brother Shimpitsky visited as well. Actually, Ukrainian press was very critical about this visit and about Marinetti himself, because uh, the, the very idea was unfresh at the time, and he was a part of, of the go uh, government of Mussolini at the time. But one of the private visits was to Leon Hvistek in Lviv. Uh, Hvistek moved to Lviv in 1931 from Krakow, and got the chair of logic at the university due to recommendation by Bertrand Russell. He was correspondent with him, it was Whitehead as well. He had his own theory of art, polarity realities mm -hmm. in art. Actually, he was supporting Ukrainian universities in Lviv as well. His Limits of Science was published here in London in 1948. And earlier in Lviv was published in Lviv. Um, he was as well what we call our curator and organizer of art. It's his picture from Lviv from 37, quite a recognizable place where he made it. It's, it's his himself in the center in so-called literary casino at Akademitska Street. And he was organizer of the first exhibition of uh, Grupa Krakowska, which in fact bear its name from the Academy in Krakow. In fact, almost all the members was from the Western Ukraine, as uh, Leopold Levitsky, who stayed in Lviv after the war, one of the founding main, uh, member uh, of uh, Grupa Krakowska. Well-known artist, Ukrainian artist after the war. But there is another picture of Witter Tromer, Another kind of picture. It's night, night aerial picture of unknown German uh, German town. So during the Second World War, uh, Romer, after escaping Lviv, he was working for Royal Air Forces here in London. <coughs> here he is. Uh, last but not least, uh, the the soundtrack for this film is made by Young. Uh, Ukrainian composer, acting composer, and as well lecturer at conservatory in Lviv, Ostap Manuliak. Uh, I didn't ask him, it was his own idea, and he saw in the montage of this film, he just compared it with some ideas of school of uh, new music and musicology of Lviv. It was his idea to put soundtrack for this film, the type of montage and rhythmic, he found some parallels in this, so that's why uh, Ostap decided uh, to make uh, this uh, soundtrack. Um, probably most known composer is the decaphonist Josef Kofler and his later, uh, later pu uh, pupil uh, Roman Haubmann Stokramati, active in Vienna after the war mostly, but uh, one of the first dodecaphonic uh, pieces was made uh, by Josef Kofler in Lviv after his study in Vienna and so on, many contacts uh, with uh, well-known composers. Here you can see as well early essay of Zofia Lisa on music in the movie. Uh, she called it study of ontology, aesthetics and uh, psychology. At the time she treat as well radio as a separate medium and uh, as a medium of music itself. Roman Palester uh, created his original score for Marinetti prisoners in city theater. This score is lost actually, we can find uh, the record of this. And Ukrainian Stefania Turkevich, she studied uh, first in musicology at Lviv University and then uh, uh, got her PhD in Krakow, uh, uh, sorry, in Prague, uh, Prague Free Ukrainian University. She was back to Lviv, was teaching uh, theory at Lviv Conservatory, and 1946 she escaped to England, live, uh, lived first in London and died in Oxford. <laughs> the technology is also fired. Sure. <laughs> so, of course, uh, 
London connection is not so obvious. It's just for so I I just wish to be from the map because it was usual also other connections uh, from the view. So still the view is closer to Vienna and Berlin than Kharkiv. Uh, the distance to Budapest is the same as to Kiev, and of course Krakow and Warsaw much more closer. And I just wish to remind that uh, Lviv uh, in Austrian, even in Austrian times, has and in Polish times, has no own Academy of Arts. So the main, the main destination for was Krakow and Vienna, of course. Uh, <coughs> more, uh, more that uh, in. Both in Austrian times, in the times of Austro-Hungarian Empire and uh, Polish times, uh, there was three major ethnical groups of Poles, Jews, and Ukrainians. And most of Ukrainians was living in the whole region, but in the city it was about 20% of of Ukrainians. But still, I, I don't know if it's correct data because they just uh, uh, share it between Roman Catholics. Judaism and uh, and uh, Ukrainian Catholic Church, but some Ukrainians was of course Roman Catholics and some Poles was uh, uh, in the Union Church as well. But anyway, you can see these different names of uh, Lvov, Lemberg, uh, and Lemberg in in Yiddish. Most obvious connection in the early 20th century is Vienna, of course. Here is the master, uh, Henry Junkoras, master and father of Lviv modernist photography. He is a descent of his grandparents with Czech origin, owners of the famous pharmacy, distillery, and later of uh, first, first shopping mall, the Passage, mm -hmm. on the turn of the century, big Passage. Mm -hmm. The sample was Passage of Kaufmann in Paris, of course. He's a big educator about sporty publication on photography, but on, on, on aesthetics and technical matters, of course. And he was a founder of Photographic Society and, and magazine as well. Uh, he founded the Institute of Photography at Polytechnic, which Romer was his successor uh, later on it. I call him Alfred Stiglitz of Lviv. <laughs> no doubt, because he was a pictorialist, but many avant-garde and modernist uh, photo later photographers, which I will show in a glimpse as well, was uh, his students. So there is a clear evidence of Vienna influence. Of course, he is, was living in Austro-Hungarian Empire, so first Central magazine. Photographic mm -hmm. and he was studying as well uh, painting. Uh, first with Julius Kosak, and then with mentioning already today both uh, 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 Jan Stanislavski and Julian Falat. Have to say that both was born in Ukraine, and both of these pictures was Ukraine files. Uh, really, in, in fact, another. <coughs> student of uh, Falat and Stanislavski, Ivan Trush at the uh, Krakow Academy. Already Michal showed today his pieces uh, from uh, Carpathians and this piece is from, I mean photography is from uh, Egypt. But he is using photography in different way than Nikolas. I, I can call Nikolas because of this the first, I call him first media artist of Lviv because he made a painting through photography or graphics, uh, this very known piece of him, this blue flask. Here is uh, different connection. So he used photography for uh, for his painting. Around 400 negatives are in National Museum of Lviv, but he's not lost as a painter, but he's a great photographer. And his first article on photography and the art of painting in nine, 1905 in his art newsletter. So, bunch of students of Henrik Mikolas, later of uh, Peter Trommer. 
modernist photographer emerged, uh, emerged from his school, at least few dozens names worth mentioning, formed few groups with different aesthetics, one influenced by Bauhaus, Mohoinoti in particular, called themselves technical circle of photographers. Most prophetic uh, idea and original feature of Lviv modernist school was montage and collage. It has its own theoretician and promoter, Jewish poet, philosopher of art, Deborah Fogel. She elaborated ideas both of literary and visual, visual montage, photographic first of all, which she called a new realism in art. And here you can see the montage of Jan Neumann, successor of Witold Trauma in the school in uh, 1939. And actually, this one was published on, on the cover of London Illustrated News in 34, I think. I, I've ordered uh, the copy last year, almost two years ago, and I can't find it in my files, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but uh, it's really this, this piece was, which called, you see the, the title, years 1914, 1914. Um, then young artist, uh, from probably most famous Lviv modernist group, multi-ethnical group, artists, which formed uh, in late 1929, came to idea of so-called factorialism based on montage and collage. Here is Margit Sierska and Henrik Strang. Um, the collage of Margit Sierska from the 30s on the left, is now in the collection of National Art Museum of Ukraine. Besides its anti-war appeal, it looks like to represent in somehow the very essence of Lviv modernism created by the artist of Jewish origin. It's using Christian symbols, slogan in Polish, and Margit Silska stayed in Lviv, stayed in Lviv after the Second World War and represent herself as Ukrainian artist. I was happy and proud to help with this acquisition for the museum. And I can put it straight, it was my idea, but the impulse, <laughs> <laughs> but the impulse was actually, and it was actually, it met enthusiasm of the director of the museum, Lydia Litvinet, and support of Kostya Arkinsha as well. And for sure, impulse was the slack of Lviv in the eye of the storm and the other exhibition, just to have it in Kiev to, to change the map of Ukrainian modernism. On the right, is supported of her by another member of artists, Alexander Kshivoblodsky. Actually, his son joined at Nasset Symposium in Vienna. I met him first time. We will long time in correspondence. Uh, so the watercolor with Lviv Street on the left by Henrik Strang will be on the cover of the book of him, which will be published next January by Bloomsbury, the book by uh, Piotr Swatkowski from Warsaw. It, it was in Polish published already, but now it will be in English as well. It's a book dedicated to his work and questions of identity, another connection to London by Ludwig Linde, who left uh, Lviv for Paris in 1937 and brought all his collection of Judaica to the museum, Jewish Museum now in uh, Paris, and all his graphic works are there. Most of artist members, and not only them, were studying in Paris in the mid-twenties. Some of them came straight from Vienna, as Margit Reich, Sierska later, Henrik Strang and Jerzy Janisz, after the exhibition at Secession, when they saw this picture of uh, uh, Fernand Leger. All the three of them, not all the three, Margit Reich, or Tohan Henrik Strang, they were studying uh, at the Academy Modern of Fernand Leger, Amede aux Enfants. The Ukrainians from Lviv, Svetoslav Vodensky and Yaroslava Muzika came to the Academy a bit later, in the late 20s. And it looks like Leger at the time was not just a guru, but almost God for Lvivians at the time, for the young artist. And actually, a bit earlier, uh, he made three drawings, 
especially for Lviv publication of the manifesto of the new poetry by Tadeusz Piper, New Miles. This is the next uh, influence of Krakow, avant-garde Leon Kvistek, who moved to Lviv from Krakow and Tadeusz Piper. I have no idea why he published this in Lviv, but it's a fact. <laughs> and this drawing is now in uh, Museum Stuki in what but he made it especially for this publication. Thanks. Anu, Association of Independent Ukrainian Artists, actually founded by uh, in Lviv by Yaroslava Muzyka Svetoslav Vordensky and Pavlo Kovshin. <clears throat> Pavlo Kovshin, former Kievan, Kievan futurist, who signed the first Quero Manifesto with Mikhail Semenkov, <coughs> former officer of Ukrainian National Republic, who settled in Lviv in the 1920s after fall of the Republic in Kiev. Of the Bolsheviks came there. Uh, association holding massive activities through the 30s, three dozen of exhibition in 10 years both in Lviv and abroad. From the very first exhibition, Anum started international collection at the Lviv National Museum with such names as Andre Deren, Modigliani, Picasso, Maria Tozzi, and others. It was mostly drawings and graphics, huge exhibition of uh, Alexander Arhipenko in 1939. They showing them all together with young Ukrainian artists, local from Soviet Ukraine and prominence from the uh, Ukrainian Parisian group. Actually, all the collection was destroyed in almost all the collection was destroyed in 1952, as well as uh, uh, works of Arkhipenko disappeared. There's uh, three sketches in the museum, and the work of Mario Tozzi was just transferred to National Picture Gallery as a foreign and can be in Ukrainian museum. All the graphics are lost. Uh, uh, graphics, drawings mostly, because you have to pay uh, how do you call it in English? Custom, if you're bringing uh, paintings. Mm -hmm. So it was easy to bring from Paris uh, drawings and graphics. It, it cost nothing uh, for the time. All this happened. What? Two pictures disappeared. It was a portrait <laughs> of Pavlo Kovzhon. He really, I called that he, for sure, he had ADHD syndrome, which I do, <laughs> the real futurist, yeah, because his activities at the time, it was uh, unbelievable. I think most of the top futurists uh, had this syndrome. He was curating most of the exhibitions, editing catalogs. He was artist himself, exhibited with artist group as well, editor of uh, Mestestvo Art Magazine as well where he published both Western artists, uh, locals, and from Soviet Ukraine. They trying to keep it all together, the whole map at the time. I think it's futuristic view as well. It was high quality publication. And you need to know that Gino Severini was in organizing committee in, uh, in Paris at the time. I think they both changed to Rafael Dorder as well as uh, Severini as, as well as Kovzhun. They were making different kind of art that in the early years, futurist years. Uh, so I have to say that Paris wasn't the only destination for study. Here is the group of young Jewish artists from Lviv went to our Kipenko studio in Berlin in 1922. Still later, they moved to Paris and formed Le Groupe de Quatre, quite known group. Thank you, our Kipenko Foundation, to share this picture. <laughs> and I recognize four, four of them here. This is Alfred Aberdan, uh, my name is here, Leon Weisberg, and uh, Joachim Weingart, all the four. To be keeping together on the pictures. But this must mention Ukrainian Photographic Society, beside the Lviv Photographic Society, format, early, format in early 30s, mostly influenced by aesthetics from Berlin and Prague. Prague, and as well by Jan Bulhak from Vilna, from Lithuania, Polish photographer from uh, Vilna. No time to show more. 
you want picture of uh, one of the founder of Ufota, Oleg Sabalitsky, who looks for me had double identity as Paul and Ukrainian as well. Oleg Sabalitsky, one of the fine founder of Ukrainian society, and Stepan Mochowski, happily, the whole archive of Stepan Mochowski is now in Ohio, in Cleveland Museum. I have the whole bunch of scans and so on, so that's a really pressure thing because we have almost no archives, just uh, just a magazine of Ukrainian uh, photographic society. Uh, almost all folks. <laughs> just uh, the interior of trade union of Lviv artists. In Polish time, they took out the word Polish because of all this uh, international community. I mean, Poles, Jews, and Ukrainians were all together. It was initiative of artist group to take the word uh, Polish. It was just Lviv, trade union of artists. That's for now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Andre. And uh, our final speaker of the day, I'm absolutely thrilled and delighted to introduce <laughs> the hero of the hour, or <laughs> one, one of the heroes of the hour, Katrin Lizzo, who probably doesn't need an introduction, but an art historian and curator, uh, organizer of this, co organizer of this conference, and co curator of the exhibition. Thank you so much, William. Thank you, everyone, for your stamina. I know this has been <laughs> marathon, to say the least, uh, a long and intense day, but we're getting that. Um, Andri, that was fascinating, and I think every single artist you mentioned deserves a paper on its own. Uh, so we definitely need another conference, basically. Um, I also want to address um, your comment about the fact that Lviv uh, was not and is not represented in um, the exhibition in the Eiffel Storm, and I think this is something I can speak both on my and Constantine's behalf that this is something we are acutely aware of, and um, I hope if we do continue this project and there are further iterations, we will definitely address this question. There are multiple reasons for why it happened, and we can discuss that in the discussion, but um, I think one of the reasons is what you also mentioned, is the fact that we mostly worked with the collection of the National Art Museum of Ukraine, and while there are works by artists like Ivan Prush and Oleksa Malakivsky, so the earlier, more kind of art nouveau uh, period, there is literally, well now, thanks to your uh, efforts, there is one um, example of interbalviv um, art in their collection, but otherwise there is nothing. So, again, this kind of imperial divide of Ukraine into West and East uh, persists even to this day in our public collections. So this is something definitely to address and um, work on. Um, I will be super brief uh, with my presentation. I'll literally whiz through um, several slides. What I want to do is to show how in, in the exhibition that we do have on view now at the Royal Academy, we try to explore this multicultural dimension of uh, Ukraine's modernism. And uh, for those of you who've heard me speak before, I apologize, some of this will be repetitive, and um, I do to myself sound like a broken record sometimes, but no. I think it's uh, it's important to uh, reiterate some things. Um, and again, the thinking behind this project that Konstantin and I had, and I hope I can speak on behalf of both of us, is obviously we wanted to build um, a kind of national Ukrainian narrative and we wanted to reclaim names, institutions, events for Ukrainian art history. But at the same time, we were very much aware that the um, cultural um, heritage that we're, and artistic heritage that we're working with is extremely multicultural and we wanted for that to be reflected in the exhibition. It's also reflected in the title of the exhibitions. It's called Modernism in Ukraine rather than Ukrainian Modernism. Because um, as it stands at the moment, Ukrainian denotes um, some sort of an ethno-national uh, identification. And I guess this is also a question for us to discuss whether we can reconceptualize what Ukrainian actually means and how we approach um, this definition. Um, anyway, so um, a couple of examples from uh, the exhibition and uh, the artists that we see in the exhibition. Alexandra Exter, Alexandra Exter, 
uh, Alexandra Exter, um, an artist who was born in Bilostok, which is in Poland today, back then part of the Russian Empire, of absolutely mixed heritage. Her father was Belarusian Jewish, her mom was Greek. Her family moved to Kiev when um, Alexandra or Asia, she was known to her family and friends, was very young. Uh, she started her artistic education in Kiev at the Kiev Art School, and then in 1906 she traveled uh, to, to Western Europe for the first time, and then she spent prolonged periods of time in Paris specifically. At the same time, um, even before she traveled to Paris, she uh, got exposed to uh, the traditions of Ukrainian folk art and decorative art, embroidery in particular, but also ceramics, and she was a um, staunch uh, promoter of um, specifically Ukrainian folk art. Um, and she was an extremely prolific artist who transcended the territories, geographies, identities, however you want to approach it. She exhibited uh, in Paris, in Rome, in Kiev, in Odessa, in Moscow, in St. Petersburg. And um, this is actually something that I do want to um, research further. She uh, defected from the Soviet Union in 1924 and she eventually settled in uh, Paris. And she actually taught at uh, Fernand Leger's Academy in Paris. Um, so my question is whether any of those beef artists might have studied this. Okay, that question is answered. Great. Uh, <laughs> Um, next one um, is obviously in the exhibition we have a whole section dedicated to Kultur Liga and the Cultural League, uh, a cultural organization that was set up in Kyiv in 1918 specifically to promote various aspects of Jewish culture in Ukraine. And it was set up um, under the uh, patronage of the leadership of the Ukrainian People's or National Republic that proclaimed its independence in 1918. And it's very interesting that while um, Kind of the leadership of this republic was obviously invested in the idea of building a national, independent national Ukrainian state. They at the same time recognized how multicultural the territory that they controlled was, and they established a minister, ministry of uh, for minorities for the protection of the right of minorities. And there was a deputy responsible for the Jewish population, for the Russian population, the Polish population in Ukraine. And it was under the patronage of um, the Ukrainian People's Republic that this. Um, uh, organization came to be, and it had a very active, um, Ukraine, uh, a very active art section that basically attracted all of the young Jewish artists, not just from Kiev but uh, the former Russian Empire more generally. And um, in their art, they saw the sort of the synthesis of some of the latest and most radical avant-garde trends that were originating in Western Europe and their cultural um, heritage, uh, Jewish heritage, and. Um, important element to note is that Kulturliga generally it was um, kind of the activity was in the Yiddish language that was the language of uh, the Jewish population in Ukraine and in the region more broadly not Hebrew and I'll just show you a couple of examples uh, from Kulturliga that we have in the exhibition um, Isahar Ber Rebag was born in Yudhisthira, uh, which is today Kropovnitsky, in sort of central east of uh, Ukraine. You might have heard the name from the news. It is um, attacked um, occasionally by uh, by the Russians. Um, he uh, studied. Uh, he started his um, artistic education in uh, Kiev in Kiev Art School. He also attended. Another kind of important link here is that Axta, uh, Alexander Axta, she set up a private studio in Kiev in 1918. And many artists of Kultur Liga actually studied with her. And um, in her approach, she um, she liked to combine the avant-garde and the folk. So uh, there are uh, memoirs of some of her students uh, saying how on the walls of the studio you could see drawings by peasant Ukrainian um, artisans and paintings by the likes of Sedan, Leger, um, etc. Um, and um, after, uh, in the 1920s, um, Berrebak immigrate, emigrated from the Soviet Union and settled in Paris, and he's actually considered to be um, an artist of the so-called Paris School. Um, and Elisitsky uh, was born in a small kind of Jewish community in, in the Russian Empire. He uh, studied actually in, in Vitebsk, in today's Belarus, and then he went to Germany because um, he couldn't um, enroll in the Imperial Academy of Fine Arts in St. Petersburg because there was a key quota for uh, the number of Jewish artists who could study at the Academy. So he actually went to Drumstadt and studied in Germany. He then returned back to the Russian Empire, and in 1918 he came to Kyiv specifically to work with Kulturliga. And 
um, kind of, uh, it's a speculation, but uh, he might have produced some of his earliest abstract works uh, while working in the cave. Um, and then he kind of he worked in Moscow. He also worked in Vitebsk. He was teaching at the um, school set up by Mark Chagall in Vitebsk for some time. He was also uh, ambassador of the Soviet Union in uh, Germany, um, and then he returned to uh, Moscow and um, lived uh, there. But you can kind of see all these trends coming together, moving from the west to the east um, and north. Um, another element that I want to quickly discuss is the Portuguese, who are hailed as the kind of um, the. The, their national Ukrainian um, artistic group, uh, but they were extremely prolific during the um, early Soviet period, so in the 1920s. And I will not go into details of their style. We've heard about um, Boychuk and um, their art a little bit today. And um, what I do want to say is that um, even though they kind of, oh, one of the aspects that they wanted to explore in their art was the revival of their. Byzantine tradition, which Rachel considered to be local to Ukraine, and also integration of elements of folk art and patterns, Ukrainian folk art and patterns in their life. At the same time, Manuel Shachman, for example, was a, was a Jewish artist, and very much um, kind of explicitly so with this painting in particular, was also a member of Rachel's group. So they were not tunnel visioned in their kind of um, approach to um, um, art and uh, national art. And um, this painting was uh, exhibited at the Venice Biennale in 1930, um, and it was specifically exhibited in the Ukrainian section of the Soviet pavilion. Um, so Ukraine uh, had a dedicated section within the Soviet pavilion in 1928 and 1930. And it's interesting, in the catalog in 1928, um, it says kind of, um, Ukrainian Socialist Soviet Republic, in Italian obviously, but in, 1920, in 1930 it just says Ukraine, Ukraina which I, I, I find very interesting. Um, another element uh, that I want to highlight is the art of Viktor Palmov, who's very often uh, described as a Ukrainian avant-garde artist, or he was Russian. Um, he came to Ukraine in 1925 specifically to teach at the Kiev Art Institute. And um, he died quite um, early, so he only spent a couple of years in uh, Ukraine until 1929. But he, um, he studied art in... Um, in, in, in Russia and also in, uh, he traveled with Burluk around uh, Japan and then when he settled in Ukraine he very much became embedded in all of the artistic processes that were happening in Soviet Ukraine at the time. He published his writing in um, Nova Generatia, for example, the, the artistic journal that we've heard about today. His articles were in Ukrainian, so I do wonder whether they were translated or kind of he was um, able to write in Ukrainian himself. Um, but of another sort of um, element of multiculturalism in Ukraine during this period. Because Malevich, how can I not talk about Kazimir Malevich? Um, ethnic Paul, born in Kiev, who grew up in the Ukrainian countryside, was very much exposed to the tradi traditions of Ukrainian folk and decorative art growing up, developed as an artist in, in Russia, um, kind of uh, mostly in uh, Moscow. It was in Russia where he formulated uh, the tenets of suprematism, his kind of the artistic method and philosophy that he's known for. He returned to uh, Ukraine in the late 1920s again to teach at the Kiev Art Institute, and this is the, um, the period of his life that we explore in um, our exhibition. But uh, bef even before that, in the, in the 1910s, he participated in the work of the Virpivka workshop, in, um, which was a small embroidery workshop set up by um, Natalia Davidova um, in uh, Ukraine, which Axta was very closely involved with as well. So kind of, he still maintained ties with Ukraine even as he was working in um, the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union. Um, there are some less obvious links um, to kind of multiculturalism that I want to highlight. Uh, but then my letter, um, well-known Ukrainian artist, and we have him very well represented in the exhibition, especially with his theater designs. Um, he also came from a family of mixed um, heritage, uh, and um, he kind of studied um, in Munich. He studied in, uh, he lived in Paris for a while before he came back to Kiev, where he became affiliated with Alexandra X's studio. His first designs for theater were actually created for 
Bratislava and Nizhinska's um, ballet productions or choreographical productions in Kiev. And Bratislava and Nizhinska obviously um, came from a, a Polish family, um, well-known um, ballet dancer and choreographer, and um, the sister of the better known um, Václav Nizhinsky. Um, Mellor's wife, who was also a fellow artist, and sadly not a lot of her works have survived, she was, um, of, her father was Dutch, her mom was uh, Russian, she worked in Ukraine for most of her life, and again was involved with those embroidery workshops that I mentioned before in Verbivka. And um, Alexander Bogomazov, uh, we've heard about him today, his wife, Anna Monasterska, who was again a fellow artist, but not a lot of her um, legacy has survived in terms of her art, uh, but it's thanks to her that we have um, works by Bogomazov today, she was Polish, she came from a quite a well-known uh, Polish family in Kiev, um, studied at the Kiev Art School, attended Alexandra Exeter's studio, um, and uh, spent most of her life in uh, Kiev. And um, another link is um, Vasily Irmiov, so he is a native of Kiev, and an artist who spent most of his life in Kiev, but um, his original artistic education he received um, at the industrial workshops, uh, the workshop of industrial arts in Kharkiv, and one of his teachers was Ladislav Trakal, a Czech um, artist who was based in Kharkiv at the time. And um, Yerminov is very known for um, the way he kind of introduced Ukrainian folk patterns and um, uh, kind of ornaments into his um, art, sometimes quite sort of, kind of um, constructed as art. But it is believed that, uh, and again, this is something that requires more um, kind of research, but kind of it, it is possible that it was actually from Trakal because he was very big on decorative art of the Slavic people that Yermyov actually got exposed to um, post Ukrainian and other kind of uh, decorative traditions in the region. And I will finish with, um, again, yeah, we've talked about Mihaila Boychuk. Um, it is my um, kind of, I think if there is one thing that I really regret about the exhibition is that we don't have works by Sofia Nalopinska Boychuk in the show. Um, she was his wife and a fellow artist. She was kind of, is considered to be part of the Boychuk's group, but I think she was quite separate. She was Polish and she was born in Lodz, but she grew up in St. Petersburg in a very Polish family. Um, they met in Paris and um, she followed him to Kiev in the 1910s and um, she um, faced uh, the same tragic uh, fate that he did, um, so he was um, executed in 1937 on the accusation of Ukrainian bourgeois nationalism. She was executed in 1938 on the accusation of espionage, precisely because she was Polish. Um, I will finish here, because I think there is a lot for us to discuss. Thank you. So I think both of these presentations have a privilege of showing really the complexity and the richness of um, avant-garde art, modernist art, uh, and the heritage of Ukraine. Much, many questions come out of these um, presentations, much to discuss. I have so many questions, I don't know where to start. Um, but I think maybe I want to come back to this question of the, um, the geography of modern start in Ukraine, and this question that you addressed right at the beginning of, you know, where does the view in, in relation to your exhibition, and, and the reasons for that uh, separation into uh, two different spheres. Um, when I teach uh, Ukrainian literature at UCL, and it's a kind of, it's a strange thing to do to Ukrainian literature, because you kind of have to teach two different versions of it. There's like the version, there's the Western Ukrainian version, which you know, like talking about modern literature, modern vernacular literature, we start, you know, with Ruskatlitsa, um, we go to Frankova, we go to Kobyanska, and we talk about Molda and Luther was uh, was, was mentioned, uh, Antonich, you know, we have that we have that kind of lineage which is being formed in the Austro-Hungarian and in the Polish context in complicated uh, relationships with the Polish culture, with German language culture. And then on the other hand, we teach the history from Kodinevsky through Shevchenko, through Nolesu Krenko, through the, the bonus of the 20th century, then into the, the writers of the, of the interwar, uh, avant-garde, and, and so on. 
um, we will be formed in this kind of uh, very tense, uh, complicated relationship with Russian language literature and Russian language culture. Obviously, there are, there are connections between the two. Um, it's not like writers in different parts of Ukraine didn't know about each other or didn't read each other. They don't, of course, they did. Um, there are coherent histories of Ukrainian literature that take into account both, both versions of Ukrainian literature as well. Um, so, I guess my question to you is does, Is such a history of Ukrainian art possible that takes into account? Both contexts, both versions. Um, and also, what were those connections between the two? What were the dynamics between the artists working in the context that you described and the, and, and the ones that, that you described? Uh, what were the, the personal connections and the institutional connections? Uh, common history of art. We, we didn't study it yet, yeah. but uh, I, I do not believe it. I think this is the only way we have to have this uh, history in the whole, to incorporate all these uh, figures from different nationalities, of course, but we, it's the same about Ukrainians in art as well. We still have no art history until now. My answer. That's quite big. I'm really um, No, but I, I agree with you. I think we do need to um, start weaving together all these different sides um, of Ukraine. And I think the, the problem is that it's, I think we, to this day, we operate with this imperial divide in mind to an extent, uh, dividing Ukraine into what was under the Russian Empire and then what was under the Austro-Hungarian Empire and then what was under the Soviet Union. But I think that we, we talk, definitely need to start weaving all of that together and all of that is part of Ukrainian cultural heritage. Obviously, when it comes to what you can compare literature and art, with literature you have the language denominator, and that kind of suggests where you place um, a certain writer. We don't really have that with art. Art is kind of much more, it's, it's, there is no, it's, there's an international language of art, there are some local influences, but you don't have that element that you can kind of fall back on and say this artist was Ukrainian, this artist was Polish, this artist was Russian. And many of the artists who we have in the exhibition, Alexander Exter, Alexander Bulmasov, they were Russian speakers. So kind of that's also something that we have to recognize and make peace with. And I think there is, especially when it comes to kind of the, the Russian side of things, there's some kind of <laughs> an element of moral judgment being passed on the artists. So kind of if they, we either try to suppress the fact that they studied in the Russian Empire, they, they spoke Russian as their um, first language, because somehow that makes them kind of morally fraught figures. But we do have to remember that they operated within the context of the empire, of the Russian Empire, and they had to go to an extent, they had to go to Moscow and St. Petersburg to study. So there are a lot of complexities there, you know. You have a lot of them in literature because you have different languages and different schools. There are similar complexities when it comes to art, but I think we do need to, and it's, it's not easy, especially in, in the current um, context when um, we are under attack on a daily basis and the, kind of, the reaction that kind of, you do want to kind of pretend that the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union did not exist and kind of, uh, but we have to recognize that that's all part of our cultural um, heritage and legacy and support with it and we do it all together. I think, I'm not sure if that's an answer to your question, but um, I also know that this is a slightly controversial position, so, yeah. Yeah, no, it's definitely, definitely an um, answer. And how about that question of the contacts between the two? Oh, yeah. Um, I think, um, and this is something that actually I didn't want to do in my PhD, but I didn't get to for various reasons. But I think there were, there were 
political figures who kind of transcended uh, this uh, imperial divide. So we have Mikhail Boychuk, who was originally from the west of Ukraine, and Mikhail Chena was very much part of all of the Ukrainian circles in Lviv, but then most of his career was in, um, well, in Soviet Ukraine, essentially. And um, so kind of that's one figure. And then you mentioned Ivan Kovzhun, he's an amazing and other representative, someone may, making a kind of opposite um, transition. He was part of the futuristic circles um, set up by Semenko and Kiev, and then because he was involved in the um, Ukrainian People's Republic, he had to leave uh, Boris the coming of the Soviet um, regime. He had to, kind of, to go west, and he became extremely active in the but he, as again, um, Andrei, you've um, alluded to and uh, talked about in your presentation, he also tried to um, bring the kind of Ukrainians together despite this um, divide. So in the exhibitions, unknown exhibitions, they also exhibited uh, Ukrainian artists from Soviet Ukraine. Um, so there are definitely examples that married further research. Um, I don't know if you want to end it. I have to explain. I don't want to be controversial or radical. That's what I meant about history, because art history in Ukraine. I believe, that's why I'm not started. I believe, and the, this very good sample of the three exhibitions I mentioned on futurism, uh, kaleidoscope of histories, and in the eye of the storm. If you see it closer, all is going on in the borders of the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union. What all we are doing, we're just fulfilling this narrative. We're just putting in the names what was lacking, or didn't call Ukrainians. We, we can see the whole picture, we, we're not able to see the whole picture. That's why we have to start from the beginning. I mean, so that's my opinion, and it's, I, I clearly see it on this exhibition. The only borders we can see. And, the, and finally, the only connections is on the East. Of course, this, we will raise this question later, if you we were talking today about this uh, Ukrainian National Republic banknote of uh, 100 hryvnia. It's four languages there. Mm -hmm. Ukrainian, Polish, Jewish, and Yiddish. Russian. Yiddish. Jewish, I mean Yiddish, of course, at the time. Mm -hmm. So I think this was a great idea of this republic. Of course, the question of the Russian will be uncomfortable now, but still we have to, to deal with it, of course. And uh, if I can finish, <laughs> my point is, I, I sent the citation today, I got from the little mocker, he is dealing with the 60s, uh, with the dissidents and the artists and dissidents from the 60s. And it's uh, just a piece, it's not about Kiev, it's about Kiev actually, it's a piece of diaries of Irina Zelenko, and she she just remembered her young years in the 50s in Kiev, and she wrote it so. In the midst of the 50s, first the Polish language disappeared in Kiev, then Jewish, I mean Yiddish, all those people disappeared, even the names of Jadwiga or Itzhak or so on, all the names. And suddenly, on the way here, I've realized that it was the time when Ukrainian disappears at the same time in Kiev. So we have this bear in mind, really, the whole picture. Thank you, thank you, that was a Okay, I'm going to open up the floor to questions. I see lots of hands, so I saw uh, a point out. Yeah, thank you. Um, you just have to speak really into it. Into it, okay. <laughs> um, uh, thank you both. Uh, a great, absolutely brilliant presentation. Um, I have a naughty question uh, to you. Um, so I'm coming from uh, the context I'm coming. David Reeve just recently published Fascinating Fascism of Zonfeld. And um, I just saw many uh films. And I think, so my question is, that you are probably aware that there is like association of this rigid, robust bodies with uh, uh, Nazi propaganda and um, the image of um, sports and everything. And uh, do, do, do you know about this? 
So it's called uh, Bashi I, I, I will not agree. I will not about that. Yeah. So, so I was, it's my not question, about that. Yeah. My question was whether you see some other bodies, for example, in this photo are higher secure research. Yeah. Um, what? <laughs> no. Yeah. I'm, um, and Katya, thank you very much for your presentation as well. And I wanted to ask you uh, this Schlechten uh, picture, it's depicted, maybe you know, I mean, I don't assume that you know what kind of Jewish, which particular Jewish program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the question here. Yeah, so. Okay, so let's collect a couple more. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, I have a Croatian comment. Uh, because we forgot about another part of Ukraine, which is um, uh, was called Carpathia Rusenia, or Transcarpathians, which is fully fall out of this truck, mm -hmm. uh, which was Hungarian and then um, Czechoslovak uh, and then Soviet, which preserved absolutely Hungarian modernist art school with Erdely, with Kotska, with Bakhchai, which was not connected to Ukraine in any form, and then far, very finally exploded as a time bomb in the 60s when Tatyana Yablonska discovered them and Kiev artists discovered them and started to mimic, absolutely preserved, like in a freezer, uh, artistic culture of Hungary, of Hungarian modernism of 1930s. So we have very strange and mosaic elements, and we have somehow to connect them, which is not a very easy task. And uh, I'm absolutely agree with um, uh, Andre that we are in the very, very beginning of this road. But, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> one more, and I'll come back. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you very much. I, I would like to point out to you all the three-dimensional map that was produced a few years ago by the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Because obviously we're talking about centres, and although on the one hand there are all sorts of dreadful political things happening and pogroms and reasons for flight that are not intellectual emigration, there is still the idea of desire-led intellectual emigration to certain centres. And if I were brought up in photography, I would be far more interested in the um, Germanic axis and the Bauhaus and the beautiful things in the films you showed. And if I were brought up in painting, I might wish to follow Alexander X to go to Paris. But I think that all the discussion, if I were Jean Deleuze, I would be saying, where is desire? There is no desire-led um, <coughs> descriptions in any of this. Whereas, obviously, Alexander X desired to go to Paris. And, uh, 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 and your people desired to understand the Bauhaus. So uh, there's a life of forms which were essential, and stories and narratives which were essential in terms of desire and intellectual emigration when one's not talking about persecution and pogroms and terrible things. And I think that whole dimension should be recognized. And I think that in terms of this very difficult, um, you know, uh, polycentered uh, situation, the model, which is the best model I know of, the three-dimensional map where you, you, I mean, I'm no, no Buddhist, of course, but you can pick up things about certain centers and certain groups and see who is where, when, and it's very, very useful because essentially you're talking about a problem of mapping, but just to throw in one little element, remembering uh, the beginnings of Katia's work on this, we haven't also talked about the Orient Express or the Postal Service, which was a way of distributing periodicals, uh, of getting information to A from A to B very, very quickly, uh, and was very important. So I just would like to add a little bit about <coughs> plural centres, polyphonies, uh, desire, and actual communications at the time. Okay, thank you so much for lots of, lots of questions. We have a uh, question about robust bodies and sports are uh, potentially problematic in nature. Level. We have which, which pogrom is being affected. We have transcarpathia as a part of this mosaic. And then we have 3D mapping and desire land 
So starting with this fascist ideas, of course I'm absolutely conscious with visit of Marinetti. It was a lot of protests, both in the Ukrainian and Polish press. It was interview with him in Jewish press as well. Very interesting. They were asking them straight about Jewish policy and so on and so on. Uh, but uh, actually, it's about this uh, desire influences. I mean, with the bodies, mm -hmm. it was common aesthetics everywhere, mm -hmm. and everywhere, like with uh, Gino Severini and Kovjun, it they turned to the right. Mm -hmm. uh, Robert Chenta, and uh, you know, so it was in this rapel order as well mm -hmm. was important. Left this avant-garde and turned. Uh, you, we we have to serve the people ideas of Borjuk and Kovjun was stick to these ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, the graphic, uh, the books, mm -hmm. which is actually this collection in Prague is amazing. And Professor Modrak has a book about this uh, book covers, which get to back to Ukraine from Prague collection. Yeah. It's amazing book, I think. I, I learned a lot from this book about Ukraine. It has nothing to do with fascism, okay. in fact. But uh, Marinetti did, of course. Mm -hmm. That's the difference with Ukrainian futurism as well, and, and uh, Italian, so it's a mm -hmm. different things, of course. And uh, it's, it was too short even for the beef, because I sent you today a longer text of mine when I'm mentioning, of course, this Hungarian trans and Czech Transcarpathia, mm -hmm. and don't forget about Chernivtsi. Yeah, about yeah, 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 yeah. German, German, yeah, Jewish, yeah, yeah. Uh, Rosa Ausland, the porcelain, and so on, they all ours as well. And we didn't mention them as well as uh, the part of Podkarpatska Rus. Actually, the great exhibition was in Kosic, uh, like just yeah, three, yeah. four years yeah. ago. And all the Hungarians was there. And at all, I, for me, a big sample is Kosicka Moderna. Which which emerge after year 2010 when they come when they bring together all the nationalities not only Slovak but Czech Hungarian Jewish all together so it's, it's amazing. <coughs> I wonder about what it was more. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for the questions and uh, comments. Putting it to your question, um, I haven't come across. Um, Good information of which program specifically it was, but my understanding that it was one of the programs that happened um, during the Ukrainian War of Independence or Russian Civil War, because even though the Ukrainian People's National Republic did try, well, the leadership of the Ukrainian People's Republic tried to avoid uh, programs, and kind of mm -hmm. that's why they set up the ministry, and I think Ruchaski in particular was very much um, wary of that. Um, issue programs or in from 1919 to 1918, the, it's, it was horrific what was happening in, on the territory of Ukraine in terms of programs. So I think uh, the painting speaks to that period. Um, and um, I very much like your comment about desire. So I uh, approach it as agency, um, and I think that's <laughs> um, and that's something that I try to do in my research with regard to artists, Ukrainian or artists or artists from Ukraine working in the Soviet Union, because uh, especially with someone like Rachel Kirkus group, there is sort of a tendency to interpret all of their work as um, forced on them by the regime, but I think in the 1920s that was not necessarily the case. I think they still had very much um, artistic agency and, and kind of they adjusted their art to the changing social political reality. The things did definitely change in the 1930s, but um, yeah, I think they still had quite a lot of agency. And as well, yeah, she went to Paris, she was fluent French speaker, and that obviously is also something we have to consider and think about. It's kind of what other languages the artist spoke, and she was a part of this very um, kind of cosmopolitan, both kind of um, Russian Empire, kind of um, upper middle class, who they all spoke French, um, and so it was kind of quite natural for her to go to Paris. 
Um, so yeah, as, um, it, it, we shouldn't just approach it from the perspective that, oh, there was no art academy in the PUP, so they had to go somewhere else. There is also a question of, it's, it's again, more complicated than that. We have five minutes. Okay, so I think we have one more round of questions I think we can have. So, yeah. Um, I have a question for one of you, too. Um, thank you for this. Um, of course. So many, <laughs> well, of course, because I have a terrible obsession of photography, and there are so many women. Yeah, so I, I wish to talk about this as well. Yeah, <laughs> and so I'm, I'm actually curious. So, you um, so you showed us all of these people who profiled their connection to the crack. Krakow and uh, Vienna, uh, were they in any communication with the, with the other side, with the merchant town, with the village, and the city of Africa? Were in communication with you, be aware of what's happening there? Um, was there any connection? Okay, for, let's, let's take time. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Can you speak to the microphone, please? Oh, sorry. Oh. Uh, do you need to repeat? Oh, yes. Um, Just a, a bit louder, yeah. Yeah. if you can. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask about the view if some of the artists you talked about have Polish names, but the film was being published in Ukrainian, or if these artists were thought of themselves as more Polish than Ukrainian, or if maybe they had more of an allegiance to the city itself than to the nationality? Okay, yeah, one more. Christine. Uh, yeah. No, I think you could come to the first one. So forgive me, it's not so much a question, it's just a musing. Um, so, so, especially after this panel, but, but after the whole day, it strikes me, so to your question or your, to your um, plea for an, an art history sort of of Ukraine, um, that, uh, that it's that it's so unbelievably diverse that the question is who is not included <laughs> rather than who is included. I mean, if we, if we think about this as in, in a really sort of capacious manner. So uh, I, I'm just, um, as, as somebody who thinks by making things, um, the, this notion of, of the map becomes quite interesting and, and wondering whether, um, uh, you know, a sort of crowdsourced uh, sort of beginning of a mapping which could start to show this diversity and could start to pool the, um, the intellectual work of so many people who are in this room and beyond um, might not be something to ask for a grant for. <laughs> Okay, so, uh, useful question. <laughs> close, close thing. Okay, so we have questions about connections to the Russian economy capital, as these guys were talking about. Also, identity of artists in Greece, Polish, Ukrainian, or maybe Greece. <laughs> um, and the usefulness of mapping. <laughs> uh, so, about the contact to the East. So uh, actually, it, what the pictures was lost on the slide was the was the portrait of uh, Pablo Kobzun and his cover for the new generacia that he made for Kharkiv in twenty eight. Uh, it was uh, Semenko was on his way to Der Sturm to Berlin and stayed for three days. They said they were smoking and drinking for three days, like old futurists. Friends and on, on the way back, they agreed uh, Kovjun will make uh, this uh, cover. But in general, remember, in Second Polish Republic, all the Soviet stuff was just forbidden. But uh, I mentioned in the artist group, this was so called leftist wing of artists. So they, I don't know how, maybe mostly from German magazines, that's true, all the magazines were circulated perfectly all the time. French, they knew about Soviet repressions from the French magazines, actually, mm -hmm. more than uh, even than from local Polish or Ukrainian. So as I know, they, for example, they was able to see the Eisenstein's uh, Petyonkin, 
and Roman Sierski was influenced in somehow at the time, but not direct contacts at the time. And I have to stress about photography. Uh, the problem is not about Lviv school. So probably photography in Lviv is the most strong visual stuff we have in interwar period. But uh, in Soviet times, we lost photography in Ukraine totally. Photography was just uh, serve the propaganda. And uh, it was, in general, photography became like, has no authorship even. So that's why we lost this, this all this school of photography in Lviv, but not this, another problem. So about... Do you want to talk about identities, Polish, Ukrainian? Ah, sure. That's why I showed uh, this, uh, uh, this interior made by Otto Axel and stressed that it was Lviv trade union of artists. Parallel, they made the Polish trade union of artists and it died in one or two years. I, I even know the name of the guy who made it, Vladislav Lam. It doesn't work. It was five people there, and it doesn't work, simply. So I think most of the people, yes, identity is Lvivian. Maybe five percent of the people was actually Ukrainian and Polish. It wasn't a ghetto of three zones of the city, where it's Jewish, Polish, and Ukrainian. Most of them doing the art wasn't aware. And I think the top of Ukrainian modernists is Polish living in the war period. Which maybe not all the people will agree, but it's a fact. I mean, with, with these exhibitions of Anum, all these names, they come up. It's not against uh, the, the politics. It's just uh, due to what, what, what's going on. It's very rich ground for everyone. And we, we can talk much more about interconnection, about exhibition together, Jewish, Polish, Ukrainian, and so on. And this was national group, actually no Jewish group, but Ukrainian as Anon, for example. Because many of this, uh, after the fall of the Republic in Kiev, many really strong artists came to be, and they wished to push up, still keep this Ukrainian spirit, and so on, so on. But it wasn't against the Poles or something like this, kind of. If we draw the map. Let's draw the map, <laughs> yes. Um, let's draw the map. I think so if we draw the map even today. So this That's could you mention the Svidnik Ukrainian Museum in Slovakia. Uh, the last Ukrainian village in Slovakia is 400 kilometers from the border to the west. It's near to the uh, Tatra mountains. And recently, I've been to my friends in Poland on the way to Estonia, on the Belarusian border. There is Ukrainian language. I was in shock. So it's another 400 kilometers up. How we can draw this map? And how we... <laughs> so, and don't mention our Ukrainian artist, Andrew Morko. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> But we really have very interesting names. It's American art, sorry. <laughs> we already have some ideas for this panel. Uh, we're out of time, so let's just give one quick extra energetic round